Maybe we're on a spaceship okay. under attack. Pardon? So maybe we're on a spaceship under attack. Somebody did on Star Trek. That's right. That's right. Okay, so I'll just start this so that it's. Is that okay? Do you think it's. Yeah, no, I mean, that's not good. Yeah, we're supposed to start in five minutes. Yeah, yeah, I have no idea. It's just the side of the table. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that bar is that, yeah. so there's no slide above that. Oh, 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 that's true. Okay. That. Reasonable as long as. Um, oh, yes, I get you. So that's. This angle is probably better because otherwise the person goes off. It's a challenge. Yeah, okay. They probably won't go any further in that direction. So really yeah, yeah. No, no. Okay. Then we have, it's best to turn off autofocus, otherwise, oh. every time somebody passes in front, it will oh. do this thing. All right. So it's broadcasting. Um, can you update the link? I'm just, yeah, I was just checking to get the link. Yeah, we're sitting in a stupid place here. Oh. Mm -hmm. 
Pages to the old one. Yes, the okay. computers do not. Oh, okay. other session, so it has all the bits and bobs that didn't have a classification, I guess. And uh, we're going to start with Joseph Dada, who's in Manchester, and he's going to talk about NUMO and a data converter. Thank you. Yeah, as you can see, uh, I'm in a group of uh, Peruvians. I'm in Amazon, Manchester, Institute of Technology. Um, as some of you may, those, those of you that attended the last four five months of the slides, familiar. So what I want to do is just to introduce you to Numa and uh, possibly those of you that may be interested in that uh, data to so discuss that. So, let me first start by telling you the bit, uh, history of uh, Numa. Uh, Nobel originated from numerical aspect of uh, SBRM, and SBRM uh, was published in uh, 2010. And the decision to separate uh, the numerical aspect of uh, SBRM was taken at ICSB conference, uh, SBRM forum in Idaho in 2011. And uh, in 2013, in harmony, I think in Paris, it was adopted as a data, uh, data encoding uh, <laughs> format for sediment. So, what is the aim of NUMEN? The aim is to standardize the exchange of the numerical results, and as a result, to make it possible to use in multiple other standardization efforts. And with the hope that it's going to make it easy to pass the experimental data to simulators to record the result of analysis of validation and analysis, and probably uh, many more. So, what I want to show here is the example of the uh, numerical result that uh, can be encoded in <coughs> NUMEN. To so take a look at this, uh, this is a, a SDM, SDMM module, and you have your similar software tools. Which, uh, there are so many, uh, some of you are developing. You apply your, your algorithm, whether time cost, or steady state, or parameter estimation. 
uh, within your tools, then the result is always a set of data. Which in this case, you can, for the case of a parameterized simulation, is also a must for you to get uh, your experimental data into pass into your parameter, parameter estimation uh, <coughs> method so that you can get results out. So at least results or data can be simple just as a data, just as a, a, a unit, just a data point. Or it can be a one dimension data or two dimensions or three dimensions or multi-dimensional. So NOMER pro provides a flexible way of encoding this type of data by organizing your data in two forms. The first is to describe what you are what you intended to, to encode within a NOMER. That is, you describe a sort of description of the data you actually, or the structure, or the all the tasks you want to make use within your uh, data that uh, that will be encoded within uh, within them. So the the rest are the result component because you have so many. For example, if you have so many results, then you can organize it in the form of a component, and each component is again further organized as uh, the, the dimension description and the mention. So the mention description is describing the actual structure that you want of your data that is going to be within the uh, dimension. So if you take a look at uh, take a look at the composite description, you describe the data that is going to be <coughs> contained That is going to contain with the uh, within composite uh, uh, composite value. So, and at the same time, you describe your tuple description. That is data that is going to be uh, uh, carried within the tuple, and also atomic description for atomic value. So, if you have so many results, then you can organize those results in terms of the result components as many as you want to do. So the specification, the present specification is level one, version one, and you can find it on that website. And it comes in form of a OMM module that is subject to the XML module, and also the XML schema. So the object module of the uh, the top uh, level classes, which is the ontology uh, ontology tab, and the and uh, the result component. The ontology tabs, like I said before, is the one describing the data, the, 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 the data, for example, where the data comes from. So if you have a, a species of concentration, you can you describe them uh, within ontology tabs. And the result component, again, contains all the results you want to encode within NUNET. So the result component itself again is organized, just like I said before, you have the dimension and you have the dimension description. And the dimension description now have uh, uh, the composite description, super description, and <coughs> description. And at the same time, you have the dimension description, which in this case describes the composite value, atomic value, and so forth. This is an example of the uh, data within NUMER. As you can see, you notice that the description of the, uh, the header, which is uh, authority terms, describing all the terms you want to make use within, uh, the, uh, within the, uh, your data. So it points, it allows you to specify, so for example, here you want to encode uh, time, and you have a source ID, which is uh, uh, SBO uh, 340, uh, 345, and the uh, ontology URI is located at that point. So any any uh, software that take your data uh, will be able to interpret 
the, uh, the value of time uh, as a time. The same thing with concentration, which you are going to encode within numbers. So within the result component, you now have the, uh, the dimension description and the dimension. So the dimension description again describes the time and make reference to the time, which is defined here. Time 1 and time 1. <coughs> yeah. So the same thing, you want to encode information about species, and that is species, and the index type is X part. So if you come here, you have uh, you are describing you have the composite value of that species, which in this case is uh, located somewhere in SBMF, which is with the uh, ID as uh, X zero two. So and so on and so forth. So this is an example of time cost data, which is a bit <coughs> similar to that, but in this case, the authority terms, the aspect is not included. So you have the dimension description, and you have the dimension describing the time data. This is a very short uh, time data, which is generated by your software. This is also a, an example of uh, using tuple to describe your data. For example, when you have to uh, <coughs> when you have to quantities describing uh, a, a value of a species, for example, concentration at the same time particle number, you can record that form of tuple where you have two atomic values and is describing those two uh, quantities. There's a library already which has been developed and is a uh, good code. So the library makes it easy for you to read, write, and manipulate your data uh, on all the operating systems developed in C++ and can be compiled on a different operating system. There's a uh, Binance in Java and Python uh, languages already. Other languages, Binance, other language Binance can be developed on demand. So if you are interested in uh, any other binaries, then you need to let me know. So because there's no point in developing it without using it anyway. So just spend the time with that. So there are also examples in C++ and binaries. So I think the last slide will show you where you can find the problem. Mm -hmm. So the library, which is uh, Lib number allow you within your tools to uh, import and export number. So but there are some of uh, people are joining the experimentalists or some other people that possibly uh, like encoding the data or like uh, presenting the data in different uh, other form, a different other format. So we are planning to develop a converter that will enable you to be able to take a spreadsheet data or a CSV data or that limited data and it converts for you to get uh, to get uh, your number data uh, your number according uh, data. <coughs> so we tend to do apart from the data converter, we also plan to uh, develop uh, to have uh, additional uh, tools that can enable you to generate uh, a numeric data from a simulated SBM module and also a validator which enables you to validate a document document and uh, very soon to be able to have a web uh, page that will enable you to be able to carry out some of those uh, activities. So this is the links to some of the resources you will find. So take a look at it and you can go there. Uh, this uh, special you can uh, register to discuss uh, the lib number or the number itself. And you can take a look at the schema and also the specifications about it. Yeah, I think no. So we have plenty of time for questions, actually, because we have well ahead of schedule. Yeah. Is there any plan to make a 
a native Java library? Maybe. Not by yeah, no, not <laughs> completely. <laughs> We're dividing the Java's yes, uh, um, not, not necessarily by <laughs> But they have read it, right? So you right, could do the same thing as the best you Yeah, if I did see Java's native job. Yeah. So if anybody is interested in uh, any other bias, just uh, you know. Yeah, we'll, 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 look, we'll look at how they use it. Uh, we'll probably use it. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. So you were talking about tuples a little bit earlier, and you gave an example that Tuple set up with two terms. Is there a maximum size for a tuple then? Yeah. Maximum size for a tuple? No. No, it's not maximum size. There's no oh. maximum. You can have as many as uh, you have uh, so as many as uh, atomic value data within your tuple. Yeah. So you okay. can have it's as many just as, an as you need. Yeah, it's just an example. So the reason I ask is when you related it back to the ontology term, you had like term one, term two, term three. I was <laughs> that seemed to be like listed as part of the ontology. I was wondering if there was like a limit put in that way. No. no okay. Oh. I mean, you obviously have to have as many definitions. So okay. you have you need to you can have as many columns as you want. Okay. But yeah. you need to define what they are. Okay. So oh, now I see now that they're an idea. I missed that part of the, the slide. So you have to define <clears throat> all term one, term two, and you can do that as yeah. far as you want. I think as far as as many as you want. Okay. Yes. So, so this is completely, it will allow you to do any kind of combination between the data hypercube and, and tuples. Okay. So you can have tuples in as one of the dimensions of the hypercube, or you can have hypercubes as one of the entry of the tuples, etc. And the other thing is that it's XML queryable. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, are, there were other XML formats already existed, for example, defined by, I think, IBM or Oracle. Yeah. Which essentially they want they created a, a XML formats where they where you would could put tables of data in, but they were not queryable with XML standard tools because in fact what they said was start matrix and then they would have tab delimited data inside of the element, which is really it's just ridiculous. In the beginning, I mean, even before we started SVRML, when we started looking into this thing, we thought I mean Norman Payton, one of our, our collaborators, he is a data management guy for the IRs. People have done this. I know IBM has a format, and so you can look for it. And then you cannot. So, so here you can actually use um, XQuery for any value that you have in these things. So these are these files are really databases. They are XML databases. Right. Yeah. That's the advantage. Yeah. Um, but let's say you know you generate a large amount of simulation data. You would store it in this. Well, yeah, I'll, I'll compress it. Yeah, I'll compress <laughs> it. With anything XML, yes. Yeah. Normally XML, yes. Yeah, it would be, contact. you know, the I'm I'm pretty sure this will be like ten times the size of the of the equivalent yeah. comma separated value. Yeah, yeah. Sure. So you can easily convert to CSV if you want. Yeah, you do. But the the CSV won't tell you what the columns are. That's the problem. Yeah, it's a good way of say of, of persisting the data, and then when you want to use the data, yeah. you can convert. Well, it should compress. If it's XML, it should compress very well because there's so much redundancy. Right. So you know, the compressed versus CSV, uh, you're actually probably going to get a smaller, much yeah. smaller format. Oh, yeah. um, compared to something like HDF, it might be bigger, yeah. compressed. Yeah. But um, you gain an advantage from from other things. In these days, you know, this space is cheap, and bandwidth is getting better. So. What data for the editors? And, you know, a user right, will want to look at the data and edit it. I guess that's up to a tool, right? To, uh, to oh, but yeah. it's part of your web tool is going to be something that's like a, 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 a I don't know what to call it, a, not a visualization interface, but a, a viewing, uh, examination interface. You know, something that lets you. It's tricky. Yeah. It's because you can you can represent anything. Yeah. Ten-dimensional data cube, yeah. and so how are you going to visualize ten-dimensional data cube? Yeah. So I mean, in principle, there should be packages that allow you to do that. The question is, those packages don't have to, so that so when you need to make conversions. So for example, the spreadsheet is a direct. Um, obviously, most people use have their data in spreadsheets. For example, parameter estimation, right? You get it data from your experimental list, you get it in your spreadsheet, all nicely color coded and all of that stuff that people that use Excel like to do. 
then you have to figure out what yellow means and green, and, and then you put that in your ontology, essentially. Yeah. What but, do they export format? What do they export format to support what that diagram? Yeah, it's still at the initial uh, uh, stage. It depends if, if people are interested in national format, we can mm -hmm. also file that. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. We just put the, the yeah. basic ones there. So, what about reading, reading in? What happens to some of the CSV files? What's the strategy there? Well, the person needs to say what each column yes, is. Yes, you need to specify that. Uh, so it's exactly what happens in capacity parameter estimation. We read all sorts of kind of tab delimited formats. But the user needs to say this column is that particular thing in the model. And, and that, that's, that's no way around it. What's this uh, format that people talk about? Is it a uh, NASA one or a particle physics one? HD? Yeah, same here. You're not a converter for that? Ideally, yeah. that should be the case, but that's probably a bit of work. So this this mm -hmm. stuff is at the moment not funded, so yeah. working on it on the spare time. Yeah. yeah. So so presumably you could take like the first row of the CSV file and like assume that those are IDs and then look for those IDs in a, in a <coughs> file that you in the model that you know the format of or like SVM or whatever. You can, you, yeah, you, can, you can make that assumption, but yeah, are you going to find the, yeah. Are you going to find any file that fits the assumption? I don't know. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you've generated the file, then yes. Yeah. So, well, you, not, you not not say that there is a, a if you make your CSV file in this format, then it will sure. the converter will work for you. Sure. So, yeah. But yeah, it would be nice to have. Uh, yeah. Did the already go to that? Yeah. I mean, that's the. Yeah, the, the, the problem we have is really this. When you do parameter estimation, you get data from people, and you always have to format it. There's no way you can automate that step. Because I said, I mean, they do even color coding. It goes up to this. You know, they do this. They have cells with yellow background. That means this one is something, and cells with green background. You cannot even get that because it can convert to what? limited? No. I'm just saying, if I follow the arrows, I can go all the way from the right to the left. Yeah, your arrows. There's, there's a small <laughs> problem with the diagram. That oh, okay. it, it's quite bi-directional translation, but actually those arrows shouldn't be okay. bi-directional. Okay. Okay. <laughs> that's all we're changing. The arrows should just go there. Go there, yeah. Okay, go ahead. No, no, no. Just go to the right. Yeah, okay. Currently. Yeah. yeah, it's not easy to go. That way. Yeah, so, way yeah. As I said, you may have a multidimensional data yeah, yeah, yes. There are formats for that. For, for HDF, that would work. But for spreadsheets, that won't work. You, you, you will have to then specify what slice of it do you want to put you know, on your spreadsheet. But you might want to support the common case. Yeah, for the common cases, then it will not be as difficult as that. Yeah, 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 yeah you, know, you, 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 you assume you have a two dimensional yeah. spreadsheet, then you can do it. There so, uh, you said it's spawned out of SBRML. Okay. So what's left of SBRML if the data is pulled out from your set ML? Is there anything? So I'm not sure I understand exactly what, what is, is there, the place of SBRML? An, is there an SBRML still? Yeah. What, I mean, what does exists. it represent? It well, exists. You if you want to use it, you can use it. It's actually recorded what, what simulation was executed. That's set ML, isn't it? Well, SBRML also the plan. The set ML was the plan. And and SBRML was like what actually happened, I think. Because yeah, I mean, what so we happens were, and what make it happen. Yeah, we, we were looking at SBRML more as a, of an archival format, as a, as a way of specifying, documenting that these were the results of that simulation that happened. Um, of course, you, to document the results of a simulation, you have to describe the simulation. Such as that. Uh, that's it. Well, yeah. but that's exactly where the two things would develop more or less at the same time. So that's where they kind of overlap, even though the intentions are different. Because SCDML, in principle, is these are the instructions to run a simulation. Where this one was, this was the, the output of the simulation. But you still have to say the instructions. The output of the simulation. Yeah. Well, actually, when we, we were doing this, then, then people actually told us. We, we had the uh, comments often. I mean, we discussed this. We presented this in 2008, I think, in, uh, in Gothenburg. And then we have comments. And the first comments we got from most people were, this is a great way to, to actually format experimental data, which we weren't thinking about in the beginning. 
And it's true. I mean, in fact, in the paper we, we chose an example. Yeah, Mike, you also had a paper. So, <coughs> the, uh, for the microgen, <coughs> excuse me, for the API language interfaces, you're using Swift to generate them? Like in yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Python on Mark 1 might be something that might attract more users. You have kind of a yeah, it's chicken and egg question, right? You're, we have a Python one. Python oh, you know, was it one? Oh, yeah. Python's been used already. Python's 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 it's the Python one that has been used. The Java one is more there just because, yeah. because people will want the mic one. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Then if not, we move on to the next speaker. And uh, next speaker, we have Augustine Luna, who's going to talk about fax tools, right? Fax tools are. Um, I have an email from Stuart Moody saying he had a question on the new ML project. Do we want to take that? Yeah. Sure. 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 Joseph, there's one more question for you. Okay. Yeah. I'm telling him he can ask. He's It's an online question. He was asking. Is the SBRML uh, the dimensionality of the data? The dimensionality? No. Yes, I mean, so how, how, how many dimensions do we have? Infinite number. Yeah. Unlimited. As much as one. Unlimited. One, so I want to describe the structure that the using dimension description thing. Fine. You can have 56 dimensional data cube and a terabyte <laughs> drive to go with it. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, PAX tools R and uh, how we're, how with the uh, BioPacks and PAX tools and Pathway Commons, how we're pivoting towards users to make um, the, the data format BioPacks um, and all the content that we have in Pathway Commons more accessible to the users that are using R. <coughs> so the first thing that um, Mary should think about, and, and this might be also good for the general discussion later in the day, is where are the users? And for um, are the combined standards talking the same languages as the users that they're uh, that are using some of the data? So just the, the bar plot on the right hand side there, um, for the Kaggle challenges, which is this uh, data mining competitions, you can see that the majority of, of uh, the users actually using R, followed by MATLAB. Um, then we got SAS, Weka, but C++ and Java are way down the list there. Um, and one question that might kind of arise me showing this thing, so the Kaggle challenges are these small competitions, but uh, that are very time constrained, but we can also think of, of just research in general where it's kind of in the competition spirit, right? We get the grants, we do the project, and then we move on. So it's kind of in the same flavor. So a lot of the combined software developments tend to be in Java and C++, but there are these large R and Python communities that, that we also have to keep in mind and make sure that our software meets the needs of those people. So a little background on the R language. So it's a free and open source language. It was started back in 1993, so 20 years ago almost, or more than 20 years ago. And it was really geared towards scientific computing, and it was developed by two statisticians. So um, it, it's a functional language. It was influenced by the language scheme. And it's interpreted, so that makes it similar to MATLAB. And now the heart of it. Why is R so popular? First and foremost, it's free and open source, unlike this, uh, the S variant. 
Um, it's easy to, for users to try out new ideas. That's a big thing. It has interactive, and part of that is that it has interactive data analysis. So everything is script driven instead of being GUIs, right? So that means I can share my script, I can share my little piece of code. That doesn't, and it means that I don't have to be clicking around on the screen and how do you, you know, how are you going to translate that uh, for other users to use if you want to give them little snippets of things. The code tends to be a lot less verbose than, um, for example, Java C++. And a big, big plus for the R language is that it's a very, it has a very flexible and powerful plotting system. And um, there are some plots in, that I can make in R pretty easily with a few hundred lines of code that I can't imagine doing in any other language. Um, the other big thing is that it has an excellent package management system. So it's uh, it has this large and ever-growing collection of, of statistical analysis methods. This, uh, it has a simple package installation uh, method. I, um, this is almost at the level of, of uh, Perl. Perl has always been has had a very simple um, installation mechanism. Uh, by contrast, Python. I've, I've had a lot more uh, problems installing packages with Python than I've ever had with R. Um, so it, it does dependency management. That means I want to install this thing. It knows what other things it depends on and just goes ahead and, and grabs those. Um, the R scripts are portable to other, uh, other platforms. You know, I, I can write uh, right now the part, one of the projects that I'm, I'll show you later in the presentation. Um, I'm, I'm writing up most uh, most of it in, in on Mac, but we're we're working with people that are also Linux and Windows, and we don't have to rewrite it. Um, the package repositories that, that store these packages, um, they, they really have a good validation mechanism uh, to make sure that the, the packages are, are functional across multiple platforms, that they have good uh, documentation, um, and that's just really important. They also have this concept of vignettes that uh, some of the repositories uh, demand. Um, before the uh, package can be included. And these are basically tutorials. And the tutorials include um, the way that the code is set up, they're actually bundled. So you can just run them in R and, and um, see, the, uh, see the actual code being processed. So it's not, uh, so most of the time it's not just incomplete snippets that you don't know how to actually put into um, practice. So. Now to talk about some of the, the, the um, R repositories that exist. So uh, the biggest one is CRAN. Um, it has uh, close to 6,000 packages as of uh, June of this year. Um, many of the packages actually use C or C++ or CRAN Java code uh, to speed up the code that uh, the calculations within um, uh, the packages. Uh, Bioconductor is the biggest one as far as uh, bioinformatics uh, community is concerned. And it has 824 packages, and 56 of them have been annotated as being um, uh, related to pathway analysis. There's also kind of an upstart here. Uh, there's an R package called DevTools that actually lets you um, uh, install directly from a, a code repository such as Bitbucket or, or uh, GitHub. <coughs> okay, so now I'm kind of turning towards uh, pathway data and uh, analysis in R. So uh, th this diagram is from a review earlier in the year um, where uh, you can see we've got components in R that let you do the graphics. You have the connectors that connect to uh, the XML formats to uh, the libSBML. You'll see that BioPacks is missing. And that's why we, we need the PAX tools component in there. And also uh, the connectors such as Biomar R let you do a lot of the ID mapping that you'd ever want to do. Um, and so the data sources, uh, uh, the data sources can come from a lot of different places, uh, but CAG is the one that's it's it's the most widely used. <coughs> CAG and ReactCom, as far as R users and the packages that um, uh, that currently exist in R, they focus in on CAG and ReactCom. Um, we also have external visualization. Um, so there is one package, for instance, called R Cytoscape that lets you programmatically control Cytoscape. Um, and so uh, the packages, the packages down here in the yellow, those are the ones that, that actually contain the data for with uh, the various data sources. Okay, so the, the data sources for for R. 
So, um, and Matt, when he presented, I think on Monday, um, he, he described a path guide right now. It's our list of, of um, pathway databases that currently exist. We have over 500 of them. Um, <coughs> as I said, the ones that are most reflected as far as our users are actually um, uh, CAG, React Home, and there's two uh, uh, libraries that actually handle SPML. Um, but the, there is one Biopass API that's currently um, around, but it, it's uh, primarily for level two, and it also only handles a very small set of, of interactions, basically just stimulation and inhibition. Um, a lot of well-known databases, HPRD and PantherDB, they're, they're completely excluded. And also a lot of different biomolecule, uh, are, uh, biomolecules are underrepresented. So that means things like drugs and metabolites, microRNAs are not well represented by the information that our users have access to. So um, kind of what is the architecture of uh, PACS tools are? So, as an input, we have all these databases that are, that are coming into Pathway Commons. They're first converted into biopacks and then um, uh, put into Pathway Commons, and that's all done through Patch Tools functionality. Uh, Patch Tools, uh, then how it connects into Patch Tools, how we're using that from Patch Tools are, is through the connector library R Java, and then um, how I access data from Pathway Commons is through the R code library. Um, and then once you have data in Pax Tools R, then you can uh, access the other packages that, that I showed before to do the analysis or the visualization. And just a kind of a quick reminder of what exactly Pax Tools can, uh, what it does and what it, it, it can handle. So Pax Tools is our Java library that, that handles graph queries, other algorithms, and um, export functionality to, to several formats. And then Pathway Commons is uh, our, our aggregated uh, repository. Once everything has been converted into biopacks, it also has a mechanism for doing some limited ID mapping. And the two main outputs are uh, the web service component, um, which access some of the uh, uh, some uh, graph algorithms, and also the batch uh, download um, services, where you can grab everything either in biopacks or in various uh, um, uh, delimited formats. OK, so patch tools are. So what are the main features of it? So it allows you to validate um, uh, biopacks um, data sets. It lets you merge multiple networks, extract parts of those networks, uh, either from local biopacks files or from, piece, uh, from Pathway Commons PC. Um, it lets you query. Um, I mentioned that. So uh, the other thing is that Right now, the main uh, core of how users actually interact at the, the, the level of detail that exists in Biopads, but actually a more simplified representation. And I'm going to go into more detail on that in a couple of slides. Um, and as far as the tutorial, it's not simply saying, here are the functions that are, are available to you. But in, in, instead, this is um, some example workflows that you might actually be interested in, in performing yourself. So that means visualization, and a key component of that is data overlay. And also, uh, gene set enrichment is another thing that I included in um, the tutorial. And uh, the, uh, the figure on the right-hand side there is just a network that I completely generated using um, uh, calls uh, within R and then the visualization also in R. OK. So now dealing with the complexity of Biopacks. So Biopacks has right now six, over 60 classes and 90 properties. And, and most people's algorithms cannot handle that level of complexity. And so we have this format, the simple interaction format. Basically, it's an edge list with, um, with an interaction type, so three mm -hmm. columns. Um, and so the way that we perform, uh, produce uh, the SIF format is uh, we extract um, out uh, uh, interactions using graph queries, interesting interaction patterns uh, that exist in the pathway commons data. And I'm going to, the next slide has some examples of that. But these include things like uh, uh, complex formation, metabolic reactions, modifications. Um, and one nice thing about the SIF format is currently the way that, that uh, Pathway Commons is structured, and, and Amek alluded to this, is that we have an alignment problem. So different curators across the uh, various databases curate their data in slightly different ways. So it doesn't, uh, reactions that 
are the same don't exactly line up. But it, um, and so there, within uh, Pathway Commons, there are, there's still in these dis, uh, disparate kind of clusters when you actually visualize them. And so the SIF format does a, a nice, uh, because it's so simplified, it does a nice job of actually uh, um, integrating across multiple databases. And so where are some of the SIF conversions? So here are just three examples. We have a total of 14, uh, and this is for a publication that's in preparation by us and her in, in our lab. And so the first one is complex formation. So A, B, and C are um, in a complex together with each other. And so basically, it's just binary um, uh, interactions between all of the components within the complex. The catalysis for scenes is um, basically uh, rea biochemical reactions. So X is being converted to Y, uh, uh, X is being converted to Y over to Z, and so A and, and B are sequentially um, uh, catalyzing those separate interactions. And then there's the control states change up, where we have um, uh, A, for example, being a kinase, and uh, B could be phosphorylated, and so A is controlling the state change of B. <laughs> so um, we're, we're kind of thinking about milestones as far as tax tools are, and what are the different levels of functionality that we're going to provert, provide to users. So the, the very first one is just getting access to basic data requests. I just want the full uh, Pathway Commons data set. I want something in BioPacks, whatever. Just basic levels of, of data requests into full, um, data uh, objects that um, our users can actually use. And, and the primary um, data object is actually a data frame, and it's a very tabular format. The second one is data traversals and graph queries. Uh, the third one is um, interaction uh, reduction methodologies. And I'm going to give an example uh, as far as an example project later on. But uh, so I'm going to hold off on that one. And then the fourth one is um, providing access to more advanced analysis algorithms um, that also make use of experimental data. So just as two examples, one uh, algorithm that, that we, it, it's actually very handy, um, it's uh, this NetBots algorithm that finds modules uh, within uh, a, a network um, of alter, uh, using as its seed altered uh, genes and, and altered gene mutations or copy number alterations. It also provides, a the algorithm provides a mechanism for finding linkers. So maybe you only have a set of genes, you only have the set of genes that were actually mutated or altered, but then you want to find the linkers that connect up these altered genes. The second one is SPIA, and it's uh, very similar to um, uh, like gene set enrichment analysis, where you're finding what are the relevant pathways given a set of differentially expressed genes. And that, that's to my bio group, but, but we want to provide all, uh, the Pathway Commons data uh, for functionality in SPIA. So here's the first uh, example project, and this is uh, my main research project, and it's a collaboration with the NCI, the National Cancer Institute. And the goal is to uh, identify novel drug target interactions uh, using compound activity and also genomic profiling data. It's also to prioritize compounds in this large uh, drug data set of 42,000 compounds for further development and through a, a very multi-disciplinary uh, kind of approach where we're, we're thinking about pharmacology, we're thinking about pathways, we're thinking about also the novelty of, of these to be pursued as potential drug candidates. Um, the data, as I mentioned, it's 42,000. It's a library of 42,000 um, drug compounds. It, um, each one of these compounds has been tested uh, either at least once, but uh, in some cases uh, up to you know, maybe like 10 times on a, a panel of 60 cell lines um, that have been developed by the NCI for about 20, 30 years now. Um, the cell lines themselves have been uh, characterized uh, in a huge number of ways. Uh, we've got copy number information, mutations, gene expression, microRNA, uh, protein levels. We also have uh, multi-drug resistant profiles, methylation, RNA-C. Um, and some of the key R packages that I'm using in this work are uh, GeoMet for regression analysis, or CDK for structure analysis, and then Paxuals are for the pathway component. And so the basic workflow that is going on with this, this project is that we have the compound library. We also have the response and the genomic data. 
Um, the first thing is to uh, create a, a scaffolds of each one of the drug structures where we kind of pull, uh, get rid of the, the, the side chains to then kind of really focus in on what are the core uh, uh, components of the, these drug structures that, that might impart um, pharmacological activity uh, on the side for uh, the, the, the drug response and the genomic information. We're doing a regression analysis, so basically what genes, what uh, various uh, variations, uh, et cetera, um, impact the drug uh, activity the most. Um, and then we're also clustering the, activi uh, the activities of the drugs um, by structure and by activity. So then we, we think about, okay, so we have this compound, uh, this cluster of compounds by their activity, and we can kind of start um, uh, piecing together. Well, we see these predictors come out of the regression multiple times for these very similar looking uh, compounds. So these are, these are nice uh, uh, clues as to what might be um, key indicators for the activity of drugs. And then, but the thing is, we get this these long list of maybe 20, 30 predictors of activity, but we don't know how they're connected to each other. And that's where the pathway information really comes in. So we uh, map, one, one example workflow would be to map uh, the, the regression rates onto the network, diffuse the values out across the network, so that we can see what are the, some of the key linkers that are uh, that might be potentially driving um, uh, the activity of the drug within this particular context, um, and are uh, is uh, are those sub networks things that we know that are pharmacologically interesting? Um, the next thing is to then kind of uh, rank. The, uh, the various predictors that so that we can then follow up with experimental evaluation of these not potentially novel drug um, target interactions. One of the uh, and, and I kind of mentioned the uh, the deficits of, of uh, some of the resources that exist for pathway data, but there's also deficit uh, um, and so some of the ways that we're trying to address that. So the the diagram on the right hand side, these are uh, in the blue are the the drug clusters and the nodes in the red are is information from drug bank, um, drug bank and uh, keg compounds in a in project called Pi Holder. And so we can see that there's uh, within these clusters we only have a, uh, I should have mentioned this we only have a set of 500 drugs that are annotated as either being FDA approved or uh, in clinical trials. Um, and, but you can see that within clusters, so a, a given cluster might be anywhere from a thousand compounds to uh, uh, maybe 24 compounds. But we can see that for a given drug cluster, we might already have uh, some information for some of the drugs as far as what are the drug targets. Um, let's see. So, uh, but there are some very large databases that contain these drug target interaction uh, pieces of information that are not captured in, in Pi-Hulper or in Pathway Commons yet. Two of the biggest ones that we're still trying to capture in are uh, from GKB from Stanford and then uh, CTD, this uh, um, uh, key, uh, comparative toxicogenomics database. You know, and that's out of uh, North Carolina, Durham. Um, so, uh, yeah, and so I, I explained the, the graph on the right. So the idea is basically we have a, the compounds clustered by activity, and the idea is if we have already known drug target interactions for something in the, the drug cluster, then can we start making inferences about what might be uh, for the unknown drugs, what might be driving some of the activity for those. Okay, so that was the, kind of the first example. This is now the, um, the second kind of uh, one of the research projects that's going on in um, the Sanger lab at, at Sloan Carradine. Is, uh, so we have uh, one experimental drug that inhibits the activity of this very important cancer gene, NIC. It's a transcription factor. And um, the challenge is that um, uh, they're using a protein assay that uh, uses the antibodies and actually measures specific phosphorylation states. So, um, and kind of the goal of this project is to propose drug combinations or, or um, interesting parts of the network that might be targeted by, by uh, other drugs. So this, um, they, the, uh, the antibodies that are actually being used for this study, there's only 150, so we can kind of visualize the entire network. 
And here, uh, the boxes kind of tell you where the key pathways, it, it constrains the nodes into key pathways. Um, and the, uh, the red and blue tells you if, if the protein levels are o uh, overexpressed or underexpressed uh, in, in relation <coughs> to, to the controls. So here's kind of a, a reduced map where we hid uh, the, the nodes that aren't really changing. And, um, and so I'm going to focus in on, on the, the box in the center there where, um, where we have not only antibodies that measure total levels of this protein AKT, which is uh, an important kinase, we also have uh, antibodies that measure phosphorylation <laughs> states. And so uh, the typical analysis um, that we usually do with the pathway information is where we are only really focused in on the, uh, the total uh, protein levels. We're only focused in on AKT and we don't really care about the states. But in this particular analysis or in, in certain um, biological pathways, it's actually not really, uh, it, it's more important to know the state information than it is to know the whole protein information. Because if the levels of the uh, phosphorylated proteins uh, were low, then the protein, it, it could be, uh, there could be an abundance of it, but it would still not be active. And so we have the, uh, we're still in the process of developing uh, better methodologies, not only for, for uh, phosphorylation information, but also for other, we can imagine like epigenetic information where we need to split out uh, total values for a given species from um, state specific information. Okay, so that, that was the majority of it, so just a summary. Um, as, as, we, as the combined uh, standards uh, stabilize, we need to start pivoting towards uh, better usage and analysis uh, by actual users in real world cases. And so R is, is a large community that, that we should not forget. And just because we have programming interfaces that allow you to export data for a particular language, that might not be sufficient. That might not actually lead you to uh, utility by those users. And, and it really is important to understand the projects that people do. For instance, in, in R, you're going to be doing statistical related projects. And so it's important to understand the projects that are actually developed within a language. Why did they pick it um, uh, so you know whether your data is going to actually be useful to these communities? So Pagstools R makes uh, useful um, local uh, biopack data sets and also, out, uh, and also algorithms from, from Pagstools. Uh, that are available through just Pack Schools and also from Pathway Commons. The further work is, um, here for PC, just PC and Pack Schools, the Java versions, the, the main components, is to extend the data sources that exist in Pathway Commons and also to work on these reduction methods for uh, biopacks so that um, more algorithms can actually use the biopack <coughs> information. Um, and, and as far as further work on uh, PAX tools are, there we need to, uh, I still need to better integrate uh, various graph analyses that, that have been developed to, um, uh, within PAX tools are, and also extend uh, some of the web service commands. Some of them are very useful, but they don't operate on local data, so I need to, to also work on them. Uh, as far as acknowledgments from Sloan Carroting, um, uh, a lot of people have been involved. Um, and also NCI for, for the specific drug set um, project that I mentioned. And of course, I also want to thank the, the combined organizers and the NHGRI for the funding. And that's it. So I'll take any questions. Thank you. Questions? I have a small comment, it's really not a question. But if R needs Java to be faster, I mean, that's just something about its speed. Oh, yeah, yeah, it, it is slower, and, and that's a known thing, and, um, but it's just a lot easier for, for actual users to use. And that's why I, was, that's why I had that, that slide early on. It's a question of how do you bring these people into the community? How do you make it and a standard, standard tool? Standard across all statistics. You know, these partners are using that. Exactly, yeah. And, and like I said, the, the example of cases that it's I gave, these are statistical um, um, projects. Right? They're not ODEs, they're not kinetic homing projects. Okay. Uh, 
Well, that, that makes sense, too. I mean, you go to the user perspective. If it takes an hour to run instead of a minute to run, but it saves you two months of development time, sure. it's still yeah. a, a big win. I mean, the main, major thing is everybody's using it, and that's like libraries for almost all the disco. Yeah. Not everyone. Mm -hmm. Not everyone. Not everyone. Not, Not everyone, everyone, but the majority. And it's also, like I said, it's the, the I mean, I'll just show, uh, didn't know exactly where to put the slide, but this is actually one of the plots that we made for the regression analysis. I don't know how to do that in any other language. Um, this is about maybe 200 lines of code. And it's a very complicated plot, and it's customized. And so, I mean, you know, anytime that we start um, talking to users, one of the first things is how do I visualize the data in the way that I want it to be, right? And R just makes that a lot easier. So, but isn't it the case that the reason this is so easy to do in R is because someone wrote yeah. a routine to do this particular mm. kind yeah. of plot? Well, exactly. they did the, the heat map plot. So basically, it's a heat map plot. It's a bar plot. <coughs> the bottom is also uh, basically also a heat map, and then there's two kind of uh, legends, but right? And I, I put them together. But that's, well, that's that's you can do in other environments yeah. as well. So it's Python map plot. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Python is also you can do a lot with a hundred lines of code. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah, but the but thing is that in R, yeah. a lot of people have already written packages to do particular kinds of visualizations, and so it's off the shelf and a few lines of code for the end user. Yes, but it's because someone wanted to oh, yeah, 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 yeah. in the first place. So. Yeah. yeah, and that, but that's what makes R so powerful. The the six thousand, seven thousand packages that exist if you combine the various repositories. Yeah. Oh, but so. I mean, is that a statement really about R as a tool compared to other specialized tools, let's say in systems biology, like, um, I, I don't want to pick on Kopasi, but, so, uh, I mean, it's sort of, an, it's not quite the same thing, right? It's kind of an apples to oranges. No, no, no. Uh, but I will say that, that when you think about uh, some of the cases specific to R users, right? Uh, like I said, the interactive data analysis that you can just plug away uh, some line of code and, and see something happen is not a menu-driven kind of thing. And so how do you share uh, kind of that knowledge of these are the buttons that I clicked in Kaposi to, to do something? Right. You share them with me. Um, yeah, but I mean, this is more com more comparable to something like MATLAB. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. And, and that comparison it actually comes out better because it's open and yeah. 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 And that's why I have this plot. So R and map. I mean, R. this is equivalent to Octave, except that it has it's much more successful than Octave ever was. Yeah. Yeah. Because I mean, it, it, you did not mention that, but it is a clone of Escos. Yeah. Yeah. It is. It's a total clone, but it's free and open source. That you know, that yeah, again, that's why I put it in. But people didn't take it up. So. The first line was, "Why is R popular? Because it's free and open source." And I know all our software. No, it's, it's popular because people took it up. That Octave is the same thing. You could say the same thing about Octave versus MATLAB, but people just don't take that. The engineers, they don't care about paying tons of money to right. some company, and so they, they all use MATLAB. Yeah, but Mat uh, Octave has its own political issues. Well, but I, I'm sure there are some in R as well. Actually, I think those are not the case anymore, because it used to be that um, the author, if I remember it, 10 years or so, or 15 years ago, um, the author didn't want it to be a clone of MATLAB, and saw it as a completely different thing. Yeah, it started off, <laughs> then he, he thought, well, we don't want to make it a clone of MATLAB, then nobody used it. So then he turned around and said, well, maybe maybe we should try to make it a clone of MATLAB, and then more people use it. So, so I think they're no longer trying to not make it, you know, that's a weird issue. Like. But the other political issue is it's quite unfriendly to Windows. Yeah. I mean, you try to post Octave in, in your own application Windows, it's Really, really hard. Yeah, and we, that's we the other one. to do it once. Yeah, it this out. It's a lot of effort. Um, <coughs> it's also it's really hard. It is true. I mean, that's that's many reasons. Yeah, yeah and that, we, that's we're that's digressing here. I, I mean, we're already talking about Octave, which is not about this <laughs> talk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but that's the other reason I, I put in there um, the ability to uh, just move your code to other platforms. That's just a huge, huge thing for people. Okay, yeah. any other questions <coughs> for this particular talk? Okay, so then we move on. Um, thanks again. Our next speaker is Samuel Freeman, who's going to talk about multi cell DS.
you want to show you up? The resolution? The resolution is probably the I brought my own. Oh, okay. It's crystal seven problems. It's real dumb. It's real dumb. It's real So thank you very much for all showing up this morning, and hopefully you're all still awake. Um, I'm going to talk with you about one of the applications that uh, uh, the lab I'm in, Paul Macklin's lab, we've been working on, uh, which is basically creating these digital cell lines to initialize uh, these agent-based simulations of up to a half million cells. So I want to go over a little bit of an overview about digital cell lines. Some people were here on Monday. I remember what was going on. I don't know how many of you that would be. Um, so I'm going to do a little bit of that. Uh, I'm then going to talk mostly about the snapshot generator, which is the focus of the talk, about how do we initialize our simulations, uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about our agent-based model, because we really do use that in order to complete our initialization. So here's a little bit of a figure that we had from uh, Monday uh, about how we take various pieces of information, say from literature or from scientific experiments, and then we wind up somehow making that into a digital cell line. Edwin, the next talk, is going to be talking about how you go from sort of the part over here on the left into the middle. I'm going to be talking about more how you get from the middle with these digital cell lines, properties about it, uh, individual types of cells, over to actual simulation. And now, and hopefully this will start. Yes, so this is a simulation that we've run before, um, up to a half million cells. This is run with OpenMP, so this does not need a computer cluster. Um, and as you can see, it's growing along, and eventually it slices in half to give you a cutaway view. And you can eventually start to see, in the case of this tumor, uh, we're at about 50,000 agents. You have this sort of brown necrotic core forming in the center with a viable rim on the outside as the simulation continues onward. Um, you can sort of see a little bit better on the right, uh, cross section straight through the middle uh, with the gaps that are formed inside the tumor. So the big question is, how do we start everything off here correctly? So we need our initial parameters. And so that's really what multi-cell DS and these digital cell lines are going to give us. And so a little bit of an overview from Monday. Uh, we have three basic types for multi-cell DS. We have an uh, experimental snapshot. Basically, we've annotated some experimental results. Uh, we have a simulation snapshot. Basically, it's an output from one of my computer simulations. Uh, and then we have a curated cell line, which has been reviewed and refined by some group of people. We're working on defining exactly who that is in the exact process. But nevertheless, we will have some sort of curated data that says, this is what an MCF7 cell looks like. Here is what an F9 mouse cancer cell looks like. Um, each digital cell, sorry, each snapshot has basically three vectors of information. One is essentially the environmental conditions, how much oxygen, how much glucose there is, 
uh, in a given location in space. And so we've had, had a lot of questions about how do we discretize space, what's the right way to do that. So some of the connections with the SBML spatial package is particularly relevant here. Um, we have the phenotype, like the cell cycle parameters, uh, what's the flexibility or the Young's modulus of a cell, what percentage of the cell is liquid, and also some state information, which is going to continuously change in time, like where is my cell? How fast is it going? How big is it? So we want uh, all that information in our snapshots, but when we look at the curated cell lines, we're going to strip out that state information because that's not particular to uh, the properties of a cell for a given phenotype in a given environment. The state will needs to be stripped away and consequently needs to be generated somehow. And so that's really the snapshot generator's job, is I need to generate these states given some phenotypes in a given environment. So as I said, the snapshot generator needs to answer some basic questions, like where is the cell going to be? What is the cell phenotype? Is it going to, how long does it take to go through the cell cycle? How big it is? what percentage of it should be a nuclear material, and then how do we get all of this properly configured in a consistent manner? And so we need sort of some time scale information, we need spatial distributions, and we also need some phenotypic parameters. So we say, okay, we're going to randomly pick within some reason some of our properties so we have a distribution of values, and we also use the agent-based model cell simulator to make sure that everything is nice and consistent. So this is probably the slide, if you're going to pay attention to one slide in the talk, the slide you should be looking at. Uh, so we have basically on the left over here the initial conditions that you feed into your snapshot generator. How many cells you have, what's the environment at any given location, and what are some phenotypic parameters of the cells you're looking at. Each of these that basically feeds in to a couple other th things. And so the number of cells you need to get to all the positions of the cells. We then run our mechanics for a little while to make sure everything is relaxed and consistent once we have some uh, distribution of all their locations. And then at each location, I need to ask, what are my environmental conditions? So that I can then go and ask, well, what's the phenotype at that location? And given those environmental conditions. Then once I have all of that, uh, done, I then run forward and time a little bit more just on the phenotypic side to make sure that all the cell cycle information is consistent and uh, all the volumes are the right size. And then because we've also adjusted all the volumes, some of the mechanics might be off a little bit again. And then we need to run on the mechanics for another five to minutes to make sure it's relaxed. And then ta-da! We now have our initialization. Our Snapshot is complete, or we can just hit run if we've done this in our code. So as I said, this is the main slide. Uh, one last little detail. We do have a little bit of some coupling between the mechanics and the phenotype when we're dealing with G0, G1 cells, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. So for our positions, basically, we want to have two main characterizations right now. A 2D modulator really representing what two people in a lab ex doing experiments have for their cells. Basically, oh look, I took some cells, I plated them, and they're all in one layer in 2D. And so well, our cells right now, when we do this, they're not allowed to move in 3D at all. They're only constrained to a 2D simulation, so it runs a little bit faster. Uh, basically, for position, we say we have some truncated Gaussian and you'll see in a little bit that what that sort of looks like at the end of the talk. Uh, cells are allowed to be too close at the beginning, meaning that you know, we randomly put them in, and this is why we do need to do the mechanics in order to relax the system so that it is consistent. Uh, another way to do this in 3D is this 3D spheroid. Basically, we do about the same thing, except we just add uh, another uh, component to the dimension. Uh, the next thing is the environmental conditions at a given location. So we're going to talk about oxygen first because we know that this is very important and that dictates the, uh, say, the duration of a cell that it spends in G0, G1. So we say, all right, we have our oxygen somehow spread out in our simulation and we are 
going to do multilinear interpolation in order to figure out what the oxygenation level should be at that location. So when we have lower oxygen level, cells spend more time in G0, G1 phase. At a higher oxygen level, they spend a shorter amount, and they go through their cell cycle faster, and they proliferate more. So we also need to do an interpolation, and not only in physical space, but also in genotypic parameter space to ask what's the exact time uh, scale for G0 to G1. Uh, we're currently working on our refining our reaction diffusion code uh, to get better um, molecular concentration levels, and this could be uh, for right now oxygen, but in the future we want to be able to do this with multiple species, molecules or drugs, glucose, some other cancer treatment drug that you want to put it in, whatever. So I then want to talk about cell cycles a little bit. Uh, because this talks about how we initialize our phenotypic parameters. And this is a little bit related to what Edwin is going to talk about. So Edwin really cares about how do you get these time scales as you go from one state to the phase to the next phase to the next phase, or if you're going to die, how you get out of here and you become apoptotic and then eventually necrotic. So there's some differential equations I'll briefly show you on the next slide. Um, and uh, note that these parameters are going to basically be dependent on the microenvironment, and so this is a really nonlinear system here. So, uh, but for what I care about, Edwin needs to tell me, or somebody needs to tell me, what are these numbers? And I say, okay, great, move on. So basically, we have these differential equations. Uh, to figure out what the population in each of these different phases is going to be. And uh, the terms basically wind up being in this first equation here. Um, the two cells are divided from a mitotic cell that become G0, G1 cell. Some of them leave and that phase use and become, go into S phase. Some of them instead become apoptotic. And these terms basically then say here the rates going into S phase, out of S phase, and so forth going on all the way down here. And this last line is cells coming in, becoming apoptotic, <coughs> cells going through apoptosis, becoming necrotic, and then we say, okay, we don't really care about these cells. They've died, they're gone, move on. So we do use these differential equations to try and initialize what a steady state distribution will be. And so we want to say, all right, we start off with some initial conditions, run this for a long amount of time, and then what's the uh, cell per base percentages? So we take these time scales and we convert them to the cell phase percentages with those different equations, and we might get something like 60% of our cells are in G0, G1 phase, another 10% are in S phase, another 10% in G2, another 10% in M phase, and 10% are apoptotic. And so we have some ways knowing that, say, I had 100 cells, 60 of them, that these cells need to be in G0, G1. Um, and then the way we get to have consistent properties about this is we start our cells all at the beginning of S phase and then run it through the cell cycle code. And then we know that it's consistent at this stage. Uh, and when we say it's in, say, G0, G1, we say that, OK, we're going to be at some point in the duration of G0, G1. Let's say it takes, I don't know, six hours. It could be one hour into it. It could be three hours into it. It could be six hours, basically, into it. Uh, we also use our location in the cell cycle to dictate the cell radius, because our cells are going to be growing as they go from um, division in G0, G1 up to mitotic cell because they need to increase their volume in order to undergo mitosis. Uh, and again, as I said, we do need to rerun our mechanics after we do this because guess what? The cells are not the same size they were a moment ago because we just ran through all the uh, phenotyp uh, phenotypic evolution changing the radiance. So, one of the other things we need to do is convert from these digital cell lines, the parameters of these cells. And so these cell lines contain biologically motivated information. This is not necessarily what I, the mathematical modeler, want. And so sometimes it's pretty easy to transfer these parameters over. Sometimes 
things. Uh, we, we needed to come up with some formulae. Uh, Paul and I spent an afternoon sort of hashing out a couple formulas in order to do this conversion. Um, and so now we can say, all right, you give us these biologically motivated numbers, and now we can put them into the uh, set of numbers that are very good for us as a set of modelers. So I did say that there was going to be a little bit of a connection with G0, G1 cells, uh, which is basically when I have a cell, it divides into two daughter cells. We expect those two daughter cells to be near each other and not just sort of randomly separated. And especially these two daughter cells are going to have about the same information for how far they are in G0, G1. Because what happened? You had a mitotic cell. Oh, it split. They should be replicates of each other, essentially. So we want to make sure that they're near each other. So two ways we can do this. One way is pretty simple. We just find two cells that are sort of near each other, and oh, look, great. But especially when we get to apop not apop sorry, hypoxic conditions, we have, we're, we have a low oxygenation level, and we have a longer time scale in G0, G1. More of these cells are going to be in G0, G1. So if you're just randomly pulling pairs, you may not have enough pairs of cells next to each other. So we use some graph theory to figure out what's the maximum number of pairs of cells you can have next to each other. And that so far has worked for us. Uh, I suppose if that doesn't work, rerun your initialization routine again with maybe a different random seed and try again. Um, sometimes, though, if that doesn't work, we still expect some G0, G1 cells to have left their phase before their sister cell has. And so we do expect to see some G0, G1 cells that are off on their own. So we have some solo ones. Uh, but usually we, we've been trying to avoid that. So as I talked about a little bit earlier, we do use our agent-based model in order to do our initialization. And so I want to talk about this very briefly. Uh, so we just model all our cells discreetly, i.e. in a Lagrangian manner. Uh, however, we do have our reaction diffusion code saying where all of our molecules are. That we do on a grid or in an Eulerian manner. Um, it's written in C++, and as I showed you earlier, we can run up to about a half million cells. Um, all of the output files are already uh, digital snapshots, basically. Um, so we've been very happy with that. And so that's one of our motivators for multi-cell DS is, what am I writing all of my data into? I worry about this now because I want to be able to use this as a startup for my simulation, or I go to somebody else and with another simulator and say, hey, can you run my same simulation and, and from where I left off? So that's why I, some of the motivation for multi-cell DS is coming from our simulator. Um, the simulator as a whole requires as input essentially our digital cell lines. This is the environment phenotype pairs. This goes back to the snapshot generator and saying, I need to know basically how to interpolate between all of my cells, especially when my cells evolve in a different environmental condition and I change some of my information and like G0, G1 time scale, I still need all that information. Uh, and then of course I need some of Barry's initialization parameters for the simulation itself, like how long should my simulation run? Um, how often do I want to output files? Um, anything else related to the simulation itself? I mean, this is pretty typical of most uh, computer simulation code, regardless of what it's simulating. So I want to talk very briefly about the mechanics. Uh, right now, we're modeling intercellular forces using uh, Johnson Kendall Roberts approximation. Basically, it says you have two spheres that are going to be pushing on each other. Um, initially, this was done by Hertz back in the 1880s. And then this got updated in the 60s and 70s when they said, well, what about things that are sticky? And indeed, cells are sticky and like to adhere to each other. And there was a paper that came out about 10 years ago that said, yeah, this theory actually works really well for living cells. You should use it. So there have been a couple other groups that have been using this theory. Um, but uh, this is the one that we decided that we would adopt as well. Um, so once we have all of our forces calculated using the JKR approximation, um, we've got a couple ideas about how we can update our 
positions and velocities. One way is to say, hey, look, we have uh, no net acceleration, but we you have uh, a set of forces that equal each other, and so we wind up saying that our velocities uh, are dependent on the, the viscosity and some forces. Another way is to say, all right, we're going to distribute all of our cells. We're going to run it into uh, equilibrium uh, and use very small time scales and get a quasi steady state of all, all the phenotype and then run all the mechanics again until we have that sort of go back and forth. Uh, for solving our uh, ODEs related to the mechanics, uh, we use uh, Adam's Bashford step up first. So we, need to, we use our previous information to integrate forward in time. So then we also need to talk a little bit about the phenotype evolution. So as I said earlier, we start at the beginning of S phase, and we evolve forward in time. And so this is sort of rule-based in the sense that we say, this is how long S phase is, march along forward in time, and it goes along into wherever in the cell cycle is supposed to be. Uh, then we also have to worry a little bit about cells leading G0 to G1. It's not a fixed time scale, but rather there's some probability that these cells are going to leave G0 to G1. So sometimes, oh, three hours have gone by, oh, I'm going to leave. Sometimes it's 24 hours, oh, I'm going to leave. It not entirely known, some of these cells wind up becoming apoptotic and eventually leaving the cell cycle and then dying, and so then we have to remove them. Uh, sometimes it decides, okay, no, I'm going to enter S phase and uh, repeat this whole cell cycle again. Uh, currently, we do not have the G2M checkpoint, only the G1S checkpoint. Uh, we've been talking with some of the biologists in our lab, and they've said maybe you should have essentially some sort of checkpoint after exiting every phase, and that's when cells can become apoptotic. But then there's a question of how do you know when these apoptotic cells, uh, where they came from in the cell cycle experimentally, that's unknown. So right now, we're just at G1S, but we've been talking about putting more checkpoints in. Uh, another thing, as I said, the code currently does is it updates the volume. And not only does it update the volume, like how big is it, but it also asks what, uh, is it solid, is it fluid volume, is it a total volume, is it a nuclear volume? So we can have essentially four compartments to the velocity. And so another constraint we have about the cell volume is that it must be increasing over time so that when you get to mitosis, you have enough volume to cleave in half and have two cells that are roughly a reasonable size. So as your time goes on, oh, you sort of keep pumping in water and you sort of uh, get to sort of a threshold level volume that you intend to get and then you drop because you've undergone mitosis and then you keep growing again and you've undergone mitosis because otherwise your cells just keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Uh, so an example in 2D of what the snapshot chip generator will do. This is, I suppose, the second most important slide, perhaps, because it's actually showing you what it actually has done. So uh, basically, we're trying to show, yes, we have more concentrated cells here in the center over here, and the concentration goes out. This is sort of this truncated 2D Gaussian, so that's why it only goes so far out. Uh, and you can indeed see that most of these cells are G0, G1 phase, or S phase. And basically, there's a whole bunch of red and green dots on the screen. Um, and you can sort of see in the middle of all these a little darker color that represents the volume, essentially, of the nuclear material inside. And note, in some cases here, you can really see like a little bit of overlap between these two cells. And this really is representing these two cells adhering to each other and going to some equilibrium length. So some applications of the agent-based model is that we obviously can grow tumors in 3D, as you saw in the movie at the beginning of the talk, uh, and that we can also create these 2D model layers that we really want to use to compare to experimental data that our biologists in our center are growing in a lab. And so we could say, look, here's what you have, here's what we have. And using multi-cell DS, we can really do an apples-to-apples -apples comparison because we're comparing on the same numbers in the same format instead of having to do some mucky conversion 
that is lab dependent and that as you have new investigators come in could possibly change. Uh, so that's really why we need uh, these digital cell lines and these snapshot bots to get everything working correctly. Uh, another application is some work that I've been doing with Edwin who's talking after me next. Um, and so Edwin has been asking how do I go from numbers of cells uh, that are in the lab into cell cycle parameters and then I say well Edwin just told me these numbers can I get to these original cell counts and he started off in the beginning so it's sort of a validation pipeline that I could get the same numbers he came up with and another way is he starts with his parameters I cut my cell counts and then he can go from my cell counts and see if he gets the same parameters coming out so it's sort of a sanity check for all of this so uh, conclusions basically of this talk, uh, we have a snapshot generator that we can use to initialize our simulations and we also use our agent based model to do use that snapshot generator. Uh, we do need these digital cell lines in order to create the state information then, uh, for the initialization and again the agent based model is used for consistent uh, creation in both a physical space and a phenotypic space. Uh, some endowment here. This is funded mm. by the Breast Care Research Foundation. Uh, that's really what makes a lot of this possible. And there's also some more funding from USC. Uh, Paul, my advisor here, has been absolutely amazing. And I've also been working with Edwin. Uh, a few other collaborators, David Agus, who's uh, uh, on TV sometimes. You will see him or giving TED Talks. Uh, Carl Kesselman over in ISI, who's been working on a uh, multi-cell <laughs> database base, and Shannon Mumenthaler, uh, who is one of the experimental biologists who we've been working with as well. A uh, little bit about the broader cancer research community. There's some groups here at USC, Louisville, Oxford, uh, Moffitt Cancer Center that's down in Tampa, uh, MD Anderson in Houston, Northwestern, uh, Oregon State Aid up in Portland, and of course the NCI. Uh, thank you very much for your time, and if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. We have time for a couple of questions. More coffee? <laughs> so I, I think that when you, you, the way you're moving cells through the cell cycle, that has it is just dependent on a certain timing that you that you specify. Correct. So I say there is a it's time, say, T0, and I want to get three hours into M phase. And I have an internal state variable that says, this is my current time. And then I advance it with a certain time step, step and go all the way through. And it transitions from one cycle to the next cycle. And that says, all right, boom, I'm done. I reached this correct state in the cell cycle. And the, and in the, the, the growth of volume is just the volume itself. So you don't care about the fact that the cells actually do need to do a bunch of stuff. So we do up with water before this. this so thing, right? right now we're dealing with water, but there's no reason why we couldn't be dealing well, we need with, to deal with with DNA, with proteins, with uh, carbohydrates, lots of other, lots of lipids. That's what you need to do to build a new cell. Yeah, well, we have uh, more or less a coarse brain version of that. Where we're trying to get the time scales right, and so we have yeah, solid yeah. biomass and so the nucleus and the cytoplasm at different time scales, probably. Okay. And right now, uh, something that's looking more or less like uh, an exponential model, you know, going towards a target state. The nice thing is we can keep that physical model on at all times the cell cycle, apoptosis, and necrosis with the same model, and we just change the target volumes depending on which cycle phase you're in. And later on, that target you know number could be coming from something smaller scale like SPML, you know, like a system of, you know, some kind of a system biology model, for example. But uh, for now, we're just trying to get the time scales right and not the physiological processes because we're kind of going from yeah, yeah. one and up. But but I'm just trying to understand. Yeah, but uh, but we do try to model that those physiological processes, and we do have you know water moving in and out of the cell independently of the biomass creation. So there's at least some decoupling of processes. Any other questions? Well, if not, we move to the next and final speaker of this session, which I think is on a similar topic. Um, Edwin Rosales is going to talk about system identification for um, digital cell lines, I guess.
I'm not going to go back to this way. That's not too bad. You can do it too bad. Otherwise, we could not want to put in any sort of iterative solver, which makes everything so much slower. Did you have a USB thing? Yeah. 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 Student working under uh, Dr. Paul Mackin. And uh, like you've seen today, our lab mainly deals with models that are uh, more population based as opposed to single cell uh, detailed models. Uh, we try to model multiple cells and uh, try to go in uh, larger uh, scales in terms of numbers. Um, so, what I would like to talk to you about today is a um, like Sam was saying, uh, a way to extract parameters that are relevant for these uh, single cell models or population based models as well uh, from data that can be easily obtainable uh, from the lab. Uh, so this is uh, data driven and this is biologically uh, also relevant information uh, that it's hidden, I guess, in the, uh, in the data that we collect in the labs, but we can also extract it using uh, just a little bit of, of math. Um, so that's more or less what um, the outline of my, of my talk. And the motivation is like, so uh, like Sam was saying, that uh, part of what, I, what I've been doing, one of the projects that I've been working on is in populating what we call a digital cell. Uh, but before we get into the details of that, why do we need these, uh, digital cell lines? And uh, I guess that by now the, the answer is a little more clear as to uh, whenever we're developing a mathematical model, we try to, we need to add some parameters to that model. And how do we normally get those parameters? Well, this is the answer that most mathematical models will get. Uh, we look for the parameters in the literature. And I guess uh, if you've tried that, you know that that can be uh, really slow and that can uh, not always lead to the parameters that you were looking for. And even if you do, let's say that you were looking for the duration of the G0, G1 cycle for MCF7 cells on their normoxia in high glucose. I don't think you're going to have much look, luck uh, finding that specific parameter in the literature. You may be able to find something relating to MCF7 in the G0, G1 cycle, but you know nothing about the environmental conditions of that particular experiment. So um, no, there's no guarantee that you're taking the correct parameter for your model. Uh, but chances are you're getting a parameter that's decent for your model. Um, so that's the uh, motivation for why we're developing these digital settings. And this is a picture that you've seen, uh, I, I'm guessing that now for the third time if you uh, um, that mm, What we're doing is we're taking information from the literature. Um, I'm, I'm not underpinning the literature. It's, there's a wealth of information in there sometimes. It's just hard to find the specific information that you're looking for. 
or also taking information from experiments, but that, that is not always the exact information that we were looking for. We're doing uh, some mathematical analysis, some interpretation of that data, and compacting that together into a um, consistent way of representing the cell cycle in this case into what we're calling a digital cell line. Um, and the term digital cell line is in, uh, analogous to the biological term cell line, uh, in the way that uh, we can consistently represent a particular type of cells uh, that if we run it here or if we run it in any other location on the, on their equivalent uh, conditions, the cells are going to be similar. Uh, so in this case, if you use this set of parameters, for example, in this uh, computer or in this particular model, uh, and you use the same parameters in another model, then the cells should behave the same. And that's the idea that we can as computational modelers can start to find ways to standardize or not only our, our standard for outputs and how do we represent the data, but also what parameters we use in our model. So we can so that those outputs that we're hopefully comparing are also more meaningful. Um, so this uh, today's talk is going to be a, a brief overview as to like how we can use systems identifications in this process of creating and populating uh, digital cells. Um, so, uh, one one thing that it will be important, uh, I would like to point out, is that these parameters that we're going to use in our uh, computational models are ideally directly measured. So, if you work in a lab that uh, that works closely with biologists, you should always try to measure the parameters that you're going for. Uh, we're, we're talking here about the cell cycle. So, like, if you're interested in in the the duration, the total length of the cell cycle, the mean length of the cell cycle, you should try to first measure that directly. Uh, that's going to give you the more relevant information. But more often than not, you cannot measure every parameter that you're interested in. So we try to derive that from the data. There are various techniques that we can use. Uh, we're going to focus in, in one of the techniques that, that we've been working on. Um, yes? Just so I understand, what do you mean by measuring directly? Uh, so, for example, you can uh, add a. So, if, if you want the length of the uh, of the cell cycle, for example, or the mitosis part of the cell cycle, um, and you somehow have the technology to um, image a single cell and add a stain for DNA, for example, you can track the DNA changes in that single cell. Then you can uh, possibly directly measure how long will the uh, mitosis take in that particular cell right before it divides, right? So you can measure from a experiment how from the moment that the cell started mitosis to the moment that the cell end. end. And I can see that, that you're a little skeptical because that's really hard to do. So well, that, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, so that's so that's the whole point. Over there what you're measuring is an image, right? So you have to translate the image right. into something that you can measure a period on. So that's not really direct either. I get, yeah, okay, that's that's a good point. Uh, but it is, but the experiment will lead to that measurement. So, yeah, that's that's what I meant. Um, so anyway, so then we com we start this in, in a digital cell, which is a standard way of representing, in this case, cell phenotype parameters uh, with the microenvironment context, uh, which is really important. As we all uh, know that microenvironment does affect uh, the way that a cell will behave. Um, and I, like I said a couple minutes ago, this is so that we can use this consistently across multiple independent models, not only within our lab, but also among different labs, and we can also compare those results. Um, the goal for this particular project has been to use cell flow cytometry data, um, cell counts, a viability of those cells, density uh, information on those cells, which we can obtain from the cell counts in the uh, area where the cells are, um, to derive cell cycle parameters. So um, we have uh, information about populations, but we want information about uh, time scales of, this, of the cell cycle of each of the cells. And our approach has been to combine mathematical models of the cell cycle and systems identification, uh, which I'm going to go into a little more detail in a couple of slides, to find the optimal uh, parameters, uh, optimal cell phenotype parameters. Um, and one thing that I would like to point out from this, uh, from from this moment, and you'll see it a little later, 
is that this framework, uh, this approach, facilitates the improvement of our models as well as uh, experimental design. So this is um, this is not just a cool tool to like try to find parameters mm -hmm. from data. This is also a tool that mathematical modelers can use and we are using to um, improve our models and to uh, describe our data in a better way. And we can also communicate this with biologists so that they, they can also design experiments in a way that's helpful for uh, them and also for us. Um, so before we go into what systems identification is, uh, is I want to uh, um, explain a little more of the data that, I, that I've been working on with the, in this particular project. So this is, uh, like I said, the result of cell flow cytometry combined with cell phones. So at the end, what, what we uh, have is um, the same cell line, which is MCF7, which is a cancer cell line, uh, um, the, um, the very prevalent in, in cancer research. And <coughs> what we're do getting is information at uh, four different times, at time, at day zero, day one, day two, and day three. Um, and we have population counts. So we have the um, how many cells were undergoing apoptosis, how many cells were uh, in the G0, G1 uh, cell cycle, how many cells were doing uh, were in the S uh, phase, and how many cells were going uh, mitosis or were on the G2 cell cycle. Um, this information we can get it from cell cycle flow cytometry, and we have that information for two different uh, environmental conditions. Cells under normoxia, which means uh, that they had enough oxygen to uh, to carry out all their um, <coughs> sorry they just had enough oxygen in the microenvironment and also we have uh, the information from cells in hypoxia which means that they were oxygen oxygen deprived uh, so that's the data that we've been working on and from these we're going to try to extract um, time scales for for the cell cycle. And the way that we're going to do that is we first develop a model, which is a, a model, mathematical model. In this case, an ODE model for uh, the cell cycle. And um, Sam already uh, talked to you about a little bit of, of how this model is set up. Um, <coughs> some people describe this model as a compartmental model. So if you read something about that, uh, you, uh, this is basically that, a compartmental model um, where cells um, go from one state to another state. And uh, after spending a certain amount of time, let's say tau G1 in the G0, G1 uh, uh, state, then they move to the next state. After a certain amount of time, they move to another. Uh, and then the only difference is that whenever they finish mitosis, then two cells will, uh, be, will show up in the G0, G1 uh, phase. Uh, cells, they are also dying with a particular rate that we're calling uh, G G1A. And uh, as Sam was saying in the previous talk, uh, right now we're only modeling this part of the uh, this checkpoint uh, uh, in the cell cycle. But we can also easily modify this, uh, this ODE so that we can now model death in, throughout the, the whole cell cycle at a particular point that we're interested in. So that's one of the uh, benefits of using ODE is that they are they can relatively easily change so that we can describe different phenomena. Um, and similarly, so once cells start doing do going apoptosis after a, a certain amount of time, they, they become necrotic uh, to the point that we cannot even measure how many cells there are. So um, they we consider those cells completely dead. Um, like I said, this is going to be modeled as a set of differential equations. The tau's uh, represent mean durations of these uh, time scales. And right now, I have been working only with the means. I haven't been uh, in, uh, putting in the information on the distributions. That's going to come in into the uh, next stage. Um, and again, uh, remember that these parameters may be microenvironment dependent. Uh, so for example, they can be dependent on the density of the cells. They can also be dependent on, on the level of oxygen or the level of other substrates. Uh, which make these systems nonlinear, so it's, it makes the mathematical analysis a little more uh, complicated to do. It's, it's not as straightforward as inverting a matrix, for example. Um, so um, I think this is the second time today that you see these equations. Uh, so I'm not going to go into too much detail to them. I just want to point out what I just said, that um, right now we're explicitly modeling 
the density dependence on the um, duration of the G1 cycle. And this is also biologically inspired. We, uh, people in our lab have observed that when uh, cells are started to get uh, more crowded, more, uh, more uh, packed, more dense, uh, yes, they start going closer to um, to a density, uh, they start ar arresting. So they start slowing down the cell cycle, so they take a little longer in each of these uh, um, phases. So that's why we're explicitly modeling that in, in, in the G1 um, phase. So we can also uh, do all sorts of uh, mathematical analysis on, on, on these ODEs. Uh, uh, we can study just the total number of population of cells, and, and these kinds of things uh, are useful if we're trying to compare with the data that we have. Um, so now, what does system identification mean? And, uh, and this is an application of, uh, that was born in electrical engineering in control systems area using uh, optimization. Uh, to try to identify the underlying parameters or of a particular uh, model, um, you can you, you can um, take two approaches on this. One will be a statistical approach, and another will be the optimization approach. Um, typically, uh, for uh, cell cycle parameters under particular conditions, you don't have enough data to use statistical approaches, so we're uh, using optimization to try to derive that. And the way that we do that is that. Uh, we, we just saw the, the model, right? And the, the model requires some parameters, which in this case were some time scales. So we have an initial guess from these uh, time scales, which we can find in the literature. Or we can also talk to biologists, and, and they can give you some idea of like, what they've seen in the lab. So we take that as an initial guess. Normally, these will be the parameters that we use in our, in our simulations. But now they just become our initial guess. Um, we run that through the mathematical model. Uh, the model predicts some simulated data. Uh, we compare that data with the experiments, uh, that, with data that we have measured in experiments, um, through uh, an error function. Uh, note that the, these error function can, um, it, there's a lot of flexibility on this. We can choose what this error function is. We can, uh, for example, choose to mm, compare cells in the log scale, or we can choose to compare the total amount of cells. So we can do a lot of things in here. There's a lot of, uh, um, of decision the power that we have in this error function. Um, and then once we have uh, uh, an idea of like, the error on that measurement, then we can use an algorithm mm -hmm. to change those parameters. Um, if you're familiar with optimization, then uh, I don't need to go in further on that. But if you're not, there are like, a few uh, sets of uh, very well understood algorithms that we can use. The simplest of them will be uh, the gradient descent algorithms. Um, then there are also other kinds of uh, algorithms, like generic algorithms that you can use to try to uh, compare how two different parameter sets will um, deal and how will they reduce the error function overall. So this is a, a, another area where there's a lot of flexibility, and we can also change um, uh, the algorithms that we're using in order to get better parameter estimates. And then we just proceed doing these, uh, these um, you take this approach in, in, a, in a cyclical manner, and we just uh, keep iterating until we find uh, the parameters that uh, are the optimal parameters because the error function is not producing anymore, or we have reached a threshold where we say, all right, the error is small enough, and we're happy with that. Uh, so this is how the uh, this is a few snapshots of the algorithm running. Um, I gave it some initial conditions, and um, uh, you could see from the beginning that like it was a little off, and then the algorithm tries to uh, adjust for it. Let me run it again uh, just because it went a little quickly. So notice that at the beginning there's going to be a little uh, of error in the data. We're not quite matching the data, even though uh, we should have been matching it because those were the parameters that we were supposed to use. And then we just uh, uh, try to minimize that error function until uh, we <coughs> reach a point where we can no longer change the parameters in a way that will reduce the error. Uh, so it's a very straightforward approach, uh, again, with a lot of flexibility in the design, which, in my opinion, is it's a really good thing for us modelers. Um, so I want to show you the results of uh, using uh, these methods. Uh, 
I right now I'm using uh, grade, uh, steepest gradient descent uh, for the uh, optimization. The reason I'm doing that is because it's really good at finding you a local optimal. Um, it doesn't guarantee a global <coughs> optimal, so it doesn't guarantee that these are the parameters that are going to give you the overall uh, smallest uh, um, mm, error. But it's going to guarantee that in that um, um, neighborhood of the parameter space, that's the minimum error that you can find. Um, we can combine this with genetic algorithms, for example, and then we can find a bigger, uh, smaller uh, error. But at the same time, we started with a, a guess that we were uh, confident on, right? Because we got this from the literature, from or for a good, um, an educated guess. So as of right now, I, I am only finding a local optimum, uh, but we can also try to find a, a global. So you can see right here, um, uh, just um, so that to not overwhelm you with so many uh, so too much data, one of the things that we can look at is the uh, length of the cell cycle. Um, and this is this is not something that we uh, that we measure from the experiment. This is something that the algorithm uh, estimated to be around 30 hours. And this is exactly uh, well, not exactly, but this is very much. Uh, uh, the length scale of the cell cycle that we observe for MCS7. So it's really good that uh, the algorithm is uh, deriving things that we didn't explicitly put in, and they are also having measured in, in different ways. Um, and we're going to take a, a closer look at these uh, uh, time scales, particularly when we com compare them with uh, the same time scales but in hypoxia. Um, one thing that I want to point out is that sometimes like the uh, measurement errors are inherent. So sometimes, uh, even though we're hitting the right populations, that doesn't necessarily mean that that uh, is what what was happening. But that's something that it's it's going to be there as as we improve our measurements. These results will also improve. Um, so now I want uh, I want to show the results of these two optimization runs side by side. Uh, and this is where we can start seeing uh, really cool things. And I have um, mm, approximated all the parameters to now be just one significant digit, uh, so that they are a little easier to read. Uh, and and this is also the way that you will typically find it in the literature, uh, closer to like in times of hours. Uh, so you can see that um, the errors were uh, in uh, in a relatively small error, which is the this is the mean. Uh, percentage error on the uh, on the measurements. So that means that um, on average we miss five percent of the of the data that we were trying to match, and in, in hypoxia we missed almost nine percent. Um, right now I'm calling that a good enough error, um, especially because when we compare the results of uh, cells undergo in, in normoxia and hypoxia, we see something that's very well understood: um, that cells on on hypoxia slow down their time scales. Then they slow down, their, their cell cycle duration increases. But we also see that uh, each um, part of the cell cycle slows down. And especially the uh, G0, G1 slows down uh, a lot, even though this is the, well, the parameter that we had explicitly modeled as uh, density dependent, uh, and cells in hypoxia have uh, smaller cell counts. So even with that uh, information from cell populations, the model is still saying the, this part of the cell cycle is slowing down because there's uh, less oxygen in the environment, and the model has no information about oxygen. Uh, so this is something that's really uh, great, in my opinion, that uh, without explicitly adding information about parts of the microenvironment on the model, we can uh, make uh, really insightful conclusions about how cells are behaving. In this case, were things that we knew about the cells. Uh, so it's a really good way of, uh, for us to start um, feeling more confident about these models and then also start trying to um, uh, generate new ideas as to like how are we going to model the cells and how are, what other experiments are we going to do uh, to uh, improve the cells. So one of the things that we can do, for example, is we can say, OK, but we're not happy with this because um, as, I, as we can see over here, um, we're not hitting the cells exactly towards the end. Uh, so 
this framework allows us to start asking these kinds of questions. And, and then as modelers, we can think, maybe there's something that we're missing in this model. Maybe something is happening around day three. Uh, it could be something external, or it could be something inherent in the cell cycle. Uh, maybe we're not modeling the uh, density dependency correctly, and then we need to revise those equations. And, uh, so this also allows for feedback, not only within the optimization, but also feedback with us as modelers, and support also try to improve those models. And then we can communicate that with experimentalists so that they can also improve their measurements and their the experimental setup. Um, so there's feedbacks all the way around, which allows for a really good uh, working framework. Um, so, uh, so summary, I guess like it's a, it's a very uh, um, simple idea in my opinion. We, can, we have developed a, uh, a method to go from cell population counts to cell cycle time scales, which we can then now uh, record in a digital cell time uh, in a consistent way so that other people can use these time scales in their models. Um, Sam has shown you a really great way of using these time scales in, in 3D simulations or 2D simulations in an agent-based model. As you can see, that wasn't the same model that we used to derive these equations, but it uses the same parameters or equivalent parameters that we can uh, just plug in and run the simulations. Uh, so then some of the next steps that we're taking, that some of these are already being taken and some others are like, uh, in, we're going to be doing in the future is uh, we can revise model assumptions. Like I said, like maybe the uh, density dependency wasn't uh, the best way to describe it. Or maybe we can add more de um, dependency on the substrate of the cells. Maybe uh, maybe there are other assumptions that, that we haven't included, or maybe some of the, our assumptions were not correct. So it's always good to keep revising our models to keep improving on that. We can also apply these techniques to uh, spatial models and obtain, obtain cell mechanics. Uh, so this is something that's really cool because I I've shown you some a simple model and some simple uh, some parameters that we can extract from that, uh, but we can also use a little more compl complicated models and ex extract different kinds of parameters from that. Um, we can also run this model in different environmental conditions, for example, different levels of oxygen. We can get a better idea of how oxygen affects the cell cycle. Uh, or we can use different drug concentrations, and, and then we can start getting into that uh, kind of analysis too. And more importantly, in my opinion, we can uh, once we do we apply this model to different uh, environmental conditions and different cell lines, then we can uh, create a digital cell line library where we can we can now access. And if you're looking for a particular cell line in a particular environmental condition, you can just get this data um, that. Hopefully, uh, that in, in the future is also going to be curated data, so people are going to evaluate this, and then you can just use this in your model. Uh, so that's more or less the uh, roadmap of where we're going. And again, uh, you saw basically the same slide with, with Sam. I would like to uh, say thank you for uh, the uh, foundations that have, that have funded uh, my research so far, uh, for my colleagues, for all their work. Uh, Dr. McLean for all his uh, uh, advice, and my other advisor also, Dr. John Here, who's not <coughs> here. Um, Sam for all the uh, conversations that we have, all the collaborators in our lab, uh, in the broader uh, cancer research community. It's been uh, really great to come as an engineer into this field and, and feel welcome and feel like we can um, advance this field as well. So um, thank you. One question. Ben. So, so your model is based on differential equations, right? Now. Right. The one point you said you were right now considering only average times in the different stages, and you were considering to move to distributions. Mm -hmm. How would you do that with an LDE model? Okay. Um, so there are um, a couple ways that we can do. One thing that I have uh, already tried in a different model is to, um, for example, from what I meant is that the the, the data that we that we measure it has an underlying distribution, right? Uh, so we typically take different measurements in that data, different uh, uh, time points, so we can get those uh, error bars, which are typically standard deviations. So one thing that we can do is to consider each of those time points or each of those data points separately, 
optimize to those and, and then try to evaluate how the parameters will change with these changes in the data. Uh, so that's that's what I meant. I, I guess you could have understood as well that uh, I was going to be able to get you a distribution of the parameters. That's um, that's a little more uh, complicated to do, um, but we can get some idea of that from what I just described. Okay. No word, no word in question appearing. I think uh, we should uh, thank all the speakers for this from this session and be in our break. Slides when you get a chance. Yeah. Did you get the link? Okay. Can you can you omit the problematic slides? <laughs> Surely not the entire. Yes. Yeah, yes. Sure. Uh, we have different viewpoints within our project. Uh, I'm going to end, but the people who did quite the text are going to the bench, and so oh. we need to. Uh, <laughs> So, okay. okay. I'm really sorry. Well, well maybe you know, intro slides and yeah, I'll, conclusion I'll, I'll, slides. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's just, uh, I'd like to battle. You know, it's like coming from physics and math, going into medical school, and it's all I can have. Welcome to Difference in Fields. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's a battle I've I know. Uh, I know people yeah. encounter this. Yeah. Um, yeah.
thing that we're trying to do to make sure uh, that we're uh, But I figured out how to make it. And it's usually so called JavaScript. Uh, so, uh, there's a transition between the two also. No, no, no. It's, it's actually uh, getting a package called Crescent And so, there's a flag that you can change the output that it produces to uh, uh, something called tab. And tab is uh, so Again, we've written 20,000 We are just like doing so much I mean, I, I, we just I have, have to like figure out how to do it. I talked to my sister last time because she's going to she went through this. She's like, 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 she I haven't zoomed it around the Annenberg moment a lot. No, 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 I didn't I just restarted it. Is it? Uh, <laughs> All those that are trying to impress the teacher. Well, please don't do you sit your front rows? <laughs> I think that's the only way to do it. I think that's the only way to do it. I think that's the only way to do it. I think that's the only way to do it. I think that's the only way to do it. I think that's the only way to do it. I think that's the only way to do it. I think that's the only way to do it. All Put information here, we get results. Most of the information we have What do you do with it? So you can give it your simulation. Your simulation can be on so, uh, yeah, if you want to like it, just a line. Yeah, that's So, right now we don't have any of walkers. You don't know how to sell the other So, it like a so, the source has 
I think I Sorry, I might be there today because Herbert stole my seat, which is much better. Yeah, I don't know if there's an around here. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Otherwise, you get too close to the teacher. I've this is the right time to go by the meeting book. Oh, yes, it is. So I can kind of like. Is it good? Oh, that's okay, good. Okay, so I can go like. <laughs> Good. Yes, and I like how you moved and you left your computer back there. So you're really going to be engaged. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, more, I'm more interested in meeting Bob. So in every video, it will be you going video. like. <laughs> he like on this last day and he's like, oh. <laughs> and so the speaker always looks like. Yeah, it was great. So there's 15 more seats up. There. Okay, you're actually <laughs> blocking <laughs> the screen. <laughs> we'll be loud. Okay, that. Okay, Lucia can stay back there. But everybody else come to the board. I expect the people in the back to speak the most. <laughs> Lucian will. Yeah, that's guaranteed. Right, so come on, uh, those of you in the back, don't you feel like you're guilty yet when you're failing your hard So the, the last two sessions we have at Combine are meant to be very open uh, discussions. So I'll um, lead a discussion about how system synthetic biology standards can work together, and then after um, you digest that and have your lunch, then Martin, who was here a minute ago, oh, there you are, okay. Martin will lead a discussion about combined in general. And so um, without further ado, let's get started. So I'm very pleased to see how well I think the systems and the biology people have come together here. I think that that uh, was something I was really hoping to see happen, and so I hope that this is just the start of a beautiful relationship. 
And so I wanted to talk a bit about how perhaps that we can really take advantage of this and work together under an umbrella of a research coordination network. So in June, um, I submitted with uh, some colleagues a proposal to the NSF to help establish a research coordination network, which is NSF's term for meetings like this, getting together and discussing things of common interest. And the goal of funding like this is to create new communities that haven't been previously worked together. And so people like Trevor and myself have been involved in both systems and set biology standards, and there's a lot of synergies that we've seen, and so we think it's very beneficial to have us all in the same room. So the goal of this uh, network is to help facilitate this continued collaboration to bring the synthetic biology community into the combined fold. And the 10 people listed here have agreed to serve on the steering committee if and when this gets funded. I saw, I mean, I've had a lot of encouragement from a program director at NSF about this, and although technically she doesn't have any money at the moment, uh, she says that she's very supportive of this and perhaps in October, so we'll see hopefully in time for Harmony. And so this can help um, support uh, meetings and some uh, travel expenses for meetings, at least from the, the U.S. side of things. So in this proposal, I outlined some areas where I thought uh, that the synthetic biology community could benefit from interacting with the systems biology community on standard development. And so these are um, some of the items, although technically the last one has been added since the proposal. And I wanted to discuss some of those with you and have interactions to see how best it is to interact in each of these areas. So the first three, I mean, sort of are, um, the first one is about specification infrastructure that's already happened. I think ESPOL is now listed as one of the combined um, uh, standards and it's got the specification listed as with a unique identifier. And um, so that's already happening. Metadata and annotation standards is also an area where I think we can benefit from interactions. And also, we all need to share lots of different files combining uh, together the different standards for the different representations of what we do. I think the combined archive is going to be very useful for that. Uh, what I wanted to focus the discussion on today were these items, although mostly um, the ones, uh, the visual one we've had already sessions about, uh, but the others uh, we haven't really talked about yet. So first of all, as I said, that we've actually had independent breakouts, at least two independent breakouts and some discussions in the first, uh, well, on Tuesday about how we can work together. And I think that that actually has evolved quite well during this meeting in discussing uh, the relationships. I mean, there are uh, commonalities between these forms, especially when we start modeling things like interactions and as well uh, visual. And so I think those conversations have started, and I look forward to seeing how they progress. Some conversations I'd like to have now are about how can we interact with more of the standards. So in particular, how can we connect, say, models to our ESPOL representations. We've talked about that a little bit. For example, uh, Nick presented uh, some of the work that he's done in that area. And so, um, in particular, what Nick has done, one thing he uh, did not talk about was some previous work he had done, where he's actually developed an annotation mechanism that allows you to take an SBML model and annotate it with URIs from ESPOL so that you can indicate where the components that you're using, that you're modeling in that, um, their physical information, how they're built, is stored in within SQL. But to go the opposite direction, what we're doing is adding in the next version of SQL, there's been a proposal to add a new class to the model called model, which allows us to connect the other direction from, from SQL, SQL to um, models in SVML. In particular, the model class is going to allow us to point to an external file that describes the behavior of the system. That's the source field. Um, a language, so it can be SPML, CellML, MATLAB, you pick your favorite language, and a framework indicating what type of model you have, whether it's ODE, stochastic, Boolean, etc. And then finally, a role, naming what is the purpose of this um, model. Is it for um, describing something you're going to design? Is it describing some, something that you have designed? Um, is it describing um, just a part of the design, for example, um, just an interaction from the design? It gives you a way of indicating what the model is, is to be used for. So what I wanted to discuss here is, are we happy with the methods that are being proposed for connecting SQL and SPML models? And another thing that we've often discussed in our SQL meetings that I think might be fruitful to discuss here is, where is the line? 
because we're starting to put things like interactions into our SQL files, which are kind of, in a way, describing some qualitative behavior. And there's often uh, been discussions as well about adding some parameters about the, um, those interactions, like their binding coefficients or the open complex rate or something like that. And there's always this debate in our community is, are we starting to encroach too far into the model space? Or at what point do we say um, that SQL ends and SQML or other modeling languages start? And then finally, we've seen in this, this meeting that we've shown how we can translate from SQL functional information into SQML models. Um, it's also possible to perhaps translate from SQML models annotated with SQL information back to SQL. Um, SQL and which direction should these translations be going. So now it's your turn to tell me what you think about the connections between SQL and SPML and other modeling languages, if there's any comments you might have. Yeah. Yeah, so we have discussed it on Wednesday in the lib SPDN breakout, and yesterday a bit in the SQL visual and SPDN breakout. So connection between, well, SPDN and SQL visual one idea would be to use a mapping file, which was proposed already last year, and then to use the combined archive to or put all things together. And one of the advantages would be that you don't have to change your SPL or SPGN file, or in this case, even the SPML file, and that you can have many connections, let's say SPML, SPL, SPL visual, SPGN, and put everything together without adding any additional content to the so so rather than adding annotations to a model to say how you connect, having yeah. a separate file in itself that yeah. says how different the different standards connect. Yeah, that was one of the ideas. I think that's an interesting idea. Any other thoughts on this? Yeah. I think it's a good idea, but they distributed uh, and one where we can have specific repositories. Uh, let's say we have a repository for SPO and SPML on the repository. You can link things up easily as well, so you don't have to use one archive all the time. It's definitely very useful when it comes to these multiple files and specific application, but we should be open enough to support linking between different. Uh, so, one sort of unifying standard representation that says how do you connect the bits together, perhaps? Is that what you're No, he's saying you should still allow uh, individual standards and mechanisms for connecting to other standards. In addition to sort of the meta uh, standard that's provided by something like combined archives, because you might have a repository that uh, <laughs> may not yet support the, the, the whole archive file, and you, you're only storing a part of it, so you wouldn't necessarily get those metadata files that tell you that would come with the combined archive and tell you the map. You should be able to do both for flexibility. A common use case for us would be that the that some of the links are actually stored in a, an RDF triple store rather than in a file. So you hit a triple store or a web service that's backed by a triple store, and it we can give you back a load of RDF predicates that, that, that externally assert links. But I think we still would like to assert links within specific files where that file knows that it definitely points to something else. I mean, that's one thing I've heard brought up time and again is the fact that. Um, the, those standards that have gone the XML route are not as variable and searchable as those that are the RDF route. So having some this information about connections in an RDF form might make things more variable. Yeah. I mean, two things. One is implementation related, and I guess this, this is a lot of implementation related. You know, if, if this is the case, I mean, if, if that if you want to go down the scale, I think like the solution is. Something similar to, for example, how the, the modern package management and package linking systems work, but you have to, have to do is kind of define a, like a parent ID, and that parent ID alone will allow discover a software tool to figure out you know, other related <coughs> files or packages or things related to it. So in your case, you will have like a parent ID of the model that you're developing. And if you want to develop a you know, SPML model that is related to it, it's mapping to it, you just kind of give associated with the same parent ID. So you kind of instead of going a packaging from a you know, physical zip file, you go to a you know more like an identity-based storing thing. But even before the implementation, like I I my, I, I find it difficult to wrap my mind around all of the use use cases that you guys are kind of going to have. So you know what I would so I, I would like to have at least one document where where the, where the use cases are outlined, 
And, and I think that is very important for us to move forward. You know, what are the because I keep I keep hearing that okay, so this is the one that goes to the you know the company that is going to you know build the you know, but still you know this is for for design purposes. This is for but it will be really nice to have a concrete use case somewhere so that you know we can actually discuss these things a little bit more. I mean, I think there's a wide variety of use cases out there. I mean, our use case is more on the modeling side if we want to be able to couple the model with the structural information, much like you do in circuit design where you've got a library of parts that come both with how do you build them and how do you simulate them. But there are other people that are very interested in um, different types of details, whether it's visualizing the information. So you want to encode the information so you can draw nice pictures so people can see what the relationships are, um, to describing how you actually go build the system and the detailed assembly plans of the system. So that's one of the challenges, I think, as well as space is because there is so many different um, use cases that we're trying to support. And so we're trying to have to sort of pick them one at a time to figure out how we're going to do that. Um, and also trying not to invent new things along the way. Because the, in, in a modeling case, we, because we do have a background in SVML, we're very much trying to keep the ability just to stick to standards for modeling. And um, as I get to maybe uh, other uh, connections to things like biopacks or SVGN, well, we already talked about that, but biopacks we'll talk about. Um, we don't want to just sort of say, okay, we're going to do our, totally our own thing. But on the same token, sometimes we feel like uh, we want to have a certain amount of information in the S pool so that you don't have to always go out and look for things. There was, I originally was quite against adding interactions um, to the uh, S pool data structure because I said, why don't you just look at the SVML model? The information should be there. So it's not as easy to glean out the information from there. Uh, if all you want to do is draw a picture with a regression arc on it, it's nice to have that representation locally. So again, I guess where do we draw these lines between the different uh, between these different standards? And he, what he was saying is we should think about as enumerating in some sort of document what are the different ways that we can connect between standards and what are the use cases for doing so. Mm -hmm. so at least that's what I understood. I think that would be really good. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I think one thing that people face is, in principle, it would be nice to have very clean separation between this, the different file formats and having some mechanisms to say, well, this piece is described here, and that would that's all well and good, except most people are not going to implement support for all of the different file formats in a given tool, and so that means it's it's a hurdle to to to, to just cleanly separate without some. Maybe some so the converse is you put some some overlap <coughs> to satisfy most use cases and um, for the really um, sort of the, the heavier work that you might do with SVML like a, an actual simulation and you say well okay the information the details you need for that really are in the SVML so you don't need to replicate that in its whole so And, and that, was, that was actually the argument that got me to come around with interactions because I originally really was hesitant about that. And then I was talking to someone from BBN uh, who is, they're developing, well, they're now part of Raytheon, but they're developing a tool for this. And they really didn't want to deal with the SVML at all. But they do need interactions. And so they wanted to represent the interactions. But, and they do want to simulate their things, but they didn't want to deal with the SVML side. So by putting the, SV, the interactions into their data and then shipping it to us and say to Nick's generator, we could generate SVML models for that. I started seeing, oh, that's a really useful thing to be able to do. Yeah. I think if we could agree upon a kind of a meta standard as a framework for all the, the connections that might be possible uh, between the different <coughs> standards, uh, there's a big advantage of this. So it's then really a modular approach, and then you um, not each standard has to, so the community don't have to discuss all the topics again and again in the different uh, standard communities. Uh, it can be done in a, even like combined you know, in, a, in a framework of combined, and and, and then then it, uh, it's it's I think more, much more efficient to do this and much more coherent than when you will see the different standards. So uh, I, I really think it's such a framework with makes sense. And actually, in the in the metadata session yesterday, we had a Discussion in that direction that uh, also for the annotation 
would make sense to have a general framework. I, I think I just mentioned it uh, in the summary uh, yesterday evening uh, when I summarized the, the results of the metadata session. And um, I think that there will be there, there would be really uh, quite some advantages of this modular approach. One comment on that, and I'll, um, is that one thing is maybe it doesn't need to be a separate file, but maybe through ontological means. So one, the way we connect SQL Visual to the SQL data model is through the SO ontology. And it may be possible if we agree upon which ontologies to use in our different representations that can make the connections without the need of a separate file, maybe. I think it's not only about the semantics, but also about the direct connections. So how, how to connect different, um, or how to interface between the different standards when, when it comes to integrating SO uh, uh, Format into SPML and vice versa. Matthew, I think you had your. Yeah, so that sounds reasonable to me. What what it would boil down to, from my point of view, would be a collection of RDF predicates we all agree upon, so that anybody within the community can say, this is a model of that, and we all agree on is a model of. Right. So there's going to be a, a a not huge number of verbs for associating one thing we built with another thing we built. And it's those verbs we all need to agree on the name of. Right. So uh, there, 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 there are two phases of this, right? One is you know, the actual agreement and you know, the conversions and mappings and etc. All the, all the technical stuff. And then the other thing is, I'm pretty sure that you did ask, ask about you know, stuff like, how do I, like, what's the relationship between SPM and BioBytes? How do I convert this to SP, SP, SPGN? Like, what are the, like, what, what are the use cases? And how, if I want to do this, like, how, how do I go about it? What are the data sources that are in So there's also a large documentation aspect. Of it. You know, you want to kind of communicate. Because this is a, this is a fascinating, complex space. And, and you know, people who are coming from outside, it is, it is also very, very difficult for them to penetrate, right? So it's very difficult for them to, you know, wrap their minds around what is, it was, what, why would, you, why would they have S hole when, you know, when, when they had something like SPML, right? So, for us, the, 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 the causes are obvious, but for a person that is coming from outside, they will kind of confuse this. So, so maybe, maybe what, what I'm, I'm suggesting is like what I have a concrete suggestion. So let's let's write a documentation and maybe a methods paper associated with it all together. And, and you know, put, put our names on it, and it's not kind of agree on a you know common pipeline that we think is the best way to go around. Maybe a set of tools. You know, we can be open about it. it doesn't have to be a restricted set of tools. And you know, kind of put it put it onto the combined website, and then every time someone says something, hey, you know, look at page page 72, and right? it's there. So I think you answered like a question <coughs> next to the last slide. Okay. So. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's actually an interesting thing that I, I should have thought about. It's putting these slides together. We're hitting on. Other questions I'm going to come back to later, but I'll, I'll show a couple more after Martin's uh, comment. I fully agree with and again, I, I think um, when we look outside of this room, or well, let's say outside of the core combined community, uh, people are very often confused so which standard to use for which use case and which, uh, uh, what is the advantage using this one or that one, and why are there two or three or more. Um, I mean, we see it every day we, when we deal with data management for projects like the Virtual Liver Project in Germany. I mean, uh, people ask us all the time, so which standard should I use for that or that uh, problem? And they're really confused. And I think uh, um, having such kind of a common um, use case, <coughs> or a common uh, uh, proof of principle, that might help a lot. So, um, just so I don't get stuck on that slide entirely, I'm going to step along. The, another thing I wanted to talk about, and we've maybe touched on a little bit already, is connection to uh, from SPL to BioPacks, and it kind of overlaps what we, a lot of what we were just saying. But when I was coming up with this uh, proposal to NSF, I tried to find one figure for each standard that I could put up there, and I found this one from the BioPacks paper, and I started looking at that and going, Oh wow, that looks a lot like the terms we're using in SQL. Look at that physical entity, protein, DNA, RNA. I mean, these are the things that we are calling components in our SQL files. And then we have the interaction class, which was what we called it in the SQL file. And they have the different genetic interactions, degradations, uh, um, complex formation, complex assembly. And so there's a lot of overlap here in the terms. And so I started to see there's a lot of parallels here of what we've been doing. 
And to uh, be honest, I didn't know a lot about biopacks before. So, <laughs> so yeah, we, <laughs> that was usually the sessions when I went and like packed on SPML, <laughs> I must admit. But now I'm like, uh oh, now I need to learn all about this. So, so the questions I had here was, uh, is it possible, for example, to create translators that would be developed to extract interactions from biopacks and put them into our SPOL interactions? Or vice versa, if we have data in our SPOL files, can we then um, convert that back to biopacks? Or as somebody might argue, is maybe SPOL should just refer to a biopacks file, much like we're referring to an SPML model. Or once again, where does the line go? Should we you know, have some information about interactions locally and then say, for more inf information, please see biopacks file this? So any thoughts or comments on this? I thought you might. <laughs> yes, yes, optional. <laughs> <laughs> Is that the end of the story, or do you want to say anything more? <laughs> but actually, like, what is not in this image, and actually something that we uh, that, that we introduced after the after the publication, is also we have these RNA regions and the DNA regions that can be kind of uh, so we can actually capture everything that is in the you know S ball one two. So including there, exactly where things are on the Yes, and, and you know, like we can do nested stuff, overlapping <coughs> stuff, we can do you know interactions with these things. So you know I'm not saying that you know we are, we are a super set of you guys because there's also a lot of things that are related to design and, and stuff that we are putting in. But I mean the mapping is should be very close to one to one, so there's no reason why we can go back and forth. And this is comments that I think Herbert and I got on our funding application right, that we people I don't know if you were on the reviewers, but was, somebody was, said. Was, I mean, actually, this is why we're doing this. Okay. I mean, one option is to invite you guys to the next test for me. Just you guys. So we have our own. <laughs> I mean, there's no, seriously, well, we our own test for me, right? Exclusively. And I'd like to invite you, whoever else, on Biotypes. That's what we can do. You definitely will be interested in this. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in SPO interactions, those interactions are not always the chemical processes. Sometimes they are abstract. So one, we can say, for example, one coding sequence upgrades another coding sequence. There is no such thing. They are just abstract things, mm -hmm. but we can then attach more information to biopacks. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's the same thing as models. I mean, you can think of an interaction from a modeling standpoint if you want to simulate that interaction. And so you need an SPML file to do that. And you may want to know more details about why we know that interaction is true. And perhaps that's where you go to the biopacks file, where it's got more of the annotation of where this, this information comes from. And so it seems to me, or, or ultimately, you may be wanting to query the pathway comments to get information about interactions you need about your design. So it seems to me like there is there's still an argument for having it locally but also being able to connect to more information and not reinventing that. So I mean, if, if people start saying in little ESPL meetings that we should start adding all these fields that essentially would replicate biopacks, we should push back on that. Yeah. And regarding parameters, we should definitely use external model files rather than having parameter values in ESPL. <laughs> because then it becomes a model. It can just make the parameter values and then SML. Well, I would disagree with. I don't think parameters and relationships is enough to have a model in, because there are a variety of different um, rate laws you can associate with the same set of parameters, and there's a variety of different levels of detail that you can do. So I disagree with that. But that might be a little too detailed or an argument. Also, like there's there's another thing that is not related to, that is you know, uh, expanding on what you just said. Uh, you know, there is a there's a group of Representations that have languages that, that is historically have been kind of excluded from this community, uh, partially because we kept saying, you know, you guys are ambiguous, you suck. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> with a French accent. Who could that be? <laughs> well, I, mean, I, 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 I said that too. Like, I was sort of like, uh, 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 French accent. No. <laughs> but I tried. Uh, but uh, and and I think you know like the what we, what I've seen in this combine is that we are moving towards you know a little bit more inclusive in that area as well. So you know like abstract 
you know, A activates B kind of interactions. That's something that we discussed, you know, as a part of SPGN, A of extending and Lego is also is going to be you know, moving in that direction. There are already a lot of data out there, like OpenBell, uh, you know, CTD base, um, you know, science SDKE. These are the, these are the representations that still capture some information. Not at the level of detail that we would like it to be, but they are useful in many use cases. So, you know, I think we'll also see you know expansion in the combined with that direction as well. So that's that's part of the SPGM hybrid harmonization discussions, biomaximizing that direction. You guys probably will include something like that, and so I think we'll see some expansion in that direction as well. Oh, repositories. So there, right now there are many repositories for separate standards. We've heard about Pathway Commons um, in a talk here that we've uh, heard about, and we know about file models for SVML. Um, there are now SVML repositories, the IGEM registry, although they spit out SVML as a mangle, but uh, JBI is the SVML stack that we heard about here. And then the virtual parts repository that we've, we've also heard mentioned at um, Newcastle, which actually does combine two standards. It, it uses SVML and SVML. And it would be desirable to have a single interface enabling a user to have a one-stop shopping experience to obtain all the information they need for one information portal. So that if you are trying to get all the information about, say, a design that you're doing in synthetic biology, how do you go and say, I want everything about you know, this uh, gene that I'm building? So how might this work? Those building repositories have opinions on this. Yeah. I think you have opened a very huge box now because <laughs> <laughs> because when you really uh, want to capture everything in one single interface, that also would mean all the experimental data that are underlying the models and all well, the simulation results and all the whole range. In synthetic biology, they're probably going to more likely want that experimental information, the measurements that have really been done on those promoters and things like that. So definitely, we can't exclude that side at all in the synthetic biology realm. They're going to they're going to want that more than the models, probably. But it, I agree, it's a big can of worms. But I mean, it's gross, but, but we have a lot of databases now. We need just some way of sort of interfacing them. So yeah. why? Why? Why do we want this? Why do you want this? Uh, so if you're you're building a design and you, and you want to get both models and interaction well, information. Well, of course you want to call the, the information. Why would you want a single interface when the data and the, and the information and the ways that the data are connected, the different kinds of things are connected within each other are so different? I mean, I'm not sure that the, because whenever you have a single interface, you're making sacrifices somewhere. Okay? You're, you're having to cast things into a common world view. And it's not clear that the world has established, has reached that point. I mean, eventually we might evolve to sort of, uh, as in the diagram that you showed, where there's a lot of commonality between biopacks and that world. But at the moment, there's not that much commonality. So the you know, a single interface is not, is, is probably going to be. It, not in, very the, in the yeah. SVOL community, we have a lot of these RDF people that always promise us this. If you just give it to us in RDF, then we can give you all of this information that you want, however you want to ask about it, and it will just come to you. Right. right. So, so I think that's supposedly <coughs> true, but I, I so here's the here. thing. So, so you just made made the argument against doing this, okay? Because you just described exactly what one would do to provide a unified interface, which is somehow make some some middle representation that can be used for all of these data sources and query from a single interface. And so far, even though RDF has a lot of promise and has been Don't look at me, Mike. And not saying this is an innovative way, I think it's just a reality because you're the problem. You see, you came to mind as the proponent of RDF here. <laughs> anyway, um, it's one of them. I think you should look at the fact that no one has seems to have mastered this in the RDF realm, even though so many people have tried. So, well, the, e you, the EDI almost has. So the EDI have thrown a huge amount of resource, and they have ridiculously large triples with all the data the EDI. <coughs> but do they provide a 
is there some sort of given five single interface? So, yeah. Yeah. so when you go to the EDI website now, yes. all of those searches and queries are driven by the RDA. Yeah. So as you're typing into the query bar, give me a, a gem gem entry with GFP in, <coughs> all of that sitting in a big triple store. Yeah. So, yeah. I'll speak to this for a second. That, that's exactly what we're doing with quick bios. We're building this kind of interface. And the reason is to get it to hundreds of thousands of people who have absolutely no idea how to even start into these many branches. But it look it will look like not a single <clears throat> interface that enables a user to, and the word there, obtain is critical. A, a an interface that has a bunch of windows or a bunch of displays that allow you to go out to bio models or go out to open facts to get information is probably the first thing you're going to see. And it will be a single interface that will allow a user to obtain all the necessary data. But I think you thought of it initially as something much more elaborate that would allow all that information to be coherently <laughs> mashed together <laughs> right. so that you're now getting a uh, you know a beautiful, elegant combination of all of this information. I think that, that, that maybe not, isn't that, what yeah, you want to do. That's not exactly with. what I was saying either. I think oh, it's okay. just a matter so, of. It's I'm like the Google of you type in, this is what you want, and it, it spits out, okay, this is what I know about what you want. Okay. And so that's one if, what if, if what you want is this, I, mean, that, that, uh, I think that's not unreasonable. My, my interpretation of what you wanted here was a much more elaborate user interface. Yeah. Yeah. What do you want to show? If, if you just, I mean, you know, it's like Matthew just described, you know, it's, and you just described it, it's actually something you can very much do, and it's just a family. I mean, it depends how the data comes back to you. If it comes back in one of our agreed upon standards, then we may have translators and converters that can extract it into the, into the representation that you're trying to build. But sometimes that may not be true. Okay. Okay. Well, yeah. okay. Gotcha. Just uh, two points. We can at the moment achieve this uh, using two different approaches. First of all, yes, in that first step, for example, we can register different stacks. That means that I can use the SQL step interface to create different repositories. And the approach that we took is we developed a system called Colab. So that facilitates own computational tools to notify each other. So suppose that you have uh, a repository for characterizing parts. As soon as you have published any data, you say, OK, here's my data. We published the sample repository. And all the other repositories get notified. For example, I can then, as an SQL repository, I can then accept the information. Or if I have an external repository, I can accept that information and create a model. So this process can be automated using a simple message system. And we always have something like the Let Me Pass it, for example. That's how we are trying to connect different repositories. Not for a user, <coughs> but for a computation <coughs> users, for a tool, or for a repository. I mean, I think maybe I've missed the list. By putting SQL stack here, it seems to imply it. I mean, the name SQL seems to imply that it's just all about SQL, but it isn't just about SQL data necessarily. Because you can point to anything, actually, about the thing that you're working on. So, 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 so do you want to say something? Yeah. Well, I was just going to say, if, yeah, it, that's exactly right. The, the, the SQL stack's made for SQL, but it really works with any RDF. And so if we were to agree on some metadata representation in RDF that could point to all of your different data, you could put it as a repository or a part in the SQL stack. And maybe we could rebrand it, rename it something else. And then you, stack. Yeah, <laughs> mind stack or something like that. And then you could do your queries over all your combined repositories and then get back data not just on SQL, but also like a pointer to an HTML file or a cell mail file or biohacks information and then pull all that in at once and be able to download and do things with it. But this is a question is you know really kind of agreeing on a common like why do we need to agree on a common you know higher level ontology in the first place or representation in the first place? You know, everyone could provide Sparkle endpoint and then every user can kind of define their own And you, you could do something along those lines too. It just might be more useful to have some Agreed upon representation or ontology. Yeah, that can be a default, and you know, some, if someone right. wants to develop it, I, I, will, I, I will be happy to kind of help them. Yeah, have things. Exactly. But, but, the, but the problem is like it's not even like a something that we have to fight over, right? It can, you can define as many of these as you, you can. can. Yes, and then so this again goes back to the I guess Mike's point. 
right? You know, you, you don't need a standardization if everybody does it. So but, but you, you need a level of standardization so that you don't have to write a unique and beautiful Sparkle query every single time for every single combination. Yeah. But then, if you if you go down that road, then then everything that Michael is discussing actually becomes real. So so I don't know where the, where the local minima is. Like where where do you stop? I mean, so there's uh, then you have to kind of there's a there's a very slippery slope where you actually go towards the unified scheme of things. So. I'm a little bit skeptical about this. I think Caillou had a comment. Yeah, I'm just wondering, you know, who you refer to as a user here? Is it this combined community or is it more marvelous? You know, who's going to use this? Anybody trying to get information about biological systems? I would hope that it's accessible both to people building models of natural systems and people building models <clears throat> of engineered systems. When I say models, I mean in the broadest sense. I mean models that include biopaths and models. And but if you just want to gather all the information about something that you're working on, whether it's in a system or some other Okay, so it's more like a system file. It's yeah. both. Yeah. I mean, I don't see very strong lines between system and synthetic biology because I think we have the same problem sets. And we're not beyond that. But it's okay. Well, What's beyond that? Maybe it is. I don't know. Is no, I'm, I'm, I mean, it's just a, this is more like a more Engineering computational biology, not lab experiment. Well, I mean, the, the hope is that the systems biology work informs the experimental work, just as the synthetic biology work has a very vast experimental component. So, of course, the data would also be about experiments. Yeah, I'm and just mentioning you know, that um, people always. I work in a cancer center. Those people, they they want something that is not this purpose, right? So you're certain, you're serving those people who are doing like a, a cancer biology. Or something. It is, but it is very conceivable that you know we can establish something that can be sort of you know based tools that can help you know help help the biologists as well, right? You can use it for, for example, I don't know, finding drugs that target a certain certain protein or that is sensitive to a certain mutation, or you know. But obviously, if you if you want to at the same time discover SPML models, you know, your users are very unlikely to use SPML models. They might be yeah. In fact, oh yeah, that's true. We, we we actually people are probably pretty happy with Hathaway Commons already, but uh, you know, adding additional things. Right. Yeah. Okay. So I have two things. One is what you described sounded like a user-facing uh, interface rather than just a programmatic interface. And user-facing systems um, require nice user interfaces and. And in addition to figuring out all the infrastructure, so that's a major undertaking. I mean, that's not something that that's often what the EBI has to do or what you guys probably have to do for your system. Like it's years of work and talented people designing sensible user interfaces that naive users can use. And that's not, not easy. So um, a hard thing. But um, what Rosa mentioned is actually an interesting thing. A benefit of having something like this is cross notification so that one repository can learn or be notified, one system can be notified about a piece and another system having to do with data that may be referenced by both in common. So, um, right now, if you, you know something happens in one of the repositories, I'm pretty sure that the other does not learn anything about that. Supposing that somebody deposited something in Biopax that was relevant to the paper that is modeled in. By model database, um, an update or a retraction, like of something getting retracted, that might be useful to know and propagate across the original notification system. Right now, so a notification system would be useful even for the individual systems. If you had a simple notification system at home for us, but it's used in some way. But it has a um, it has a Java library, so if you want to use it yourself, you just need to use the library. So people could imprint. Uh, well, the different rep repositories could, in principle, establish something like that yes. without too much exactly. cost. Yeah. Exactly. They just need to get together and say, okay, we're going to do this, and this is what we're going to exchange under what conditions. Yeah, you just have to agree that you're going to send particular messages with a particular domain. Right. And specify that that resource is, you just pass the URI, and you have people like this who interface this. And we exchange them. <coughs> 
so <coughs> we've built this wonderful repository where people can submit their data. We can move on to an easier topic. Um, working um, with the journals. Can I have <laughs> yeah. comment yeah. On, the, on the previous slide? So there is a project called BioQRDF that kind of sounds in the direction that you want to get to. Yeah, I'm sure just take a look at that. Yes, yes. Yeah. So that's a look <coughs> triple store in Canada and it's very much a huge RDF repository that you would extract from to be able to get some of this information. Open facts in Europe is very similar, monstrous repository with a lot of focus on trying to provide that kind of one stop uh, access point for a lot of RDF resources. But even projects like BioQRDF, like Mike said, there's a central set of programmers and developers there that are making whatever format, whatever specifications they need to pull in all this data. So and if all that data is pulled in, we can hook into it and query, presumably. But, if but it doesn't, but, but as others have said, it doesn't satisfy the needs of a lot of other use cases. You know, they are making choices. Right. So journals. So the use of standards for DNA sequence data became um, <laughs> commonplace when journals began to require them for publication. So there are journals out there that encourage the use of standards such as SPML for modeling, but to my knowledge, there's none that absolutely require it. So in order to encourage journals to require these um, standard data representations, we have to develop means where the impact on the authors is minimized. Journals are intensely afraid that the authors will go publish in another journal if we put undue requirements on them. So we should therefore strive, I think, to having a user-friendly portal to the repositories such as we were just talking about that enables authors to easily deposit their models and other information about their designs in the synthetic biology. So these interfaces should allow authors to provide their information in an intuitive way while storing the information using appropriate standards. So this task, I think, potentially, of all the ones we talked about, has the potential for the greatest impact, at least in terms of generating reproducible science. So to this end, we've been negotiating um, in the ESPOL community with ACS Synthetic Biology to develop a scheme where um, ESPOL information can be encoded when appropriate for the, uh, the people that are publishing in this journal, which is now one of the, the major journals in this area. So the, the idea that we propose to them is that the author is going to a user-friendly uh, repository that is being developed out of JBay uh, called the ICE repository. And there they can type up and enter their information about the DNA sequence and their synthetic biology design. Uh, JBAI also supports the import and export of ESPL files. And so it, once they've encoded their information into the JBA, JBAI tool, it's possible to then get the information back out in a standard in ESPL. And so if somebody else wants to use that design, they can query the database and pull it into their software tool. And then similarly, if you use one of our DDA tools that we're developing in our domain to create um, the ESPL file to begin with, you can just import that as your submission to, to the um, publication. So the idea is that the author will um, communicate to ACS Synthetic Biology when they have uh, submitted their paper an ID number for the information they deposit in this repository. And that information will remain private until the actual publication of the paper. So if people are afraid about their data getting out. And so there's a login mechanism for that. So, but once the publication is made, that data becomes public as supplementary material. The other thing that we're hoping is that authors will choose to use SQL Visual in their papers. And so one of the things that this enables is through the program that uh, was described earlier called Pigeon, it's possible to take an SQL file, convert it into a visual representation, and then create a graphic that you can actually put into the publication. So how do we convince journals in, to encourage and ideally require the use of standards? How can we make it easier for authors to use standards in their journal for publications? And what infrastructure is needed to support this effort? So a very related project that we've been pursuing is um, factoid. It's slightly different than you know, I would say you know, SPML and, and, and SQL use cases. Uh, where we uh, where we try to kind of get snippets of path information, um, and the idea ideas that we use uh, natural language processing to parse the the, the whole uh, full text and then try to kind of provide a user 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 interface where the users can do a little bit of iteration and then get the file saved as a as a as a, as a, as a file. 
I mean, instead of going through the whole typing thing, you can also do something like that. It will also require a lot of visual stuff, um, and it will be kind of cost a lot more costly to do. Uh, but 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 I found that the journals are surprisingly open to that, actually. To even requiring? Yes. So so we we talked with the post biology and post genetics editors, and they agreed to start a pilot project where they will first kind of uh, merge. Well, there will be a little check, well, it will be voluntary in the first place, but the idea is that it's not going to be voluntary eventually, but there will be a little checkbox that in the, in the peer review process that says this article contains pathway information. If that is the case, they are directed to the, uh, to the you know, the pathway interface. So, but you, you could also conceive a world where we actually kind of pursue that type of thing you know, jointly. So, you know, like in the same way, you know, this requires the, the review of a statistician, Maybe you might have like a, some sort of like a, this requires you know this has something to, this has either an SPMM model or an S4 model or path information um, and you know then people will kind of have to choose a combined standard and then so, I mean that is something probably for long 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 term. I should uh, mention uh, uh, a proposal that um, Mike's on as well to do something similar for the systems biology community. Uh, we have uh, one journal definitely on board, which is the biophysical journal. Um, Plus, Tom Fire Express has expressed uh, um, a lot of interest. They would like to see how this goes. Um, there's a grant submitted to support this. It's actually quite a big effort. Primary issue is curation. <coughs> um, you know, you may be submitting your SVOL files and so on, but uh, they're not. Someone doesn't check them first, you could just end up with a lot of rubbish going on to the journals. And so one of the uh, one of the tasks is to curate models before they get to the journal. Um, so that costs a lot of money. And so one thing, one impediment I think, also to getting journals to accept <coughs> formats for some areas is just that um, unless it's a very focused journal. I where the format matches very closely to mm. what the, uh, the journal publishes. Um, I think it's it's harder to make the case that a format should be required for publications. And I understand the journals in the author's the office <laughs> positions on this. For example, SVML will cover very well certain kinds of models, like metabolic models, but signaling models. Signaling models. Those, those are great. You really that's handled very well. But it turns out that people want to do lots of other kinds of models. Group based, um, qualitative. Mechanical. Now, you could, and many people do, say, well, yes, you can look for examples in SVML too. But the people who do the models use other software that maybe doesn't support that directly, or maybe that has no standard at all, like MATLAB, which is probably the most common format. So then, you say to the journal, well, we want you to require authors to produce models in this format. <coughs> and now you're really, you're, you're, the mismatch is now getting greater and greater. The types of modeling the tools they're likely to use, um, the tools they're likely to use aren't producing SVML natively. And so it's getting harder and harder to convince that. So I think this works for focus things, but it gets harder for. So I was also not wanting to say have ACS and Bios say require S4 files. That's why I was saying require them to go to a spot where the information can be entered in a way that the information that we need to capture can be captured so that we know that that information will be stored. But in some cases, like modeling, you're right, it might be MATLAB will have to accept in some cases or, or whatever. I mean, it's just about I mean, reproducibility. That is the biggest problem. That's the elephant in the room. Because most MATLAB um, um, models are really not serializable in any of these things without major work by the authors. Right. They don't want to be good. Right. And I so mean, I think you have to try to curate the MATLAB as well. But, okay. well, but they're all out of different types of files. Just a, a genuine question. Does anybody have any experience with the journal being unreasonable about it? Let's say a journal like strongly recommending and coding a model in SPML, and then an author then says, I'm sorry, I would like to, but I cannot do it, and the journal will be being annoying about it, or just that I'm But they don't, because they want the authors to come. 
Yeah. Uh, so they're not going to, I mean, it's going to be a little bit tricky. It's up to the reviewers, actually, to say, I mean, the review process has to be the reviewers yeah. to say, look, this should have been provided in SQML. Go do this or your paper is rejected. So we had uh, this discussion. Wait, you're one of the SQL managers, so you saw Nicholas a little bit. Yeah, yeah well, that's why I lost it. Yeah, so, so I think no journal requires it, so there's no situation currently exactly like that. But one of the things that has happened um, is be because some journals suggest that authors deposit their models in BIMODELS database. So BIMODELS database people, let's send a curation team there, then receive questions like, well, my model is in this format. Can I submit it in this form? My model is in MATLAB. Can I, you know, do you accept MATLAB? And they actually have gotten those questions. And they have to say no, because currently they accept normally SDML and SLML. Um, and what else do you guys do? Well, well, so that's a lot it, of things. Like, like, so XP and the problem with the, the, yeah, the problem is MATLAB. It's very open-ended. So most MATLAB problems are not easy to transform. Yeah. They require people to understand the code. It's just like saying, I will accept models written in C++. Yeah. So you can the, write them in arbitrary ways. On the flip side of that is that I was at an interesting dog show meeting where we had to reproduce a model in real time over the week. And the paper described it in ODE, very easy to encode in SPML. So I emailed out the office and said, can you give me your SPML for this? Like, you don't have that. And so then I started coding up and realized there was one parameter missing from the paper. And without that parameter, you couldn't reproduce anything. That's all the time. And, and this is not something, because it's MATLAB. I mean, they just, I mean, it was something, because it's all differential equations with parameters. It could have easily been encoded. So I think that we have to work, maybe if we have to work with the funding agent, Say thou shalt use standards. Because if NIH said you will submit your models in SVML, but that's not what worked with the with the sequences. What worked with the sequences was that there were databases mm. that had format sufficiently strict that people had to format them. They were not that difficult to format, and the journals required it. Yeah, Nature and Science particularly, they said we will not publish a paper that talks about a sequence unless the sequence is in the database. So we need to talk to Nature and Science. And that's the one, that's the time when it happened. I lost track of who was in which one. But it's a much it's a much less it's a much thinner type of, of form. You gotta say anything. This is kind of carrot stick though. I mean, you want to say you want to go the stick route and say you won't get your papers published unless you publish it in you know whatever grant format you come up with. But I think you run the problem like not all models are expressible, blah, 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 blah. You know, maybe there's something you haven't foreseen and there's a completely new model in your direction. It can't be coded that way. Do you want that rejected? I mean, you want to encourage new ideas. The carrot side, which is kind of like the uh, the open journal approach, right, is saying you can submit it in this format and you can reference something that has something like a DOI or whatever you want to use for your index into your database. And just show that the people who do that get more citations and have a bigger impact, and they get yeah, more reviews. But that doesn't work. I mean, it I worked, don't know if I it didn't work with sequencing. It was only when the stick appeared that people published. No, you and and by the way, people sure. were also published wrong sequences on purpose so that they wouldn't get a copy. And it was only the stick that worked. I don't know. I mean, in terms of you know, open science and open publication things. I mean, I completely agree. I mean, it, it does seem to be getting its own momentum. If you give enough time, the carrot approach I think will work without unduly dampening creativity and new ideas that just simply cannot be encoded in a format. You don't wait four years for the format to catch up. Yeah. You know, I, I'm, I'm really wary of a strict format. You in your in your um, in your submission why you didn't encode it. Force them to at least have a question. <laughs> Is this encoded in standards? And if so, where have you deposited? If not, explain why not. They, that information should be cycled back to us, and we should use that as information as to how do we improve what we're doing. Yeah. Perfect. So two points. One, uh, the NIH is definitely interested in, in uh, this problem, but they're not going to enforce it. They'd like it to go through the journals. Somehow. And I wait to say to the journals to tackle the editors. It's the editors are the big problem. Absolutely. Like when I was uh, you know, working on a couple of journals, and you get pushback from some of the editors, right? But one person in particular would, did not care whether it was something was submitted or not, and he certainly didn't want, wasn't interested in SBML, right? So the, way, the solution is for us 
I agree with this, but it's not just editors. If the reviewers say this, then there is a very strong um, weight already. Then the editor no, most likely would say this. Yeah. That was so, certainly, the, the senior editors Although have a lot of say. I'm, I'm, I'm section editor now for BMC Systems Biology. And if I look at a paper and I say this paper is no good, it, it doesn't even reach an editor. It goes back to the authors. That's so I can good. I can say this paper needs the model in SPML. Good. We do except, that. Except, we do that. except the journal doesn't have that requirement, so it will be my decision. So then at some point the senior director might say, You're losing us publications. But we so can't. there is a but there is certainly you're right. There are, the editors have quite a strong a strong yeah. effect. I think Mike you had your hand up first, so I are do. you yielding the floor to um, <laughs> Robert's rules of order. <laughs> <laughs> Mine's relatively quick and hopefully not controversial. <laughs> um, <laughs> we can make it so. You're right. We can make anything controversial in this crowd. I disagree. Um, the <laughs> Sorry? You disagree? Sorry. Right. <laughs> I think one problem, one dimension to this is how difficult is it for an author to produce the required format. If the format was super easy, if they didn't have to make it easier, then obviously, then I think authors wouldn't care. These right. Are, produce format X, and you know they push a button on the tool. They're like, okay, yeah. well, whatever. It's format X. You know, it's just as good as saving it as a PDF. Or yeah. Because JVI is still for us. It imports GenBank files, which they're going to have anyway, because they need to publish the sequence, and then it just asks you a bunch of questions about it. So that's that's good for at least level one of what we want to do. But but I don't, it's harder with models because they no, might be written so, in right. so in addition to these other things, I think we still have work to do in making it uh, more seamless or easier for authors to produce the, the format. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, as I said, MATLAB is the elephant in the room. Yes. <laughs> so because if you look at the surveys, the large majority of papers that have models do them in MATLAB in ad hoc ways. So here. That's well, it. <clears throat> so if you think of Elsevier as a, a use case, how many people in the room here have interacted with Pathway Studio or Pathway Studio personnel inside Elsevier? I don't One hand. Then around the biopacks, perhaps? Um, yeah, they, they do biopacks. And then also, <laughs> now they are part of the of another batch of consortium that that you're, you're so, so we've interacted with Elsevier a bit through the Seashells uh, group, the Semantics uh, conference. And they put a lot of curation effort. They have a whole internal group that's extracting with NLP their own journals and pumping it toward their own commercial Pathway Studio product, which they sell to farm. Sure. And so they, they have a real incentive to keep all of their journal uh, models pumping right into Pathway Studio. And if you look online, which I just did now about the Pathway Studio, you won't see one mention of standard uh, sh you know, sharing of models for Pathway Studio. So you just, yes, you may be able to provide the authors a quick way to put it into SBML. You may even find editors that believe that you should do that. Uh, you may also want to make a tool that makes it really easy for the Pathway Absolutely. Studio people to boast of this interoperability if you can get them emotionally to want to do that. It may or may not work, because on purpose they may not want it to be standard, because they don't want Springer to do the same thing. That's the problem with that approach from Elsevier. So this is a problem. It's but I think, I think we will be better off if we go through the route of PLOS and the other open access journals, or even PubMed Central. I mean, PubMed Central would be the best way. So you know, uh, if, if the NIH said, okay, if there is a model, yeah, piece, might be down it can be encoded, encoded into that model. Yeah. Matthew, you get the last word on this topic. <laughs> so my point was just an application of power one, right? One editor gets to say something about a shared load of papers. One reviewer gets to say something about one paper, and they're one of three or four or five people who say something. So I, I agree that if what we want to do is a top-down engineering, we have to be in the positions that make the decisions. And that means being the editors. That's right. yeah. And not being editors of a section for software, because most right. of the software papers don't have to have SPML, which is my case. <laughs> well, so even though I. Last word. Very short, not controversial.
But yeah, I mean, just a quick one. I mean, yes, I agree with uh, you know with the, with the general idea that you know the the, the 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 absolute solution for this problem is going to be you know the journals and etc. But but still, I think there's some you know leverage that we can gain through the, the the funding agencies, even if we just kind of not make it mandatory, but like even make it mandatory to discuss in the data management section. Like they all have their own data management section. So you know, if we just just can put something in the guidelines that you have to discuss which standards that you're going to use, and if not, you have to justify it. That I think is, is still will give us some some yeah, leverage. So yeah. I'm I'm on more NSF panels than I should be, but whenever I'm on those, I read those data management sections, and if they're not talking about standards, I think more. Yeah, I think more people need to do that, and it comes up. I bring it up during the panels. But the NIH did not score, so it's very really, uh, no teeth. However, so, I would like to mention that one of the sorry, one of the NIH uh, program also whose number I forget, I think it might have been MSN, but they actually explicitly say uh, we recommend you produce if you're producing models, produce them in SVML yeah. or, or SELML or other formats. So they mm -hmm. actually call out specific formats. That is good because then that lets the editors have a have a hammer yeah. and say, you need your model can be done in SVML, so you have to do it. Whereas the journals that don't have that, the authors will go and complain to the editor in chief and say, why is this? This isn't, it's not in your guidelines, and they will get away. So speaking, can your model be done in SVML? The, or the questions are not getting easier, I'm afraid. So the last topic that I wanted to definitely leave time for, because it's a long and very important one, is compliance testing. So this is started, there were some discussions over email. For SVML, I've also been in, in discussions with SQL about the same topic. And so the challenge here is that a standard should be broad enough to support user needs, but a standard should not be broad enough that no tools support the standard. So if a standard is too light, users complain they can't encode their data. If it, a standard is too heavy, users complain their, their tools do not interoperate with each other. And <laughs> that too. In both cases, the standard is blamed. But it's really a tool problem we're talking about here. And I think one solution to this problem is compliance testing. And so, in particular, what I want us to discuss is what does it mean when we say a tool supports a standard? We have this problem in ASPOL where people will, I've seen many times where people stand up and say, we support ASPOL. And what they mean is they use um, glyphs that we once thought were nice, maybe not even the glyphs that we currently think are nice, and that means that they support SPOL. Partially this is because DARPA said, thou shalt support SPOL, so they're trying to say that they support SPOL when really they don't. Um, so how do we uh, so how do we quantify what it means to support a standard? How do we include, encourage full developers to fully support a standard? How do we collect data on the degree at which um, a tool support the standard? How do we advertise this information? And getting back to something that was brought up earlier, it should combine sanctioned workflows that are known to work. So <coughs> that should take us to lunch, I think. Yes. So just one comment, at least with uh, VR packages. So like Bioconductor, now that I'm submitting uh, patch tools are, they have an automated system that does a bunch of checking to make sure that it actually uh, run that it has tests that they get run that there's documentation and one of those checks is that at least that it compiles uh, and loads up and installs properly on Macs, Windows, and Linux. So I I feel like for anything that comes into combine and says we want to be a standard, there has to be some uh, capacity to validate that thing and some set of test cases and. And only then can we even consider it to be a standard. So unfortunately, the course sort of left the barn on that one because there are standards already that don't have Like what? Oh, well, I'm not aware. Combine. Yeah, I'm not aware of something for. This region has a validator. It's a syntax. It, that, it has to have some capacity to validate. I'm not aware of one for that. Do you want to say no to that? Augustine, it's not for SPGN, it's for SPGN. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's a different yeah. You can't validate yeah. the picture, is that what yeah. you're saying? You can't. You can. You can. <laughs> that's <laughs> why. Yeah. I, it could be done. And we need a spec in comparing. And one could develop, actually, there's some clever work done with machine, uh, machine vision applied to <laughs> images that actually could be done this way. It would be a great project, but, or, but we're not there. You know, if, 
if we could get funding, we could do it. But for a lot of things, but I think um, so. Anyway, well, that, that, my point is just that we already don't require that. I mean, we could look through. They must have test cases and some <laughs> mechanism. I'm not aware. Of but but I mean, to be fair, there is. It is very complicated to check that, for example, in SPML. All you can check properly is syntax. No, it has to be a minimum layer. I, it, I mean, the same thing with the SPGN and looking at the picture versus just the, that it supports There is actually no, no proper result, because we're talking numerics. So, there's, there's, okay. Go ahead. so for some things, you can, um, for validity of, of SPML interpretation. So in the test yeah, case, we do. In special cases. You, so you can test whether a, a file is valid yeah. within some statements. You can also test whether a tool um, interprets models correctly for some regimes. So for example, we do simulation models in SV model test suite. It consists of a lot of small models with gold standard data. And the, and the process is have a tool produce a simulation result and does it match the gold standard data within some tolerances? Uh, there you go. And within SPGML, where do I not go? everything, where, but where not everything in SPML. But you cannot do that for everything in SPML. It's, it's there are things in SPML that are unresolvable. It's true. Pedro, Pedro, I think it's not a technical question. Yeah. I mean, it's difficult to do, but of course we can do some level of testing. It will never be complete. I mean, much yeah, but that's to test tools. That's not to test a particular model. So a new model yeah, has been published. Very How very can you true. test that? Is correct. Well, what I'm talking about here is the tool. So I'm saying that yeah, we like to, so we don't want to have users that start, you know, build their model in one tool and they're using some cool little feature and then they export it to another tool and the feed them. They can't simulate it. So you want to prevent that as much as you can. And I think it's not about you know bugs in the tools and, and mistakes that they get. It's about what support there is. And so yes, it's costly to do this, but you can potentially do it with self-reporting if you put things up there like with the test suite and things where you can put stuff up and say, test this. So for SPOL in particular, what I proposed is that we take, we have this demo that Herbert showed of the different files passing between tools. And what we can do is post those and say, can you load these? Can you, and if so, then you get a star for import. If you cannot, I mean, that's a very simple check, actually, which actually rules out one of the tools. Kevin's last, I <laughs> mentioned it. Spectre NTI thought they supported it. He kind of alluded to it in his talk. But he had actually connected an item registry who also thought they supported it, and they weren't generating valid as well. So these are it's a very simple check, and they'll probably go and fix it if they notice that. And then secondly, um, this can build on itself, is that people can then put more of things up there and say, here's my S full thing that I'm exporting. And you can kind of have this sort of build up a collection through the community, maybe, mm -hmm. that will collect all these things. And then you can see whether you have support. And then the other half of it is what you're choosing to support. Right, so this is where the survey comes in that Mike sends out asking, you know, are you choosing to support algebraic rules? Are you choosing to support delay? It, and so that's a different thing. A bug and a feature is that there are tools that are choosing not to support parts of the standard. And we need to make that information, I think, available to our users. And um, going back to SVGN, the, one of the first things we did when we started doing Live SVGN was make a vendor comparison where all the tools there was five or six, or I don't know how many files, but there was a set of files, and there was a render comparison across all of them, and they should all kind of look like a, a, a reference figure. So that, that's one way of validating. With BioPacks, we have a validator, and oftentimes we have to go back to the, uh, the, uh, the databases and say, you're not fixing. We had that conversation with uh, Andreas uh, about keg translator over this meeting. Right? I mean, there has to be a capacity to validate. But it, it's also about not just the capacity to do, because in a lot of cases we have the capacity, but advertising the information in such a way that people aren't having the bad experiences. I think, Sven, you were next. Yeah, I mean, we're talking about this, I mean, compliance and being having central authority to decide whether something is compliant and so on for at least 10 years now. <laughs> so, so the question is, is it, is it now the right time to finally do it? If, I mean, or, I mean, was it wrong to not have been doing it so far, or does it really solve our problems? I mean, if we think we really need it, we can solve these technical issues. Pedro, I think you're Yeah, I mean, my, my question is somewhat similar. The question is, 
Okay, so we, we now can look at whether tools are compliant or not, and what are you going to do about tools that are not compliant? Mm. Are you going to shame them? Are you gonna, what are you going to do about <laughs> them? Because <laughs> biology produces SVML, which is broken all the time. Well, and so yet they say, well, this so the the should we do the <laughs> last one there? <laughs> should Combine <laughs> come out and say, and here, so we know that we've, we've convinced all the journals out there to make SVML required. <clears throat> so now you have to do SVML. We need to also give you a path, okay? Here's a path that works that we are saying, if you do this path, you're going to have a good experience, and you're going to get something out that actually simulates and works. Is that it's worth doing? It's a tricky thing. Um, uh, my mic stands lower, but I think it was up first. Um, it's not about the elevation. <laughs> so what I was going to ask is, what, who's the target audience for this compliance testing? Because my understanding is that the modelers actually couldn't care less. I mean, they don't care. They really don't give a shit. They just well, want to save up their model and whatever format, you know, they don't care what the format is. They're in a tool. They just want to save their model. That's all. And it's submitted. They wouldn't want to do any. So they, they wouldn't they care about the compliance. sent out of saying, you know, I built this model on one thing and I couldn't simulate another. And I'm, you know, SPML is bad because it's not a real standard because different tools don't do the same things with it. And so he sent out this list of complaints for people. And, but they were the list of complaints was not. I couldn't import it from take it from one to one for it. That's what that's Nicholas said they were. No. no. Um, if you looked at these complaints, the, the user complaints, they were of the form. I have a rule-based model. How do I store it? In Some form. of them are of that form, but there are also interoperability problems that you mentioned that you can't. That there's because you know, he well I don't know if Nicholas has information on that, but he was citing at least in the email track that when tools go flat on a model. That gives a bad experience to people, and they're complaining. About it. Actually, he was arguing that users didn't care because they never. You were the one arguing that people needed to take stuff from one tool to another. It, it, he was arguing that most people just use, for example, Cell Designer, and that's all they. That's the entire. You know, they don't try to cross environments, and so the the problems we're discussing here are actually for developers, I think. Yeah. And I think they're valid, but but we have to be careful. You have to be. Be clear about who, whose issues you're trying to solve. So at least on CRAN, again with the R, uh, for one package that I, I submitted there, um, it'll it, there's like a, a review log that after they checked it, it just has notes with all the uh, error messages if there were any or it says OK. So just something like that for tools that pass some metric of validation is necessary. I think. Yeah. Oh. I want to kind of revisit on the uh, on the uh, on the shaming. Uh, <laughs> um, so in our case, I mean, this is slightly different because uh, in our case, the, the the major kind of validations are about the data exporters, and major path data sources, and the comments, and we already put them through a very difficult you know process, and then they're they're super nice, open open to kind of you know put up with us. And you know, once they once they once I put them through, there's there might be still problems that are not resolved, and I'm not going to publicly shame them by giving them three stars versus five stars, <laughs> right? It's just that's not going to happen. It's, it is politically unliable for me. It is bad for them, but yeah. maybe it's, it might be slightly good for users. But you know, it, it's not like from a social <laughs> point of view, it's not going to work for us. Yeah, Robert, you said your comment. I think that's the uh, biggest problem yeah. with this. So the test would go wrong. I mean, that, that could be the beginning <coughs> of some mechanism. The only trouble, I mean, SDML is, you know, is pretty big, and with certain things, very few of us support, like delay equations. What are you going to do about that, Chris? Me? <laughs> <laughs> I had a support <laughs> system, so I did about it. What are you going to do? I mean, what is it? No, what are you going to support delay equations? Used to this one. There's one library. There's there's a, there's more than that. There's even a bit better question. But how many support the property? Well, that's the other. Yeah. How many? How many? We know, for example, um, yeah. they've actually sin. <laughs> passes all the tests, but when you put it on the real problems, so, but so I think the thing is that that's why I think it's nice to keep the SPML core around something that people are actually implementing too. And do things else extensions. Then you can have some table where you can call and say they support this extension, they support, like the map extensions that we talked about yesterday. <clears throat> but then you can very clearly delineate if you need this type of modeling capabilities, here are the tools, here's the tool you need to go, go fetch. 
as far as core goes, as far as I know, there are three things that cause people havoc, and the rest of them should just implement play equations, uh, algebraic rules, and fast. And fast would definitely. And fast is really. Yeah, so those are the two of the big ones. Yeah. Right. And, and neither one of them is, is showstopper either, technically. It's just they, they seem scary on the outside. Well, technically, yeah. But nobody, I don't think anybody does. Maybe Bruce does the uh, algebraic equation. Nobody does we the do fast. Do you have linear ones? Jason does algebraic rules. Not non linear. Yeah, I believe they're, they're based on. I mean, live, live uh, estimate of claims to support, live estimate of claims to support after equation. We know it only. <laughs> Are there non linear in the test suite? No, not yet. No. They're They're all linear. So, you know, yes, it's a case of expanding the test suite. Yeah, but don't put in the fast ones that nobody can do. Oh, we're not doing no <laughs> Yes, Matt. So the point about well, who are we um, uh, targeting this? Actually, um, was sparked by what Sven said that we talked about having validation or some uh, uh, enterprise to validate uh, the tools for ten years. Um, but one of the problems I think is that not everyone has the resources to develop some the software features in a particular tool to support everything in, let's say, SPML. As an example, just picking an example, but I'm sure the truth the thing would be true of SVGN or by Atoms or something else. So a lot of the developers and the tools listen in, the, in this SPML software guide, you know, they're small one-person operations mm -hmm. or a postdoc or a fund project or something. And yes, perhaps those are not worth being concerned about over the long term because they're not, they're obviously not going to be around for very long because they were an effort. They might be, you know, somebody likes it and picks it up. But, so you don't have a lot of, uh, I guess what I'm getting to is um, there's a danger that we alienate a lot of people um, by having this, right? It's what you were saying. You don't want to try to shame, you want people to be continue supporting something because otherwise it's going to get back out if there's nobody supporting it. So if you're if but if you come back and say, well, you know, you're you're not, not doing it right, sooner or later people are going to say screw this, you know, this is too hard and too maybe many. more carrot than stick is you give, you know, some notification that these are the fully compliant ones just because <clears> the users need to know which ones are the ones that they should focus on when they're doing real work. Not because the postdoc develops it for their own personal problem that they have, and they implement the part they need. But you don't want users going, go, I'm going to download that tool and then have a bad experience. And so then blame SPML. <laughs> if, if I can so follow up on that, that wait, wait, let me just follow up on that, because one of the most prominent tools in our area, and I don't want to name it because we're on tape, but. <laughs> <laughs> Are we on tape? Uh, <laughs> 18 and a half minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. uh, but, uh, you know, it turns out that their SPML support is very much lagging, and uh, it's problematic. And also, they won't import other SPMLs um, in, in some situations. And and yet, it's basically the first or second most popular <coughs> tool in, in this area. So, and we don't. I mean, there's no. You can't. There's no stick, right? With, with, there's well, no stick big enough to be. Put the that stick away and let's, let's get because out of the carrot. They're the most popular. They already have the popularity. So, and the carrot is well. Well, that. we could adapt the standard to meet their user, but, but that would be a real. So you, I think also the carrot is dangerous. I mean, I would like to see as many tools as possible supporting SBML and SPGN. But if we really make such a matrix and come up with three or four tools which maybe at the end support SBML, then any funding agency in the future will say, oh, how many tools support actual SBML? Oh, only four worldwide, that's not much. Why should we fund further development in this? Mm -hmm. right? yeah. They tried to use SBML and it didn't work for whatever reason. That's not good either. Lucian, I think your hand was yeah. for a long time. I'm I think one important thing, and that would be easy just for, for the somewhat, somewhat non-compliant tools to implement, would be to warn users to have something to say, OK, this model has algebraic rules. I don't support them. And like display that to the user. And that's hard. I mean, you can't put that in the test suite in an automatic way. But it, that's where, that's where like, some 
curated tool validation or whatever compliance testing could could really sort of pay off if you said it, it, would, be, it would be nice to sort of go to the test suite and say, okay, these you can say these are the tags we don't support. But then, furthermore, at least we could at least say there, if you don't support a tag, you should always tell the user that when you see it, and then provide an easy way for them to notice if the model has that a situation where that tag is true. Um, and then, furthermore, if we could somehow like actually like test it and look at it and see the message, then that would be another another step forward. Okay, so one, one possible is to be listed on your website, uh, they have to run the test suite, and they have to submit the results to you. And according to the results, you categorize them on a level. You kind of level. That would be one way, sort of being you know, one, two, three. <laughs> so because some, some tools, they support only you know, low level, maybe useful, but they have a wonderful device. It's still listed there. And we know it supports this minimal amount of money. You got all the hands to go. <laughs> no, <it's better. laughs> so ben, I think you were first, though. So. I think the ideal case could be if we could find a, some middle way. I mean, the problem is, like, it would be unfortunate if we have only end up with only five tools supporting SPML. On the other hand, it's unfortunate to have 300 tools where 200 don't work. <laughs> um, so, so I would be happy with having somewhere a list where with tools that you can actually download, you can install them on one today used operating system, and if you start them, they can import the SPML file and do something with it. I mean, that would probably already create down the list a little bit. And you can still have one list that's sortable by that yeah, criteria, so you can sort by active. We know, know it's valid because text. you don't want to have to go through 250 links to find the tool you want. Right. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, the test suite doesn't quite work for that because not all of the tools actually are suited. Right. right. It would work for the 50 that are. Okay, have different test suite. Have different and, levels of test suite. Um, and for what's that? In the, in the matrix currently, we have like a tiny dot when, whenever they we know that a tool was recently active or their website or whatnot. What we can do is split that up into like two tables. This is the list of the ones that we currently know is, is, is working, and then there's the ones that you know that have been working, but right now uh, we don't no current conversion. So, right. so we, we talked about doing that, and uh, well, as you know, I, we haven't done it because we've since been working on providing a better interactive interface that allows people to sort the list by criteria. So that kind of goes towards this where you can, I'm not sure how we will distinguish. But really, the naive users never do that. Well, yes, they I go to the page and they look at the list. That's all that's going to happen. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, right, right. If, you want the, if you want to stop the list on your site, there has to be a flag in the software. And you run it, <coughs> lists all the things they support. <laughs> and then you will know what the is. Well, I, I think self-reporting is okay for all these things. I mean, we, they, they think they support it. I mean, yeah. I mean, all right, actually, so final is question. That something oh, you could, sorry, Paul? Is that something you could crowdsource? You know, like self-reporting, and then if you use yeah, a Yeah, you can have you like, reviews. Have reviews. <laughs> <laughs> you can reviews, right? Could we have public reviews? Yeah, but like that gets into all the other things. Other things. Other things. Maybe not on the Amazon. You immediately get that. Do you want to say something, Paul? I mean, just you know, keep in mind too. You you have different classes of end users. You know, you have very computer science focused people for whom these ciphers are pretty trivial. You have way down end users who just use somebody else's packages. But then you have kind of the really big middle of you know people who are mathematicians or engineers or people who don't have that CS background who can't just write a validator. XML parsing is non-trivial for them because they have no just have C plus to implement algorithms and be dangerous, but not enough to you know import vastly interdependent you know, libraries and things, especially across platforms. So I mean, and, and, they, and they want to reinvent the wheel as well. We have these the, the problem is those people have enough knowledge that they want to reinvent the wheel as well. Yeah, and that's why they end up doing it rather than using a tool that already does. It. Right, but you have to be careful. I mean, if, if you want them to come on board, I mean, you have to be able to um, say, I support the sub chunk here, without saying, oh, yeah, I have to integrate, I have to support all of SPML, which means somehow I have to write them a package that can support every single kind of model under the sun, which is, well, basically, now you've just rewritten, you know, a compiler or MATLAB or something. 
you know, instead of say I've rewritten ODE 45 or I've rewritten a level set solver or something, you know, like that. You know, once you start saying you can't, you can't, you know, it's like all or nothing. You're you're going to be in trouble with the people who are kind of in the middle. I think. Well, that's exactly the problem right now. Yeah. Those are the people. That's the problem. The majority of papers that are the problem are papers that have models in MATLAB or also a very large class papers that never even say what they use to simulate mm -hmm. and that there is no electronic version available. Those are really the biggest problem. Mm -hmm. And okay. there's still too, far too many of those papers, maybe even the majority. Um, and, there's not, and there's not much mm -hmm. you can do other than to say to people, and I think that's where any editor of any journal doesn't require anything to refuse that paper and say, if you don't provide us with what you use, Sorry, you could have written question. your program in assembly. For God's sake, you need to supply it. Mm -hmm. If you don't do that, then this is what you're describing is completely <laughs> unreproducible. It's like saying, I've done some gels, but I don't want to show them to you. <laughs> All right, so, never get published. So last question, I bumped it. So <laughs> the last question that I had was, these were the areas that I thought the system synthetic biology community could coordinate their efforts. Are there other areas that I haven't brought up where there could be more coordination of efforts between systems that acknowledge just standard developers. Yes, let's go on. Yes, let's go on. <laughs> <laughs> Briefly. <laughs> still two minutes, so I'm good at making lists. <laughs> That's enough to keep us busy for a while. Everybody's hungry. Yes. All right, so thanks for all of the exciting discussion. I hope you still have some discussion energy left for Martin um, in the afternoon, or refill on your energy. We'll be back there. We'll continue after lunch. Thanks. <coughs> oh,
the performance of open gel is pretty even not a song. So let me make the following recommendation. Which is that every we start writing these tools to come up De de dealing with all the multi-cell <laughs> tool kits, okay, the visualization tool, because it's going to go right straight from the multi-cell XML or multi-cell HDF into the tool. Mm. Sure, sure. So we're not a tool development. We're still in specification. Well, I mean, eventually, they are. Yeah. I know, but the question is right now, get the spec first and then worry about the tools. I agree. When it comes to publication, we will need some basic tools. The other thing I was going to say, oh, another discussion. I think that last time I said that Because it's a wrap up and then there's a session. So I have an angle session. It is. Don't worry about it. So, what are you doing Wednesday? Uh, Next Wednesday? Uh, yeah. Wednesday? I'm giving the ITM science class. Uh, okay. Yeah, I, I, right now there's always things. Oh, there's something in the morning. Yeah, lunchtime. Yeah, so I'm giving a little bit of Paul's talk, a little bit of Edward's talk to catch Yeah. And I need some of your slides, and I slides, so cool. I mean, I talked for 25 minutes, so I can take a little bit more of yours and get it. Yep. Right, so let's get through the talk today. Sarah might have chocolate, but she didn't eat it all herself. Oh, greedy creature. <laughs> Are you teaching or? I almost promised. I promised. I Yes, I'm not going to have a good one. So I'm not going to have a good one. 
All right, uh, let's get started for the second to last session. Is that true? I think that's true. Last group, last group session, yeah. The last group session, and then after the break, more discussion. I think this is about community outreach and similar topics. So the first speaker for us will be Martin Golovetsky. Once again, telling us about combined activities and the great things he's been doing with uh, rounding up support for standardization. Yeah, thanks. So it's actually not uh, so much about what I'm doing, but what we all are doing and, and uh, how we can uh, go on and how, how we can proceed from this point and, and for the future of combined and what we can and should improve, how we can uh, maybe try to bring the standards to a different level. Uh, I try to give you for the discussion as an input a few ideas and a few background notes, what happened and uh, what is uh, already planned from different uh, sites. We have a project uh, that will start soon in Germany. Um, that I will briefly mention what the, the outline is there. So, yeah, I think I don't have to introduce myself. You all have seen the Savio Arcade talk, I hope. Um, just briefly, I'm from Heidelberg, Germany, uh, the Heidelberg Institute for Theoretical Studies. And um, today I want to um, introduce you why. Why it's so important that we that we combine the standards in a concerted action? I mean, an example from a, a completely different field is the Great Baltimore Fire of 1904. Um, that fire was so uh, horrible, and so many people killed. And um, I think 1,500 buildings or even more were destroyed. So the whole town was destroyed. Um, and what was the reason why, why this fire was so uh, so um, so severe? The, the consequences were so severe. The, the reason is that um, the fire brigades they had standards for their um, for their hose couplings, but each district of town had a, a different standard of the hose couplings, and so the fire brigades could not work together and. It was a chaos, and not to mention fire brigades from neighboring towns or from further away. So um, <coughs> actually, they could not efficiently work. And um, I think this, this shows nicely how important it is to, to really um, try to combine what we try here in our community, the different standardization approaches, because um, we might face a similar situation. 
um, when we now uh, see that the, the models that are that are set up are uh, getting bigger and bigger, so they grow, and it, um, very often it's a, a consortium effort that the model is set up, not a single PhD student or postdoc is setting it up, but really a whole consortium is setting it up. We had it, for example, in Germany with the Virtual River um, Network, where 250 people work together in order to to set up uh, a model that reflects different functions and, and uh, processes in the human liver. And you cannot do this without having standards. And um, when, when every sub-community has their own standard, um, how, how to work together? So, so you might end up in a uh, situation like this in an hour. Uh, what is a standard? So a standard is a document established by a consensus and approved by a recognized body. So it's not really defined what this body is, but uh, has to be some, uh, some institution, some body that, that um, recognizes the standard. <clears throat> and uh, uh, the standard, uh, this document should provide, um, sorry, uh, yeah, it should provide some information for comment and repeated use. Rules, guidelines, and characteristics for activities uh, or their results aimed at the achievement of the optimum degree of order in a given context. It sounds very bureaucratic, and I think it is, uh, because it's, it's the um, definition of a standardization body, so a bureaucratic uh, standardization body. Um, however, it, it contains a few. Uh, keywords that are important to mention. So it's, I, I mentioned already recognized body in this sense. So I think uh, in the, um, the opinion of ISO, the International Standardization Organization, of course, ISO is a recognized body. Um, and I think we can all agree on that. <clears throat> and uh, repeated use is also important. So uh, if, if um, this standard is only used once or by, uh, only applied by one tool, it's not really a standard. Um, guidelines, rules, and characteristics, that's also important uh, as keywords, but I think you are all aware of that in your, um, in your own standardization communities. And the context is, is um, also very important to mention because, uh, yeah, I mean, we, we had this discussion in the previous session uh, how, to have this, how to improve the interoperability. So, uh, for this, you need information on the context, for the metadata, for the uh, framework that uh, the whole thing is placed in. So, <clears throat> um, just to to uh, remind you that what we are at the moment working on is standard standards just for this uh, the right hand side of this picture, so just for the model and modeling and simulation. But uh, I think uh, not so much com combines at the Moment, currently not, not really um, dealing with uh, experimental data and standards for that, uh, unless it's uh, simulation experiments. <clears throat> so, um, but we have to keep in mind that, uh, uh, that there are also some interfaces to the experimental world. So that slide I borrowed from Nicola, uh, but I think it nicely summarizes um, that um, we have really. Um, Overlapping fields in the um, re research communities uh, we are all uh, embedded in, uh, and in these fields you have different standards to exchange data and uh, models and also metadata, and uh, very often these these might be overlapping. And I think one major goal of Combine is to to um, reduce these overlaps. And again, this was <laughs> discussed. Uh, or in detail in the previous session, but it, I mean the picture shows you how how um, diverse and how uh, complicated it gets when, when you try to to coordinate all that. And um, I, I know many of you have seen this slide before, but I think it nicely summarizes the situation. And uh, yeah, the, the outcome here is um, not actually the one that we want. That we now want to have. Another standard, unless it might be that we discussed um, just before lunch, um, a kind of a framework, um, meta standard, how to bring the different standards um, to 
in context to each other and how, how, how they interface to each other. Um, we also should not forget that, I mean, most of you are involved in the, re in the research communities, so you develop community standards or you're involved in the development, and you are also involved in applying them in your own research projects. But there's also a completely different field out there, that the industries, that um, usually is not so keen in being involved in the setting up of standards, but uh, for reusing uh, data and models coming from the research community, they, they, they really want to, um, to apply these standards and to uh, have the data in, in standardized formats that uh, really they can integrate and remix and, and uh, do whatever they want to make, out, to make money out of this. Um, and I think most of you might have some industrial partners, and so you are aware of this um, of this problem. But I think we should keep it in mind. And at the moment, I think the industrial world is not so much represented here in the combined community. Uh, maybe now, as well, there are a few companies uh, involved, uh, but it's I think it was about the software development. Uh, side, but not, not so much the application side. Uh, but still, I think um, you, you see a certain progress in that, that direction. Then a third um, player that we haven't discussed at this meeting, but we we had a brief discussion and also a presentation from a representative, a representative of Dean uh, in Paris at a combined meeting in Paris last year. Um, so it's the standardization bodies like ISO, I mentioned in the beginning ISO, the International Standardization Organization. You also have uh, some more regional um, uh, standardization bodies like in Europe, the CEN, or uh, national ones like in Germany we have the DEAN. You, you might know the A4 format, that's the DEAN standard actually. Um, so these, these Standardization bodies, they promote, they, they, they help to define and promote standards. So they have a, uh, um, they have a uh, yeah, publishing uh, uh, machinery behind and, and everything, and they have contacts worldwide. And so uh, I think they have very well set up uh, infrastructure for promoting and defining standards. Uh, and they have also um, defined rules how a standard can be uh, defined and agreed upon in, in the worldwide community or in the local community for the national and local um, standardization bodies. So um, I mentioned that in Germany uh, we we have um, applied for and will probably start working on a project called Normsys. Uh, <coughs> of September, hopefully, in those right. Um, and the, the, the aim of the project is the identification of existing community standards, classification of the standards based on their possible scope of application. Um, then, from this information, setting up a registry for modeling standards and systems quality. So, it's a matrix of key features and scope of applications. Um, then we might try to set up a proof of principle certification strategy, but more on the bird's eye view, not really for a single standard, or really uh, it's a framework uh, for selected standards that needs to be defined. <coughs> and then, of uh, course, evaluation of the standardization options. Uh, so how, how can we uh, maybe profit uh, from contact to standardization bodies like ISO or others um, to improve the standards and uh, widen the community. Um, I just mentioned community, so community building of course is a big topic in this uh, context because you cannot do all these tasks without the com community behind it. Um, so the community means re research industries, startups, uh, standardization bodies. Um, this is not a comprehensive list, so there might be more stakeholders that are uh, important, but I think these are the key stakeholders for this. <laughs> um, in the end, uh, we 
want to try, uh, um, or we want to define a, a concept, how is the best way to transfer these grassroots standards that we all develop here in the community to maybe really um, normative standards that are approved by uh, recognized bodies. I mean, I, I would consider combined already as a in, within the community as a recognized body. So I think that might be the first step that combined as an approval process uh, when a new standard wants to join. And uh, we had some discussions when uh, recently ESPO joined, and there are some some um, key points the standard has to um, to follow that it can be accepted as a combined standard. Uh, ESPO did it now. Um, others are pending at the moment, um, so or, or tr waiting for. We are waiting for the application also. Um, yeah, but uh, that might only be a first step. There might be a second step that involves also the uh, recognized standardization bodies on the national, um, European, and international level. So these are the partners that we at least we are. Uh, doing a scientific coordination of this project, and their partners from the academic world in the, at the University of Potsdam and a uh, um, startup company in Berlin. Um, I just want to mention uh, to, to, uh, yeah, to talk a bit about the standardization bodies. I already mentioned them several times now, but which are these standardization bodies? So in the States here, we have uh, ASTM or NIST. Or ANSI uh, standardization bodies in Europe, I mentioned already CEN or the national ones like DEAN. And then worldwide, I think the most commonly uh, accepted standards are from ISO. And as all the standards that we develop here in the combined community are uh, meant to be used uh, worldwide, internationally, I think. Um, it only makes sense to do all this, uh, this um, normative process to, 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 to discuss this only in a context like ISO, but not really on a more national level. I think that really doesn't make sense in a national level. <clears throat> how, how these standardization bodies work? So you have committees um, on the international level, ISO, and then you uh, mostly have mirror committees on the national level. And um, the national committees, they send delegates to the international committees. And at both ends, you, you have uh, working groups or task groups that deal with more specific tasks that, and that are part of a more broader um, um, <coughs> of a committee with a broader focus. Um, for example, uh, there's the committee uh, for biotechnology, and then this breaks down into different uh, task groups. I will uh, have a slide on that uh, later on. Yeah. Um, to define a, um, a new international standard, in this case it's an ISO uh, standard, <laughs> there's a very complicated and long procedure to follow. So um, you first define a new work item proposal where you have an outline what you want to standardize. <coughs> and you make an initial inquiry, uh, internal draft. Uh, always um, you have some, some uh, defined waiting times that uh, should give all the standardization bodies that are uh, involved in this internationally um, and all the delegates and all the experts um, in the on a national level, the chance to, to, to check and, and reply to these drafts. Then there's the first international inquiry, uh, in, inquiry um, and the second one, and so on. And you see uh, from the timings here, it's, it's a process that doesn't take really weeks or months, but rather years, I guess. And um, it's really something that we have to consider uh, when we think of uh, maybe um, bringing combined standards to another level. Uh, but you have also other means that are below this level of an ISO standard that gets proved as this uh, ISO standard. Um, so, I mean, these standards then uh, have, of course, the advantage that you, you have a source of technical know how that reflects the state of the art, but only the state of the art 
when the standard was defined and it's more rigid and not so flexible anymore. Um, you have other uh, advantages, but the disadvantage is that it's really um, uh, very rigid. Um, the, the other way to do this is uh, yeah, publishing specs, specifications, um, by the help of these standardization bodies. And these are much more flexible because they are uh, uh, considered as the starting point for innovation, and so uh, it's really speeding up uh, uh, the, the standardization process. And um, um, yeah, they are. It can be also considered as precursor for international uh, knowledge uh, standards. But they are still international, and international can be internationally used. But they are much more flexible. So you, you see, I just wanted to give you an example that there are different ways to 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 do this in a formal way, um, but I don't want to go into details here because it's, I think, uh, uh, not so interesting to, to, to talk about all the details. I rather want to, 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 to highlight the advantages and disadvantages. So um, for a real norm uh, that is approved in this months or year long, long process, you have um, high level of acceptance because um, the you potential uh, Users they they can trust that this standard standard is, is uh, there for um, for many years um, and and, and uh, won't change uh, so often. Uh, that means you have great economic benefits and it's very efficient. And um, the downside of it is that it's tedious and bureaucratic uh, in the normalization process itself. And uh, yeah, that might be yeah problem really. Um, for the specifications. They are quickly available because you don't need the full consensus uh, from all the standardization parties worldwide. Um, so a minimal process is only required there. Um, they are effective and flexible, and they even might be considered as a first step to later on then go really to a real norm. I mentioned already the field of biotechnology that is. Um, the roof, I would say, for what we are doing here. Um, you have um, in, on an international level now an ISOTC, so TC stands for Technical Committee, um, that deals with all the standards in the field of biotechnology and all the um, corresponding fields. And this is currently consisting of um, five, uh, sorry, four different subcommittees, one dealing with terms and definitions, one dealing with biobanks and bioresources, one dealing with analytical methods, and one dealing with bioprocessing. You might miss here some more computational um, fields, and you're right. Um, and uh, in Germany, we yeah, we found that uh, problem, and that's why we, uh, on a national level, already formed a fifth um, task force for data processing and integration. and um, yeah, so uh, th we started to work now in June, uh, and I was uh, elected as, a, uh, as the chairman of this uh, national committee. And currently, so we already applied for um, forming a task group on an international level from the German um, delegates uh, of the ISO TC. <coughs> um, and currently, we are, uh, we are um, processing all the needed documents to to have this formal uh, process going. And um, uh, I think uh, within the next few months, um, um, there might be an international task force for data processing and integration um, based on the German application for that. And uh, I'm together with other delegates of Germany are really pushing this on the international level now that we have their more influence. So the ITC itself for biotechnology uh, has 20 participating countries and currently nine, uh, 13 observing countries. Observing countries, they don't have a voting right, but they can be at the, um, at the meetings and they can discuss at the meetings. But <clears throat> you don't really, uh, they, they don't have the right to vote uh, when it comes to voting for any new uh, task force for any topic for any new standard whatsoever. <clears throat> so now 
back to combine after all this administrative things. <clears throat> Here in the combined community, how, how we want to proceed now, um, how we want to coordinate the different combined standards, how we want to certify the port of standards provided by the tools, what form of organization should we choose for combined? Is the current form OK, or should we change this? <clears throat> How to organize the governance? I mean, we mm. have one at the moment, but uh, is it really the one that people accept? Mm. How we want to publish the standards? And uh, I think most importantly, how we want to convince the communities out there, outside of the combined, to apply these standards. So the first two points, how to coordinate the standards and how to certify support, um, I think we discussed this already in the previous session, but much in detail. Um, so, I mean, we, we still can uh, uh, discuss this further if you like, but uh, I think we also should discuss the other points. Um, so, what form of organization? Um, at the moment, it's more a voluntary association here. So should we consider building a society, trust, whatever? Um, and connected to this, also um, uh, organization form. I mean, that's more of a, a, a formal organization form, but an internal organization, the means of communication. I mean, we have mailing lists and so on, uh, but should we not maybe consider other means of communication to improve the collaboration here? Um, if, if you want to mention anything on these points, uh, either you can say it now or we can just discuss it later. Yeah. Uh, just very briefly as a data point. So the, the BioJava, BioPel, BioPython guys, yeah. uh, they set up a, a foundation, a not-for-profit in the US. Yeah. Uh, and that allowed them to do things like have funding from sponsors go to the foundation rather than to an individual bank account or an individual university. And it meant they could hire a lawyer for if there were ever IP issues. Okay. Yeah, that, that might be something to consider, I guess. Uh, but this is on a national national level, right? Uh, so the the BioStar projects are, are international by nature, but the not-for-profit is registered in the US. Okay. Any and, uh, the first question would be, what, what are the points we are unhappy with the current situation? Are there points where we are unhappy that we... Yeah, I mean, that's, that's really... That's, a, that's well, I think... Are you... Are you no, 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 there will be other points, but I, I just wanted to give uh, people the opportunity to direct comment on that. Uh, but I also put first, I mean, whatever is lightweight and doesn't use a lot of money just for setting up is, is I mean, mandatory, I would say. <coughs> Foundations are used in also synthetic biology. There's the Biopolis Foundation. So creating, um, there's also in, there's also a Biodesign Automation Foundation that was formed for supporting workshops and, and the efforts. So, Something like that may be worthwhile just to create some organization like they can collect money and can organize events. Yeah, we can get non profit status and get donations, then you might be able to fund the certification efforts that there may be some applies to fund some users. So, I really have questions before me. My question was, uh, was going to be, I mean, you talked about ISO, but there's another obvious standards organization for the type of things we do, which is the w WPC. Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, that could be another way. And I think there have been, maybe this is where Mike can come in, there have been some early on some inquiries or something like this about what we're, what we're, we're trying to see if there was any area in the WPC, but they don't really address uh, the main specific um, specialized standards, I think, as, 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 as 
So, uh, so I think these by objects, for example, that's part of the W3C that, that is organized on the W3C. I believe so. Um, so maybe that's I'm not sure, but I believe so. Question that you must just might just know, I don't. Um, these com um, companies like BIN or ISO, are they non profit or are they profit? No, no, they are non profit. You sure? So they are not like nature or science? I mean, like no, they are not profit. companies. I mean, they, they, they I have to, but they sell, have to say they sell their standards. They sell their standards, they sell their standards <laughs> they sell their but there, there are ways that standards are free. Uh, I mean, I think it's very complicated uh, the structure they have. So some standards you have to pay, some others are free. Yeah, I know that you have to pay, but are they non-profit companies or are they profit companies? They are non-profit. But, but for example, so is the American Chemical Society, and they're renowned for being one of the most aggressive commercial entities out there, even though they're non-profit. Yeah. Also, for example, trying to lock down use of um, of this uh, chemical. Um, Idea that they that they have what is called um, in, in, uh, no, in, yeah. cast. Yeah. Another example is PNML, the Paper Network language. This is a DIN standard, yeah. and you can only obtain the specification by buying it from DIN. So in this yeah, we should yeah. definitely this avoid. Is, I, I, yeah, I think that that's something that definitely uh, should not happen because mm. I mean everybody here and also other people involved in the different standards in combined. Uh, they spend their own time. Sometimes it's in, in not paid uh, leisure time. They spend on uh, developing the standards. Um, all the institutions and projects they spend a lot of money there, a lot of effort there. So uh, I, th I think it cannot really be uh, uh, a model uh, to to head it into organizations like ISO or Dean, and then they make money out of this. You no, know, I think that definitely won't be. Uh, Option. I think we all agree on that. I, I hope. What's the advantage? Nice. The advantage is that they have really a broad acceptance, mm -hmm. way beyond uh, our current user um, community. And um, <laughs> when, I, when I look around in, in, in a project, I mean, we're doing, uh, we are responsible for the data management for this virtual liver project I just mentioned in the beginning of my talk. And uh, I would say probably the majority, at least a big number of, of, of modelers, uh, are not using any standards for setting up their models. So they, they are hard, they are really they are coding them in MATLAB without having even not group internal standards. So so when a post of leaves or when a PhD student leaves, uh, then. I think maybe the model might be lost and, and nobody could, could recover. Uh, the but making an ISO standard would make them all of a sudden start using it? I don't think it's the cause and effect. <clears throat> well, it's, uh, it's broadening, broadening the, the acceptance because um, you can have a stamp, you say uh, it's ISO 1234, and uh, tools can claim they are ISO 1234 approved, and uh, so. Especially in an industrial setup, this this this, this helps a lot. Uh, maybe not so much for research. Um, I don't know, but definitely um, more people would uh, would consider using that. I mean, you saw that for other uh, standards in other fields too. I might hear the session, Sherry. You just jump right in. <laughs> <laughs> you the really? session chair. Think over. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the so two things. One is that I still, although you're right that it wouldn't help the students uh, or you know people working in labs. I think having the uh, the, the stamp of approval from an international organization like that would help. It kind of gives uh, credibility and legitimacy to an effort, so that industrial. Um, or commercial efforts are more likely to, if they if they had any interest at all in the area, would more likely to support a particular um, format. So there are there are probably some value, there's probably some value to that. However, I think the more going back to your question about the um, 
the organization. Are we going to jump around uh, so you would see this? Uh, the thing about making us a, uh, let's say, a nonprofit or a trust or something where we have people who are paid to do this is the question how are you going to fund it? Right? Because we probably don't have enough people here that if everybody gave five dollars, let's say, you still wouldn't have enough to, mm. to fund the effort. You need uh, you know, thousands and thousands of people. So where where would the money come from for to put to keep the organization going? I guess since I'm the chair, I will ask Sven now what, <laughs> what his question was. An organization that actually does something keeps funded. I mean, you're just setting up a society that is not for profit. I mean, that happens in North Germany that is done within one or two days and it costs nothing for 50 bucks or something. Oh, so, so a non set, I mean, if, if the reason is having um, a dress for tax reasons where people can put money in and get the tax refund from that and so on, that would be easy. At least in some countries. But you have to say that this, this, this requires also some formal structure. You need a threshold, you need a, yeah, yeah, you need all this around. So it's not yeah, just yeah. setting up and then saying, oh, now we have a body. No, but you also have to have people who take these votes. Comparatively lightweight, if you don't give them any extra job. I mean, if they don't have to organize conferences or so, they just have to set up the structure, it can be done. I mean, I've done that for. Like a cultural society, or so that is comparatively easy to do. But um, I mean, it doesn't achieve much. It would not do anything. It would be just a structure that has non-profit and could get money, could take money, and use the money according to its uh, agenda or something that has to be approved by the government to be tax exempt. But I mean, that is that is just that tiny aspect of being able to accept and distribute money without with a tax-free status in Germany. I think yeah, it's, it's, it's similar. It's more complicated <coughs> probably in the U.S. because I was involved in those youth soccer or youth sports team. Mm -hmm. So, for example, uh, certain things is tax deductible, but not everything, right? Mm -hmm. so, yeah, so, it's, so if you pay membership, I'm not sure it's a, in a very gray area because you pay membership, that may not be tax deductible because this will fund you again to go to a meeting, for example. Then everybody will just pay the membership and then fund yourself to go to the meeting, and yeah. that's, that's not great. allowed. Yeah. No, that's not allowed. That's <laughs> okay. So there are rules. So yeah. there are loopholes you know, people from. It's, it's a good idea, but they will say no. You cannot be. You know, beneficiary of your own donation, right? So you need to get the money from outside, like a That's company right. or something, and then you can use it. So I, I don't want to advise doing that. I would yeah. say that just setting up some legal <laughs> structure would probably be manageable. So it's what right. is the this? What the purpose it's is to to purpose. have an entity that you can receive donations, donations so that you can fund. Workshops. Not only for donation, but also to there work. Is an address uh, where, where, where people from outside of the community can refer to. I mean, at, at the moment, you, you don't have. I mean, you, you have the, the, the coordination team, so you can contact the coordinators and so. Um, but you don't have a formal frame for that. I mean, uh, I think it can be, as I said, quite lightweight, to my opinion. But I, I, I think. I think it's, it's the community who uh, yeah. decided that. But so let me finish you my follow-up question. Basically, what you want, if I understand correctly, no, I, I may not understand correctly, you want an organization that will be same people designated to answer questions or to do reach out outreach purposes. And these people may be paid by these uh, by the by the by the organization, right? And so that they can have designated time and resource to do some kind of outreach and organization work. That, that would be the ideal situation. Okay. Yes. Uh, but um, even when when you won't have enough funds to have this situation, yeah. still you would have a kind of a frame, um, an address. Um, um, you, it might be easier to get some funding for collaboration right. projects. It might be easier to get some funding for meetings. Yeah. 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 So, 
Justin then Augustine. Um, so, so I am a lawyer. I have a background <laughs> in setting up some of these organizations. So this is a good start where you can have a company that's an association that's not incorporated, it's not an LLC, and you can have a bank account. You can call yourself a company and you can do things. So you're going to distinguish that from a nonprofit that could give a tax deduction for contributions or a nonprofit that is at the level sufficient for governments to give money through certain programs, which often requires a, this higher level of uh, scrutiny by the government to get a 501c3 type. And that's expensive and cumbersome even for people who do it a lot. And so you you know, you want to think carefully about when you go to that elaborate sort of thing. And then in between, you have other legal structures. You have a very simple LLC or a very simple corporation, which in a sense is, I think, what Sven was suggesting, where you may not be trying to get 501c3 status that allows you to get tax, to give tax deductible uh, status to donations, but you can still accept donations. In other words, if you're a nonprofit, people can give you money. And you can put it right in your pocket, so long as you're not, so long as you're not getting a benefit from the government by your status. So in other words, that it's that tax deductibility of the donation that is what triggers that extra level of burden to qualify your corporation. So um, this is probably going to be a very naive question because I don't know that much about grants, but. Um, from what I understand, like normally with grants, the institute that you work for gets a, a component for administration fees or something. So is it possible within grants that uh, a small portion of the grant can be moved to a secondary institute that would be some standards group? So it could be, if you know the grant is dealing with SBML and you've said, I'm going to be using SBML, can a small portion of it be contributed to an organization set up to handle SBML and for the various other Only if it's a university, a non-profit, 501c3, etc. So um, subcontractors or subcontractors of grants have to have certain status. Yeah. So a person could not, could not do that. But that also would, would require that the PIs of those grants would, would put that money aside. Yeah. That, <laughs> which is probably the biggest impediment. <laughs> it almost seems like if you really want to do it, on a grant, you say you're going to purchase a support contract from SPML or whatever. But again, that'll be like the first thing that a review body will say to cut from your budget. Yeah. But to me, if I but say that I have a bike as a collaborator, probably I have a better yeah. chance to get it. But then you do, do it through Caltech. Caltech. Yeah. But you do it through Caltech. Yeah. yeah. So and then, and then review because that has to be a legal entity and it's Caltech that is an approved one. What we would want is SPML or to be able to apply for its own grants. Yeah, but then you need to have a, then you need yeah. to be a 501c3. Yeah, yeah. right. Good. <coughs> what we need to keep in mind, I think, is uh, sustainability. Also, um, I know that Nicola in previous meetings always <coughs> mentioned uh, and even complained about that it's too much dependent on single persons. I mean, I think all, all of them, you and Nicola. And, I just named uh, uh, you two as an example, not comprehensively, but uh, many people um, do great work. But I mean, when we think 10 years ahead or in, in further ahead, how, how this can be carried on? And I think uh, an organizational structure might, might help them. So another option is to join uh, with another existing. Organization that's close enough and does something. So not make their own, but I mean, yeah, it has a lot of dangers. Yes, that's true. I agree, but so there would have to be exactly the right kind of organization out there, and I'm not sure there, there is. I don't think that company. I mean, something like open bar. <laughs> but, but I don't see where setting up an organization is going to do away with the problem of having a few people having to work. Because that organization will still need a few people to to lead it. Organizations don't. Have a life on their own. They 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 are moved by the people that work for them. Yeah. So that that's not a solution. I mean, a lot of software projects have foundations. They create foundations, and that's mostly for the purpose of owning the copyright. Um, you know, so you know, there's a KDE foundation. There's uh, all sorts of different foundations out there of, of various projects. 
software projects. So and I don't know what the legal status of, for them is, but I think the majority of the interest is really to own the copyright. So actually, that's an interesting point. Uh, does ESPO have anything? Do you have any policy about the copyright? Who owns the copyright to the to who uh, controls the copyright to the specifications, if anyone? Copyright laws are made open and free as possible. But, uh, so are, since most of you guys worked on it under under your universities, and if you go read your your uh, employment contracts, the copyright belongs to your university. So. That's very yeah. Just go check your your. Oh, they don't try to check everything. If job. we were trying to make money no, off of them, they would have no, went well, As long as you're giving it away, they, I mean, like we give away software, and yeah. as long as we weren't try, ever trying to make money off it, then but, it gets more tricky. But, similar, but it's still their copyright, right? All of the, all but of the actually, with the original ESPL documents, we published them on the BBFR, BB Biobricks Foundations now, website as requested if, comments. If it is considered a, a um, academic publication, then most universities in their employment contracts also wave away the copyright to those. So if you write a book, your university allows you to keep the copyright. But not for software. Uh, but it's it is. It's very odd. But it's but this is this is a bit of course it's different from university to university. But I know that I mean back in two thousand and one or something there was somebody did a lot about did a lot of this about competition at, at Berkeley. Looked at a lot of the um, you know, the employment contracts and the status for software that you would write and all not. This is not it's not clear. I think a uh, similar issue exists for all of the standard specifications, probably set ML, SPG, and all of those. Yeah, we have a similar. It's, it's unclear. We don't have anything on the statements on the on, for example, SPML, but we probably should. So on SPG, I think we do, right? In a spec, in area where we say this is coming out of the standard set. Not been up to anyone or anyone. Yeah, I would. I would. You don't. You may not have that authority to say that. The problem yeah. is, U.S. the employee of an institution doesn't don't have that authority. You would have to go to their intellectual property office and actually yeah. get released. Really not for publications. Sorry. No, not for publications. Yeah, it's published. It's published. And, and so, if you go that route, that whatever the proceeding is, because like because that. otherwise we would have an enormous trouble. Does That's why they recognize that because we publish so much and our career depends on publishing, they give us. Free reign to transfer the copyright to Elsevier and others like that. <laughs> so we actually have free reign to come up and say this is uh, kind of Creative Commons, which we do every time we send a paper to BMC, for example. Yeah. All it takes is to publish these things, by the way. Send them to a journal, that's it. It's not <coughs> copyright. That's interesting. At that point. So I, I have a follow up on that, but Spen had it at the end of the well, one more question to come up. If, if we want to get one of these standardization organizations involved by ISO 14, do they, do they have any prerequisites about having control over the copyright, or do they get to vote on content of the document? Do they lose some control? ISO does. So I think in a standard way, uh, they might have, but there are ways to work around these. We, we would have to elaborate that. Uh, so, and is there, if there is then probably a committee within ISO or DIN that will eventually then decide, oh, that can be done like this or it cannot be done like this? Do we decide who goes into that committee or who gets our, I mean, I would not like to lose the control of this community here over the exact specifications of the documents we have. I think that, that is the absolute uh, pre-requirement for everything that uh, the, the control over the specifications should remain in the hands of um, the corresponding communities here. Um, you could consider uh, some other models that you have a core that is more fixed. So the, the existing community here uh, says, OK, this is a core, and this we submit now as, um, as a standard to ISO or another organization. And um, this core then can be extended and, and further developed. Uh, so, so there's a, a, a certain base uh, coverage then by, by this core. So this might be a model. N another model uh, might be that we check for this uh, bypassing routes to 
to have something else than the regular thing that they just take it and publish it and you have to buy it. I mean, that, that should not be an option for anybody. So, for, in the example of SPL, we could basically give level two, we could give to ISO since we do not expect any changes anymore, so all that is settled, they can keep that. <laughs> and the ones that we actually work with and that we want to be able to change without they having to agree with, I mean, that we couldn't. I mean, it would be difficult to. I mean, it needs to be, uh, we, we need to really check the details when we say, okay, let's work to go that way. Um, then we would have to check the details if, if this is possible, I think. Uh, it was only an idea to um, to decouple this to, to keep hands on the full development cycle. That if you have a core, you have to change it in another. I think it's it's all about um, so the, the the major reason for 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 uh, involving these organizations is to widen the community. I mean, we're not talking about um, acceptance. In your groups, in, uh, in your projects, we are talking about the acceptance outside of this world. And uh, to our experience with the projects where we do data management for, it, it is that uh, most people don't care about the current standards. But when you have a more formal standard, then far, uh, the, the funders, they, they will recognize it much more. Then they could put more pressure on the people um, when they um, when they uh, when they have calls for, for proposals that uh, the proposal should contain um, standards. Uh, then uh, it might be easier to convince the journals um, accepting this um, and so on. I mean, there, I think there are many advantages you could uh, you could uh, take off when you have to have a more formal way and not just. But I mean, it is already quite formal in the community that you have to follow your boards and so, but it's more the, the internal process. But to the external world, it's more a grassroots. Uh, yeah. But I, I would still argue that, in my opinion, ISO would be the wrong body. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm just looking at their page on Wikipedia and it says, presumably this is what, how they define themselves as, it's an organization that promotes worldwide proprietary industrial and commercial standards. And we are not proprietary, not industrial, and not commercial. <laughs> and the W3C, I'm not trying to say, you know, the W3C has lots of issues too, but, but at least they are defined as the main international standards organization for the world wide web. At least you could say that since we do XML, <laughs> Which, by the way, it's a standard I believe that they publish. Yeah. Um, but I, what I about Oasis? Another option. Oasis is for, for software, right? Open software? Well, so they manage like the, the open doc stuff that the, <coughs> the yeah. open office uses. So they have fingers in document standards. Which you could argue we are. Yeah. Or a terrible name because there's too many Oasis in Wikipedia. <laughs> I'm not, not surprised that they claim this because uh, I know that ISO they develop uh, standards um, well mainly for but not exclusively um, for um, for the industries but that they uh, develop <coughs> industrial standards and commercial standards uh, so um, it was not claimed uh, from their side yet so. Um, but I think uh, before going that route, uh, that needs to be defined. Yeah. So, what else do you have? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sure. Okay. Um, how to organize the governance? I think the current model works, in my uh, understanding, well. Uh, that one delegate from each standard, or also user community, I mean, I'm representing all the user community out there, uh, but. Um, so uh, we have from, from each standard uh, one delegate that represents the standard in the uh, governing board at the moment. Um, with this size we have now, I think now we have seven, seven coordinators. 
um, that might work. But when more and more standards join, that might become difficult. Um, another option would be an elected board um, voting across the whole combined community. The downside of this, I think I'm your question. Um, the downside of this, yeah, obviously, would be that um, there might be some standards not represented uh, then when you have elections. I mean, at the moment, nobody from the Selmer community is here around. So when we now would have a vote, um, I guess um, I would be quite sure that nobody from the Selmer community would be voted. So it's quite dangerous, I think, when some standards are underrepresented in the coordination team. Um, connected to this, um, how the contact uh, between the combined coordinators and the editors of standards should be um, organized. Is it sufficient as it is now, or do you see other needs? But I think Frank had a question. No, it was more comment, um, and it's basically the same comment as I already hit to the question if we should be a charity or whatever. Uh, what are we unhappy at the moment, or are we unhappy? And also, we have to maybe see what at the moment the com combined coordinators are doing. They are not a formal body who decides anything. They're basically running the web page and building, at the moment at least, a kind of a, of a hub where the connection comes together, or the, the, the communication comes together. But it's not more. There are no decisions made within um, in the sense of that it influences the standards, the only decisions they made if there are more than one person or more than one group applying for if in combined at a specific place that they discuss this. The question here is the same basically as I had to the previous one. What is the aim? What shall this body do? Do we need really something else? And if we need something else, then I think it's worth to discuss what we would like to have. But to, to, be, to, to have this discussion, we should first really find out where, where do, there is some lack, lack at the moment, what, what are the places or the, the issues where we are unhappy with the current situation. Yeah. I think this discussion um, is somehow missing, at least for me. Um, I mean, there are general things like we would like to have more outreach, but I think that's not for this governance body. Maybe just a small comment. I think I said at the beginning that I think at the moment it works well, but I, I, I think it's, it's important that the community agrees. And, and when anybody sees a problem with the court structure, I wanted to give people the, the opportunity to, to raise their hand and say, mm -hmm. well, I, I would rather go for this and that structure. I think that's fair enough. So, Sven had a question, and who are you than me? So, yeah, I think that is exactly the question. What is what is the problem that we need to solve? And I would say the problem is that things might not go on like they went the past in the near future. Um, if we just go on, I mean, that is the, for me, the problem. I mean, if I look at the situation right now, I mean, I could, in principle, it worked nice over the last 10 years. Uh, I mean, several new projects came and we come together and we meet here, meeting is nice, productive, everything works fine. I mean, for that, we didn't need any ISO, we didn't need any foundation, and so on. Problem is that there is indications that it might not just work exactly the same way over the next five years. Um, because maybe also some personal, maybe, change in the future. Some people who have been extremely important in the past may not continue indefinitely to organize all this stuff. Um, and we need a replacement for, or we need to have a, a plan in place in case <laughs> something goes wrong with the organization. Are so, so people continuing the all depends on the people at the end. And it's so really okay. important are you it. saying something that we don't know? Or <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, you, 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 the first half of my question is exactly your question. That is, what is the problem we have with combined? And do we have an issue? I think uh, one of the issues probably is, you know, how do we keep com com coming up funding to, to, to run combined, right? So the second question I have is, is if we have a question, whether this is going to solve that question. Solve that problem. I'm sorry, if we have a problem, whether this is going to solve the problem. It's similar to what 
you know, what you know is talking about. I'm, I'm getting confused. Are there some other elements in the room? That I <laughs> <laughs> right. If you know, that's the two, two things maybe <coughs> it's worth us to consider. It all. I mean, have the right approach and whether this is going to solve and how we can really use it. I, I don't see a problem. But you don't see it. But, but maybe other people do. And uh, I know that in other communities there were discussions like this. And that, that's why it's important to talk about that. Just okay. clarify, apparently I have confused people. I have no secret knowledge about that. <laughs> I just noticed that the past success was due to huge amount, I mean, due to people like Mike, and we don't know how long they will continue on that project. No secret that I've been doing this for, that I feel I've been doing this for too long, and it would be nice to have some fresher blood and new ideas. So I, I don't foresee doing this forever, I think is what, what uh, uh, However, I have not funded to do anything else at the moment, so I guess I'll, as long as <laughs> it just keeps being my job, this is what I'll keep doing. I'll the funders there. Um, but actually, uh, just to bring up a point that we don't have an elected board at the moment. I mean, it's sort of a, yeah. the current um, it's a self -elected board members, yes, self elect. So um, if there are some things we could change to make it maybe some rotated, some rotations like we do for the editorial boards, you know, we do it for. Yeah. A few years, we, we have a scheme for voting in New York. But that happens automatically. For other projects, but not, yeah, not the project. It's just that the, it's, it hasn't been, um, it hasn't been needed so far, and it hasn't been that much uh, to do with this. But maybe that's changing. So, so, um, so Mushin had his hand up uh, for some time, and then I guess you and I don't have your hand for that. <laughs> So, so I think one one thing that is an issue that a, an elected board or whatever an official board would could solve is that Combine doesn't have any organized vision. Um, it has sort of the collective let's sit around the room and chat about things, and then maybe it'll catch a particular board member's fancy, and then they'll try to go forward and do do something with that. Um, the the usefulness of a board is that it can set the vision for the group and say, let's try to become a standard, you know, and like, or let's definitely not try to become a standard or, or, or whatever. You know, they, they have the authority given to them by the community to sit down and hash out those issues. The other advantage, as sort of, as sort of alludes to what we've talked about, is that if you have specific terms, then people know when they're committed, and they know when they're rotating off, and they have a, de a deadline, <laughs> like I don't have to do this forever, I don't just sort of, I'm getting tired of it, so I slowly pull away and never officially retire or whatever. So like, and that's hugely useful for for keeping for keeping things energized. If, if you know, even if it, even if you know you have to do it for six years, that's still a deadline, right? And and it's and it's helpful to know, like, okay, I I can do this for six years or or Whatever. I think that's a good point. So um, I had recent experience with this as trying to understand what the combined coordinators were and what their organization mm -hmm. is. And I think if Nicholas were here, he would say that it's none of these three things right now. Um, that is, I thought it was the first one. And when I tried to say that I thought it was the first one, Nicholas told me it's not the first one. It's not one delegate from each standard. Um, it's it's something else. I'm not sure what how we would define it, but I thought it was one delegate from each. State. And because when I suggest when I was saying, well, if Espol were to join Combine, then Espol would have a delegate. He's like, not saying that not automatically that would be the case. So that isn't the rule. I think it would be nice if there is a rule. I'm okay with the first rule as long as it is the rule, just so that it's clear to the community as to how the community how the organization is structured. I think it's nice to have, to make sure, I wouldn't want to do elected because what if 
like er, there's many there's more SBML people than say ZML people, and then it's all SBML people. I think it's nice to have some guarantee that there's a representative from each combined standard on the on the committee, and so having some structure like that that's documented um, could be I think useful. And I think it's okay if we did. So with SBML, what happened was they um, Nicholas asked the editors, "Who do you want?" And I think that's okay that you want to. I don't think we necessarily have to have general elections. You should have some way of getting people. You could let each standard decide how to put people. So, so you would opt for uh, really delegates that are, that are voted from the editorial board or from the, the whole community of, let's say, SPGN votes for one delegate, SPML votes for one delegate. I, I would suggest, my personal suggestion would be that um, each standard has a delegate. And it's up to the standards community to decide how they choose the delegate. If they want to elect it amongst all of their members, that's fine. If they want to delegate it as a role from the editorial board, if they want it to be the chairman of their editorial board, if they, I mean, you can leave it to them. We can give them freedom to decide, but just that they get the right to put somebody there, and that the editorial board can decide how they want to do that. Just a small comment on that. Um, it's my work for the real defined. Um, Standards like SPG and SPO, SPML. Uh, it's a bit more found for uh, metadata or for what I represent the user community, the users. So that, how do you find this community and how to make it work? So maybe an, an addendum to that would be to have some at large members that are elected by the community. Yeah. And that might serve that role if you make sure that you try to. Find people that fill in needs. So Pedro, you wanted to say. Yeah, something. so a couple of things there. I mean, um, first of all, the for good of whether it's right or wrong, the web page for Combine says what Combine is, and it says that it is an initiative to coordinate the development of the various community standard forums. So, it's a entity to coordinate. Now, if that's wrong, they better change their web page. Because this is what the world will see. I mean, if you want to know what Combine is, you come to the web page, and that's what it says itself that it is. Now, you emailed some of the members of Combine and said something else. I'm not sure. Well, I didn't say that. I said that no, you said that people said that it wasn't to de delegate from each standard. The, the organization of the, the yeah. Combine Coordinators Committee. Yeah. But it, for example, it says, by doing so, it's expected that the federated projects, or also it says that it's a federation, which points to your structure, <laughs> by the way. Um, we'll develop a set of interoperable and non-overlapping standards covering all aspects of modeling and biology. No, 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 no. I'm talking about the combined coordinator's composition. So yes, that's so not described. No, no, no. You're his, right. His point is merely that um, you have the impression that is a that was a one-to-one -one mapping between yes. yeah. people, and, and, right. and the the thing is, it's not been one-to-one. -one. It's been a representative who may be involved in more than one standard. Right. right. So there was so the people had overlapping um, interests. Yeah. But uh, I think what Chris pointed to is a structure well known in this country and others as a federation, where you cannot just have small entities, entities that have small community, have less say than others, and that's why mm -hmm. in this country you have a senate rather than just the, the house. Or same thing in right. in Switzerland. Right, the vote has to gain majority, but also has to gain majority in each canton. So that's what the federation is, and it does even say in the page that it's a set of federated projects. So, so maybe, maybe the points the to the right way. The thing to do. So the tricky thing, not tricky, but the, um, the slightly awkward thing is there are so many associated standards, like like ten or something. So that would, if we do the one one, then I mean we're going to have a. We're going to have more people who are uh, elected coordinators than anything else. <laughs> <laughs> there will be more elected coordinators than some of the staff have people involved in them. But, uh, but that's okay. I mean, I have a, an issue with that, and, and maybe at the same time we, we do that, we also make them elected um, with some. You know, some give them the electoral votes, and they vote for three people. Or you could rotate. You could say, like, at any given time, there's five, and after. One rolls off. One rolls off. Someone that hasn't been represented rolls on them. Or you can do the UN model of having the permanent <laughs> member. Because <laughs> <laughs> you said there's associate standards, but there's only so many the combined standards that are the, the, the core, the core standards. You don't know if I'm calling the Utopia. 
so it could be four or five. Yeah. <laughs> then you also can have a proportional representation in one body and then, yeah. uh, wait, no, we've got the virtual calls I, now. But, but I think with your trust us. But you also need rules on how to how other standards can join because right now we have a set of them, but there maybe tomorrow somebody's going to standardize something else. And so, how do we decide that they join or not? There, there's there's a list. There's, there's a list of rules. Yeah. For, there's a bunch of rules for saying what it takes to be a core standard. Where yeah, we it? went through it. It's on my website somewhere. I don't remember where. We found it because we we hit each one in our letter that we sent to the. For example, it has to start with an S. What I, what I get now from this discussion is that I think what we would need definitely for uh, changing anything of the structure is um, writing down some more rules what uh, how a standard can by uh, to join how uh, what requirements they should uh, so so and, and, and maybe also some, uh, stating some rules with how, how the uh, structure is at the moment that the people that, that it's more transparent actually uh, that people see um, what is the current status so not not to change anything at the moment but but rather document is better. It, it's not bad. If you go to documents, it says becoming a combined standard. There's a section there. And then you click on criteria. And there are eight criteria, which are fairly reasonable and easy to meet. Um, and that's what we use as our guidelines to what we would request. That. So I think so that part is OK. Was, what's not here is a documentation of how the combined coordinators committee is composed. And I think setting up a set of rules, even if it's the rules are perfectly stated in such a way that we can get the exact same people, that's fine. But we should just have a set of rules in place so that people don't wonder how they're composed. Yeah. <coughs> that's perfectly reasonable. But the thing is, you were sort of the first test case. <laughs> you know, all the others kind of grew up, were along together at the beginning of you know, combined. You, you guys wanted. Um, were after that <laughs> event, right? So the big bang <laughs> occurred, right? And then uh, Galaxy formed, and, and you guys formed outside, and you sort of gravitated to combine. So we have you. So on this topic, um, Falk, you had an idea some time ago about using I forget the name of the journal. Journal of yeah, International. Yeah. Okay. I, it's all my fault. Uh, I was busy with other things <laughs> last time. So, um, I proposed last time that we could, uh, there's a journal called Journal of Integrative Bioinformatics. It's a journal which is um, open access. It doesn't have any publication fees. And it is listed in quite a number of different ones, including DLPB, PubMed, and a couple of other. What is it called, Journal of what? Journal of Integrative Bioinformatics, GIB. I can tell you that page in a moment. Sorry? Integrative um, And I had a discussion with the complete editorial board, and they all agreed to the idea to basically have a special issue where all the standards could be in. There was the discussion last time shall it be reviewed or not, but uh, nobody really agreed. <laughs> How shall we review a standard, by the way, anyway? So um, the, the only requirement would be that because um, to be able to upload it to PubMed, for example, is, well, is to have a general similar outline of the article that for each standard the standard editors would have to provide one additional PDF, PDF page, which is in the front of the complete document, containing the title, the authors, the affiliations, and, and some additional information. Um, unfortunately, the person who would set it all up is at the moment um, on, on uh, leave till end of the month. But once he's back, I will talk to him again, and then send an email around to all the editors of the different standards. So that, as I mentioned last time, that would be simply a different, non-competitive way to all the other 
for example, thin ISO, the current way how, how the standards are um, published, because, um, <coughs> yeah, it's, it's simply another way with the advantage that it would be PubMed listed. I have a few slides from last time. I can put them in again. And but I don't have. think the two things are have the same. I mean, I, I as much as I understand what Martin was proposing, ISO or other entity like ISO, for example, W3C, it's not the publication. It's the fact that it that it gives a certain level of authority to the standard as yes. a standard. Yeah. And that a journal won't do. No, that the journal won't do. The journal would simply publication. That's the only thing the journal does. No, the only publication journal, and the way to do the copyright thing, right? Uh, the no, but the copyright thing. I don't think. I think the copyright thing is a red herring, actually. Okay. But yeah, you. I mean, it, it would be publication. It would be saying here it is a document that has been published by a publisher. Yeah. Yes, but also, I mean, it's PubMed listed, so more people would probably be able to see yeah. the standards. Sure. So it's simply some outreach. Okay. With that's the what I slight additional benefit for everybody involved in, this, in yeah. the specification to have something which can be officially cited. Then. But it would, we would fulfill a different objective. Yes, parallel definitely. Objective. That's why I, I said I it's it not be, in could, It could complement each other. Yes, exactly. Yeah. It's not somehow yeah. crashing or uh, okay. in any way. Um, <laughs> it, it will not hinder any other um, way of distributing or making the standards more available. It's just another way to outreach and to publish. So uh, does everybody agree that it's a great idea and that we should move forward? Yeah. It's unclear that you could publish something like that in any other journal. <laughs> <laughs> nature is not going to take it. <laughs> but why do you have to think about nature anyway? And it is, it looks better on my CV. Oh. <laughs> so maybe on a related issue, I was thinking that it would be nice if there was some sort of um, publication associated with this type of meeting that we're having now. I mean, it helps for people who have to travel here that they, they get the line on the resume. It's what so, that more did yeah. last year, basically. Well, I mean, it's not just like one paper for the meeting. What I meant was that we actually had a presentation what I was suggesting, I, I, I suggested something on yes, yeah. yeah. on my shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> well, I suggested, but there was a, a, a very short email discussion amongst um, my coordinators about this. Is that one thing is that people getting to these meetings, they they often need to have another reason to be at the meetings. So. And the other thing is the meeting is so long. So it might be possible to attach this segmented into sort of the, the public sort of presentation part and sort of the working part. And the publication part could actually be a mini workshop where when you are presenting, you're presenting a paper like they do at conferences all the time. And so for, especially for those of us in, in disciplines where conference papers actually count, that could actually be useful, to the, especially to the students. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, you can come and you can talk and you can argue and break up. So, uh, yeah, but he's saying that the, uh, he wants proceedings. So, the question, so the question I would have in doing that is, um, there's a issue of publication precedence, right? So when you go, when you have something that's a, a conference of publication or fields that do it, like computer science, where it's fairly Accepted, uh, and there's some high-profile conferences where that's you know it's good as a uh, journal publication. Um, that counts as a publication, so you wouldn't be able to publish the same thing in two mm -hmm. conferences. So let me give right. you an alternative. So may, may I finish my, my question? <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> so uh, so the question is um, because this would be obviously a low, very low-profile event, mm -hmm. right? It isn't on the radar for anyone. Um, are you would publishing a paper in this proceedings block a person from publishing the same thing in a higher profile, yes. more 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 accepted conference? Yes, it it may. That's true. And so the question is that uh, it would have to be well. In some cases, this types of stuff that we're doing is hard enough to publish as it is because standards work is not always easy stuff to publish. And so having a venue to publish that 
so that at least you get the publication and not just the electronic version of, the, of the, the next version of the combined archive just to pick something. But the other thing we can do is like the model that we use with IWBDA, which is we partnered with a journal, ACS Synthetic Biology, and they run a special issue every year for our workshop and that we can submit to. It's usually um, like three months after the meeting and we get to submit to that journal, which is a high profile journal in our domain. And um, it's not just limited to those that attended the meeting, but it is kind of focused with that meeting topic. In fact, you can, you can submit a paper that's not on what you talked about in the meeting, as far as we know. But it does give you a, a journal publication and not the credited conference publication. <laughs> Was there just another hand? Yeah, but you go ahead. And so then I... just to follow up on that, yeah. the, uh, what do you envision is that this proceeding to publish, though? Because right now we don't actually have papers. We just have presentations. Maybe something like the one he was mentioning, or we could. No, no, no. Well, Sorry. I, I, my my I, question I is, what, what, is, what, does, um, what does Emic uh, put into publishing this proceedings for the combined meeting? Because he didn't actually write a paper. He just had slides. Well, the same thing happens with IWBDA. They don't write a paper, they write an abstract. And then, actually, what they do is three months later, they produce the paper based upon. So, for example, the work that Nick presented here, he presented at IWBDA, and hopefully before he um, forgets about me, we're going to write a paper about that that we're going to submit to ACS Synthetic Biology on what he presented at both of these places. So it's, it's not directly you get the publication automatically for presenting at the meeting. You still have to go through the normal review process. There's a special issue associated. With right. That. Um, so the preceding proceedings of this would only be abstracts. You're yeah. imagining, and people. And that would have precluded publication anywhere else. I mean, so if you don't like the venue we partnered with, you can you can always publish it in your Nature or Science instead. Yeah. Okay. It does have the models. So so I mean I, I'll have a shameless plug here. Which I'm organizing this year's. Conference on um, what is it called? Computational methods in systems biology, which CMS, CMS, from the yeah. from the title would fit this community perfectly. Yeah, um, that has peer reviewed um, papers. They're accepted. They peer reviewed. They they're revised by the authors. It gets published in Latin American Computer Science, and they actually the participants actually get the book at the meeting. That's right. But um, but yeah, I mean that's a that's a conference. There's a whole set of different things. I mean, there's a, it's as hard at least to coordinate, I can tell you from my side, as, as a, a special issue of a journal, because you need to have three peer reviews, peer reviewers mm -hmm. for each one. You have to have, to have a program committee that's active. And you partner with I the don't right, think that this you partner is something with the right that journal, ACS and the technology didn't put anything on it. They just take care of the whole thing. Well, we were so lucky. <laughs> um, Emek and then Herbert. Oh, sorry. Um, Clyde was first, I guess. Yeah, talk I mean, uh, I s it's, I've seen the problem. Either we take care of it, but then we have all this review process, and there's quite a lot around it. Or we just go to any journal, but oh. then it's fairly independent of this event anyway. And everybody could submit just what we present mm -hmm. here to a journal. So there would be no, apart from that, we could say there is a special issue for this meeting. But this would only go if there are enough articles there. There is no additional value to like, compared to just going to a journal. If we can get enough articles, ACS and Pedagogy always puts the cover with an IWBDA logo on it. Mm -hmm. So it might be a little bit of a stretch, and I'm not sure how public, public that information is, but my understanding is Craig Mack, uh, who was the editor for both the SPGN and the Biotech papers in Nature Biotech and was very, very receptive of standards papers. He actually left Nature Biotech and now he's starting a journal called Cell, Cell Biosystems. So there will be a new journal. So it might actually be published by Cell Elsevier. Bye bye. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, he's a, he's, he's a good guy. So it might actually be worthwhile to kind of. Yeah, but he will have no, no authority. So. Herbert, <laughs> and we're running up against our time. Um, actually, the first SPOL paper had a book with the abstract, physical book with the abstracts. Um, but what you can do today, if you want abstract, you can get just submit them onto some frequent service yeah. as a collection. They can be cited. And, you know. Producing a booklet of um, uh, abstracts, wouldn't, if people were 
willing to conform to some style yeah. files we could do with that. Um, and I might have some suggestions for what else style <laughs> might be like. Uh, no, you know, producing a, a book um, wouldn't be too bad as long as if it's just abstract, so it's minimum work, just because abstract. right now nobody is doing it. Yeah. Anything approaching a paper from this meeting, so you wouldn't want to impose more work on people. Exactly. And as long as that doesn't count against a publication later of something, then it might not be such a bad thing. And then that would be sort of a halfway measure. At least people, students might get something out of it. Senior researchers won't. But um, yeah. So last, were you going to say something? No, no, no. Okay. I was going to say something. Actually. Oh. It's just a curse with all me. You know, you were getting at how to fund it, you know, an organization, you know, earlier, and then you're talking about journals and where to put things out. I mean, a lot of, like, Society of Math Biology has a journal. Bulls and, and it's like Bulls and Math Biology, and a lot of different organizations also have a journal, which could be funded in part by the open access publication piece, and that might be another avenue towards coupling extra value towards what an organization does, and it also is a venue to publish open standards, as long as you have some without conflict of interest in the editorial board for the journal. The problem with that would be the open, all of the fees go to the journal, not to us, right? Sure. Mm -hmm. Unless it's the combined journal. <laughs> well, you <laughs> journal with their own name. Your <laughs> journal has to be named the same organization. Yeah, I mean, the, that's, that's, so that, that, you could do that. I mean, the, <laughs> There are many society journals. Many, m most of them are closed. In fact, that's the mo at the moment it seems to be the biggest force against open source societies because they see journals as cash cows. Mm. Um, but then there's also lots of societies that move their journals to be open access, and they seem to have gone up in an impact factor. Believe it or not, as soon as they went open access, this has been well documented. Um, mm. So I, it's a whole lot of work. To have yeah. a journal, I mean, much larger than. That's what you're doing here. But hey, then we need the editors. <laughs> <laughs> so, quick, is it a quickie? I don't know. I just wondered whether we, we should have a journal for, for software standards. Well, especially for this project. There, there's at least a couple of that in the pie. There's a BMC one. And uh, I think there's a. If you around the shop, it would be free. <laughs> I see what you're saying. I see. I see these cheap stores and the free stores. So Fox thing is coming up. Do you have yeah. more? You uh, first I would only the announcement that uh, oh, yeah. in two weeks, no, in three weeks from now, we will have in Melbourne uh, this outreach, uh, um, this outreach uh, event, uh, tutorial, joint tutorial, where basically uh, all. The or at least most of the combined standards are uh, will be introduced to, to um, uh, well to Australia and hopefully also others <laughs> that are there for the international conference of social security, uh, the big usually the big conference, and um, yeah. So um, we decided a couple of years ago we decided to have these outreach events. Uh, on top of the combined harmony meeting, which are more internal meetings of the community. Um, but if, if you see any other uh, means, or, or if you think uh, we, we should increase this visibility of the combined world to the outside world, uh, except uh, uh, for this, what is ongoing, and, and uh, what we also discussed now, if we involve uh, uh, WWE. Or, or ISO or other communities there. Um, so um, I had a comment there, but I, I would say at the moment uh, what we have discussed so far and what is in place so far might be. So, yeah. so come to Australia. Yeah, come to Australia. It'll be two weeks. Well, you can ask the ICC organizers for that, and maybe you get an answer in two weeks. Oh, yeah. They, they will, will we, have, we have a space. We have a space. There's lots of space. Come on over. <laughs> please. Invite some friends. Sure. If you want a cheaper conference, please. also buy them to see MSP in Manchester. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, we publish uh, uh, abstracts, and you can submit them until yeah. next week. Thank you.
Yes. And WCM. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe what, 2002? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, that too, we talked about that. That's a bit That's a bit dead, isn't it? That's yeah. 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 It doesn't have to be I don't know. Here, yeah, like, we think about the things, we think about the things, we think about the things, Okay, people can give you money, and now what you do? You go out and this password. And now you're, you can have donations. But the donations don't show up like that. The people have to go after them. Who's going to be a fundraiser? Well, I thought I should always say come to Australia. I uh, can say come to Germany. Goodbye, Los Angeles. Welcome in Wittenberg. I just want to, uh, it's only five minutes, uh, briefly say a few words about Harmony next year uh, from the 20th to the 24th of April. That's Monday and Friday. In Wittenberg, where is Wittenberg? Um, it's it's in the middle of Germany, south of Berlin. Um, Frankfurt is here. So the easiest way is to fly either to, for, for especially for the Europeans, to Berlin or to Leipzig. But even Australian airline now, because Honda says a uh, coach here with, um, uh, with uh, Emirates, they fly to Berlin. So from Berlin, it's something like one and a half hours, roughly one and one and a half hours. If you really have to fly to Frankfurt, then there are trains which take around four and a half, five hours. Um, from Berlin, actually, as well as from Frankfurt, there are these fast ICE trains there will be. Um, Wittenberg, it's not only really interesting, it's a place where the, the University Halle Wittenberg has been founded uh, more than 500 years ago, but it's also the place um, where Martin Luther nailed his 95 pieces on the church door. And um, they are a bit early, but in 2017, there's a 500 years anniversary for the formation. Uh, it's well heritage listed, it's a small town, but very really nice. Um, and we are here, which is, this is the conference center, it's located in the old university building of the university. Um, the advantage is we have um, nearly 50 single rooms also available there for very low, basically subsidized rate, around 40 euro per night. And there are no, basically normal hotel rooms. Um, you have heat. Sorry? Heat? Hmm? You have heat. <laughs> you will have heat. Heat? Why do you need heat? They are heat. They are heat. They are heat. They are insulated. <laughs> um, we have, uh, for Harmony, they have uh, one major room and up to three breakout rooms so that we can also have different meetings for the different standards. And that's also what is harmony, just to remind you, <laughs> because we always have this change between combine and harmony. Harmony is actually, from the idea, without talks, without all presentations, but really the focus on developing specifications, developing the libraries, maybe even developing tools, and ideally, so what I'm envisioning, would be at the end of the week, we have a new version of every specification. So it's really more about spec development, spec writing. Wait, 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 originally it's more about software. 
That's on the web page, what how many should be. Generating a file, another version so of the software. And supporting software. Yeah, we made that one. I, yeah, I hope you made that up because that's, <laughs> that's, a, that's a big you know, sort of. Uh, yeah, no, but, uh, but I just want to make the point: combine is really presenting quite a lot. Harmony is more developing, further developing the specifications. Less talking, more hacking. Good luck in trying to keep it that way. We try it. It's true. It's very hard. It's very hard. Um, People want to present this and that. Unless you say the presentation is on there. Thanks, because uh, we got some funding from the German Ministry of Education and Research. Um, the two universities, or the three universities there, it is organized by Dagmar Waldenmark, that's the University of Boston. Um, Tobias is here, and myself. And we just started, we, we will end of September the aim to give the information on the web page so that you can also register them. At the moment, we're just setting it all up. And um, yeah, I hope to see you all there in Wittenberg. And just one additional slide, and that's something completely different. That's something uh, which most of you probably have seen also. It's something which has been uh, mainly put by Dr. Altenart. <coughs> I'm also involved. Uh, the Volkswagen Society, this is uh, this one here, it's, uh, it is run by the Carmaker Company, it's a large funding society too, they spend over, I think over 3 billion in the last 4 years in Germany on research, um, it was so nice to give us money to run this to control cell modeling workshop for a week. Um, and uh, fully funded includes also the funding for, for example, the air flaps of the um, The aim is, you all probably know this model by Jonathan Carr, but um, whole cell modeling of a simple organism, uh, basically built out of 28 different modules, and the aim here is to re-model it with SBML and SBGN, so if one standard representation of the complete cell model. And yeah, some of you are already there, kindly agree to be tuned to us, and we hope that you get enough um, basically late, post, uh, late uh, PhD students, early postdocs, and this. And that's also that's in March and also for the show. Any questions?
<laughs> I just want to say a few words, just last minute. Thanks a lot for coming and thanks for staying to the last minute. You guys are great. Wait, we're not done yet. <laughs> I know, almost. almost. <laughs> I cannot see, but so I thank a lot of people, but here I want to thank a few more people. This is almost the end. I think this is a very successful uh, combined. And uh, um, the person that I really want to thank is Chris. Actually, he did the whole agenda and keep it up to date and manage it, keep everything run very smoothly. Thank you very much, Chris. Yeah. And also, of course, Mike and Linda keep the uh, live stream going and also keep the websites up to date. <laughs> Actually, Linda updated all the websites quite a bit, and I just did an initial one, and oh, Mike did it. <laughs> all the here. It's just amazing, you know. <laughs> and uh, uh, thank you very much. And I, I, I really hope you don't get any funding from anywhere else. <laughs> 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 Uh, we, sorry. Yeah. we may be ready. You were, you were telling me that you've been editing the videos, um, the recordings, and the web page. So we may soon have recordings of the sessions and slides and things on the, on the agenda, um, on the real agenda, like not the Google page, but something. How does that work? The first three days are fully edited. The fourth day is mostly edited. And obviously, I haven't attacked today yet. <laughs> So um, yeah, it should be a lot a quicker turnaround than it usually is. Right. So while, while we've all been sitting on our asses and chatting away, and so Linda's been working feverishly. <laughs> The best little bits, like Mike danced in front of the camera. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm yes. keeping that for the SBML blooper. Or the <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I did that in front of the camera. It was you did it. Oh, you can check it on the web page. Yeah. <laughs> so, and thanks to all the speakers, all the session chairs. Great job, and uh, have a good rest of the week. Have a safe trip back home and see you in public. All right. So there's a break and there's an S Volta final final station. Right. I, I have something more. Uh, I think somebody uh, was not uh, mentioned yet. Yeah. That uh, two persons, Ryu and Pauline, I think they did a yeah. marvelous job. <laughs> Mm -hmm. If I can do it again, I'll do it again. Oh, right. <laughs> You're yeah, lying. Next next year. Year. <laughs> <laughs> Someone give me the funding, I'll do it. <laughs> How many have to program? Huh? Yeah, we're, we're. How long? Four o'clock. Five minutes. Uh, the S-Bowl. Five minutes. Yeah. Oh, oh. Um, okay. Okay. May as well take ten. I mean, 